Okay, we're live. Please rise as you are able. I now call this meeting of city council to order. We acknowledge that this meeting is taking place on the traditional land of the Anishinaabeg people. The Anishinaabeg include the Odawa, Ojibwe, and Potawatomi nations collectively known as the Three Fires Confederacy. We're dedicated to honoring indigenous history and culture, committed to moving forward in the spirit of reconciliation and respect with all First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people. And on this, I wanna take a moment of silence before we begin tonight's meeting to recognize the lives lost in the residential schools, including the 215 children killed at the residential school in Kamloops, British Columbia. Please join in a moment of silence, acknowledging that there are likely many more. Thank you. You may be seated. <clears throat> okay, uh, welcome to our virtual council meeting. In accordance with the COVID-19 pandemic physical distancing restrictions, uh, members of council, the executive management team and the city clerk are participating tonight via video conference. Members of the senior leadership team that have items on tonight's agenda are not visible, but are available to answer questions. The first item on our business agenda is the confirmation of the minutes for May 10th. I got muted there. Can everybody hear me now? Where was I? <laughs> Confirmation of the minutes? Now let's start that again. First item on the agenda is the confirmation of the minutes for May 10th and May 25th. Those minutes have been circulated. Uh, the minutes of the city council meeting held May 10th and 25th have been circulated. Are there any corrections? Okay, seeing none, the minutes are adopted as printed and circulated. 
We have no awards and recognition or report from officers uh, items on tonight's agenda. We do have a large number of deputation requests related to three different matters on tonight's agenda. Uh, we have one emergency deputation request uh, from Jenny Laforestier concerning motion 21G137, the proposed Bradford bypass. Uh, we also have six emergency deputation requests from Kenzie Churchward, Caitlin McKenzie, Pauline Bradshaw, Shelby Jones, Chris Ridding, and Amanda Ridding concerning motion 21G149, review of proposed supervised consumption site locations. Uh, as those deputation requests were received after the printing of the agenda, a vote in favor by the majority of councils required in order for those emergency deputations to proceed. So I will call the question, all those in favor of allowing the emergency deputations? Uh, any opposed to the emergency deputations? None, that carries. Okay, so those will proceed. Uh, the first deputation request is related to a third, a different matter on the agenda, and that is the modular supportive housing project uh, that had been proposed for Vesper and Victoria Streets. Uh, so I will now call on Paul Oberholzer to deliver uh, the deputation, his deputation concerning that motion. Please note in accordance with our procedural bylaw, and this uh, is good note for everyone, uh, you have a maximum of five minutes for your deputations. And I will warn you when you are approaching the five minutes, uh, and we will unfortunately have to keep everybody to those five minutes given the number of uh, deputation requests tonight. I can't allow very much leeway on that. So I will try and give you a heads up as you're approaching the five minute mark. Is uh, Mr. Oberholzer with us for his deputation? Sorry, we're just uh, looking for Mr. Oberholzer, excuse me, in the uh, participants list. Uh, we understand he may be on with another uh, account. Um, so just bear with us a moment here. Okay, uh, if we've got Mr. Oberholzer, can you hear us, sir? Hello. Oh, are you there? Hello. Yes, we can hear you. Oh, okay, good. Uh, okay. Having Welcome some... to council. Go ahead with your deputation, sir. Uh, thank you very much. We have a slideshow to put up, but before we start, sir, uh, there seems to be some, some confusion. Uh, we went over with Tara, uh, one of the deputy clerks today about this. You did amend uh, 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 deputations to a five minute limit. Uh, this Correct. is not showing on your website. Your website is still showing 10 minutes. We were not advised of this until this afternoon, so we will run over the five minutes. Um, it's a slideshow and it's just too late to change it. Uh, that's what you published in your website, 10 minutes, and that's what our guiding, our, our guidance was. So, well, um, with, you'll have respect, to with, with respect, Mr. Overholtz, I'd love to give you the time, but we have 26 people who wish to speak. I to understand, sir. Time. I've been so talking for all add, the time. Sorry, sir, I'm still speaking. Uh, what I would just ask you to do is uh, mm -hmm. try and finish up your remarks as quickly as possible. Understanding the confusion and the work you've put into your deputation, uh, I will allow you a little bit of leeway, but um, uh, please try and get through it uh, as quickly as you can. We can probably get through this in about seven minutes. All right. There you okay. go. Let's now, uh, we need to get our slideshow up here. Uh, we're not showing anything here that we can do that. Uh, we need to get blacked out or something, what's going on here? No. Uh, I don't know about the functionality here, uh, we're not. <sighs> Boy. Select, select a speaker. We're waiting to be blacked out. Yeah, apparently we, we the screen has to black out and then bring us in. Um, um, well, we. Oh, there we go. Yeah, there, there we you go. go. Uh, except that's the Bradford that's, bypass. Yeah, that's not the uh, correct presentation. No. no. 
that's what we're looking for. <laughs> We got somebody on your end working on this? Yes. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, it's an interesting new look there, uh, Your Worship. There we go, thank you. No? Nope. <laughs> They're still looking for the right one. Yeah, that's cool. You folks have a long evening tonight. We sure do. Well, there's nothing else going on tonight, is there, Mayor? Hmm. <laughs> I'm sorry, what was that, Mike? I was talking to me. Oh, okay. Uh, Your Worship, if the staff wants to put the city, the, the Bradford bypass, that's only one deputation. They no, want to there's, put that up first while they sort us out. Uh, uh, I, would, I would, sir, but there's a number of them. Oh, okay. Well, I was going to say, as long as we can get slotted in after the bypass and before the uh, uh, SCS uh, deputations. Yeah, if we can't get your presentation up in a minute, we'll do that. There we go. Oh, there you go. Okay. We're good to go. Over to you. <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, your worship, counselors, thank you very much for your time. We'll try and make this very quickly. Uh, this evening, we would uh, like council to consider a fourth alternative to staff report FAC 002-21. We would like council to recommend that the land at Vesper Street, 65 Vesper Street in particular, be repurposed as a community park. Let's have a quick overview creating balance. In 2006, Ontario developed the Places to Grow plan. It was intended to address the ex uh, expected population growth in the future, including Barry, which in uh, 30 years is expected to be 300,000 uh, 300, 300, souls. In 2010, your worship uh, led the historic neighborhood strategy. You were our counselor at the time. This strategy was created to help preserve and sustain our historic neighborhoods going into the future. Uh, we're now living in that future that the, uh, that the historic strategy was planned for. Although we're very close to the waterfront and we are the Centennial Beach neighborhood, the reality is, is that we need our own community space to develop as a community. With our rapidly growing city, the waterfront park is more of a park for all of Barry's neighborhoods. It is also, as we know, shared regular by many, many visitors from the GTA. As a city, we need to take a holistic approach uh, when planning for population growth. We need to make sure that we are not making decisions carefully, that we are making decisions carefully, my apologies, so that we do not end up with a microclimate like they have in Toronto. Balance is very important. Uh, I don't know, our slides aren't moving here, so. Um, don't worry about it, you're doing great. Well, that's the end. I don't know what's going on here. Anyway, this is a rare and great opportunity to see a previously paved area turn green. We sincerely hope to embrace it. Uh, let's have a couple quick looks at some success stories in the GTA. These are examples of successful conversions from landfills to green spaces. Uh, there's a link there uh, showing that dissertation if we ever get to that, <laughs> that uh, page. Uh, Okay, there we are, thank you. Keeping balance, okay, we can go forward now. Uh, that's not us. It's not. Anyway, keep, keep in going. London, they have a park. Mr. No, sorry, uh, who's got control of the slides here? Uh, we're not doing it. So uh, Mr. Nolan's trying to keep up with where you are in the presentation. So maybe Mr. Oberholzer, just give him a, a hand by saying next slide. Uh, okay. I think you already talked about this one, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, this is not our slide here. There we go. Okay, uh, Mr. Nolan. Uh, yeah, if you could just slide, say please. next slide. Yeah, that'll be great. Yeah, Thanks. Thanks, Paul. No problem. Uh, so we just went through the urban heat ion effect. We don't want that, and that, that happens. Next slide. 
Uh, next slide. Some success stories, next slide. Uh, so as you can see, we have Keel Valley, Leslie Street, Spit, Britannia Landfill. Next slide, please. In London, Euston Park Naturalization Plan, very good example. Was a garbage dump, now it's an open green field with trees and gardens. Next slide, please. Okay, here's a good one to compare with. Elmsdale Park and Kitchener. Uh, the residents living near Elmsdale Park were given a budget for upgrades to their park. When the work started, the land began to shift. That's when they discovered there was a landfill below. Remediation was done and the cap was upgraded. Next slide, please. The planned upgrades to the park had to be changed because of the unstable land. They changed from a park with structures to a park with more natural features. The upgrades are expected to be completed in the summer of 21. Next slide, please. The Vesper Street site is very similar to Allensdale Park. We have the landfill concerns, plus there is a high, high level water table, very close to the surface. We're mindful of these conditions when considering our park. Why do we have a need for a park? Next slide, please. Next slide. Again, with all of this growth intensification, we need our own community space. Next slide, please. We did a straw pull through the weekend up and down Sanford Street, John Street, Bradford to Annisville, Brock Street, Bradford to Annisville, and Victoria Street, uh, Bradford to Annisville. And it was almost overwhelmingly in favor of a park. Next slide, please. The Berry Garden Club has been consulted. They have indicated willingness to assist with design ideas, plant sourcing, fundraising. This could ultimately be worked into an urban pantry project like three, four other sites around town. There are many people in our area that are less advantaged who live in a food desert uh, with limited access to affordable food while other communities in Barrie are strengthening connections through the urban pantry. We would like to do this as well. Next slide, please. Why? Parks are very important. Recreation is beneficial to our well-being. It re resets your mind, reduces stress. It's good for our physical health, builds family connections and connections with others in the community. It also helps to reduce crime rates with teens. It gives them something to do. Next slide, please. Parks are, uh, are a place to celebrate culture and heritage. It would be entirely suitable to honor our First Nations more widely in Barrie, perhaps at this park. It would also be great to give our Barrie railway history better recognition. I'm not talking about Allendale railway history. Barrie has its own railway history with a terminal downtown. Um, there is also the possibility of creating our history with landfills. Yeah, this can be part of our neighborhood and it can be linked with an environmental theme for the park. This park could also be an ancillary location for festivals we have in Barrie, like Winterfest, Camping Fest, et cetera. Next slide, please. This is a place for everyone in our community, regardless of their income level, ethnicity, gender, ability, or age. There are many families in our neighborhood with limited recreation budgets. Many could use some free recreational opportunities. Next slide, please, Mr. Nolan. We can support connections to nature at this urban location. We can support biodiversity and help toward rebuilding butterfly and bee populations. Next slide, sir. Let's look at staff's alternatives. We only have three slides left, Your Worship. Alternative one recommends the land be sold as is. Please consider the environmental impact that may occur if the land was dug up. Also consider the cost to build per square foot feet to a commercial developer after environmental cleanup will likely be prohibitive. Next slide, please. Alternative two, this is an interesting one. This proposes giving an asset, 1.45 acres, albeit it's dirty, to the county along with a borrowed $3 million of taxpayers' money. Ladies and gentlemen, this does not make sense. Four months ago in January, you told Mr. Greg Bishop that we did not get value for the money we gave to the county and that we'll do this project on our own. Well, four months later, you're not only offering up the land for free, 
but you're going to give them $3 million of our taxpayers' money. And that just does not make sense, ladies and gentlemen. Alternative three, next slide, Mr. Nolan, basically this boils down to uh, it would have the city assume the role of the developer in all associated liabilities. As well, staff states this alternative cannot be completed in a timely fashion. This alternative is not recommended by staff. Uh, we believe they've come to a correct conclusion. We would like council to please, next slide. Ms. Uh, thank you, sir. Um, we would ask that you please carefully consider alternative four. Our point this evening is council could recommend that the land at 65 Vesper Street be repurposed as a community park. Ladies and gentlemen, that's the uh, end of our uh, presentation, our deputation. Um, if you uh, want to thank you all, next slide, please. I want to thank you all uh, for your time and consideration. And if you have any questions, uh, please ask away. Thank you very much and have a good evening and please stay safe. Thank you very much, Mr. Overholz. Uh, any questions from members of council for this deputant? Okay, seeing none, thank you for coming. Thanks for taking the time to prepare a, a slide preparation for us, uh, sir, and that matter will be up, but probably not till quite a bit later because we do have a lot of folks. Well, I guess you ain't gonna be watching the hockey game, are you? <laughs> We're definitely not watching the hockey game. Have a good evening. Uh, if we'd known it was game seven. Yeah. Uh, okay, our second deputation request tonight no. is related. Oh, if we can just, uh, there we go. Okay, our second deputation request tonight is related to motion 21G137, the proposed Bradford bypass. We do have several deputations on this matter. I will now call on Margaret Prophet, Executive Director of Simcoe County Greenbelt Coalition to deliver her deputation regarding motion 21G137. Ms. Prophet, welcome to Barry City Council. In accordance with our procedural bylaw, you have a maximum of five minutes for your deputation. All right, thank you. Um, I don't have screen sharing uh, permissions yet, so I don't know if Ryan's putting those up or... Yes, Mr. Nolan will get uh, that up. I know a couple of deputants. Okay, I perfect. I just didn't want to waste your time. I know you guys have got a lot of time, so I don't have a lot of time, so I wanted to make sure I was sticking to the five minutes. Uh, all right, so thank you, Mayor and Council, for this opportunity to speak to you today in support of your motion with respect to concerns about Lake Simcoe as a result of the Bi Bradford Bypass. Next slide, please. Uh, my name is Margaret Prophet, as uh, Mayor Lehman said, and I'm the Executive Director of the Simcoe County Greenbelt Coalition. We are an incorporated not-for-profit organization that boasts 42 member organizations from across Simcoe County, including in Barrie. Our vision is for our region to become healthier and more prosperous through action that recognizes our economy is dependent on our environment and public health. And as a result, preserving and protecting nature, water, agricultural systems, and building sustainable, equitable, and climate resilient communities should be our focus. Next slide, please. The City of Barrie is taking great strides to show leadership within our region as outlined on this slide. I wanted to commend Barrie for the work it has done thus far and how the city recognizes that there is still more work to do, especially as it relates to creating a city that is healthier, more equitable and sustainable. The examples that I have chosen are initiatives that few others in the area have done. These are also examples that demonstrate the City of Barrie is not only thinking of initiatives that have direct benefit to its citizens and economy, but also recognizes its role as a global citizen whose jurisdiction is not limited to municipal bounds. Boundaries. This may not be comfortable for all on council, but unfortunately, as our society grapples with issues that transcend borders, such as pandemics, climate change, water security, food security, rising inequity and poverty, racism, we need more collaboration and accountability to fixing these problems regardless of jurisdiction. Next slide, please. Which brings us to the Bradford Bypass, a relic from 1980s transportation planning revived from the dead in 2017. I've provided you with some key information that informs SCGC's perspective on this infrastructure project. Our coalition follows the evidence and to us the evidence that we have demonstrates this is a project that at the very least requires sober second thought. Traditionally highway projects are predicated on the idea that they provide a net economic benefit that outweighs whatever downsides they present. However, with abundant evidence demonstrating the economic drain that highways present to downtowns and established economic centers, or to the very fact that highways don't reduce congestion thanks to induced demand, that narrative is changing. So much in fact that our American neighbors are readily abandoning highway projects and tearing down established highways to reinvigorate their communities. Next slide, please. 
As I mentioned, there is an accepted myth that highways reduce traffic congestion. Despite numerous examples across Ontario and North America to counter this fact, the myth persists. As you can see from this slide, MTO has started to analyze the time savings and congestion reduction effectiveness of this highway. So you know, we have asked for these studies um, to, to understand the inputs and methodology, but have not received them. Regardless, you can see from these slides that is taken directly from MTO's bypass, bypass project website. The bypass actually increases congestions on two critical north-south routes, the 400 and the 404. The time savings that have been estimated are simply for the time savings between the 400 and the 404. Clearly, if the congestion is worse on the 400, a driver from Barrie may not notice any difference in time travel if heading to 404 or maybe even more delayed if they're heading to the GTA, GTA via the 400. I should also mention that this highway may be a toll road. MTO has not ruled that option out. Further, MTO has not considered other alternatives to this highway, including stronger investments in the Barry Go line. Um, and when Minister Mulroney was asked if MTO would consider alternatives to the highway, the question was evaded. Next slide, please. So as you consider the motion tonight, my, my main question is if there are members of council who support this highway, what evidence are you basing that on? The route has been chosen before these new proposed studies have been completed. Even still, an exemption to avoid these studies altogether is still under cons consideration. Even if the studies are done, they will be completed after early works construction. So that would be bridges, moving of, of hydro lines, um, that sort of thing. Even if the studies are done, um, sorry, that means that regardless of the impacts that are found, avoidance or mitigation strategies are mostly moot. With provincial funds desperately needed for infrastructure and transit, including increased go, increasing GO service, is spending 1.5 billion on a highway that worsens congestion on the 400, something that is in the best interest of Barry's future prosperity. What if a reasonable alternative to this highway was to increase GO service and regional transit? Despite the obvious boon this would have for neighboring communities, MTO seems content not to entertain these possibilities, possibilities which I think is a, a downside for Barry's, uh, for Barry for sure. Next slide, please. Uh, on this slide here, we have a map we commissioned in 2017 demonstrating the wealth of water resources we have across the county based on source water protection maps. As you can see, this system is interconnected beyond municipal boundaries, just like Lake Simcoe, our air, our economies and public health. Cheryl Sandberg sums it up nicely. Leadership is about making better, others better as a result of your presence and making sure that that impact lasts in your absence. These decisions should weigh heavily on you because once you are no longer in politics, whenever that may be, uh, you want your impact to last in your absence. I feel commenting on this project and helping advocate for Lake Simcoe, responsible planning, climate action and investments that are for the greater good is one such example. Next slide, please. I just wanted to show you um, what the headwaters of Lake Simcoe look like. Uh, these are from the route that has been chosen, 13 watercourses in total that have to be crossed, and this happens to be uh, a few of them. Next slide, please. And here we have plains and forests, established forests, that sort of thing. So I want people to recognize the kind of landscapes that this highway would be passing. And that is it. Thank you for your time and consideration tonight. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Prophet, for your uh, deputation and, uh, and the material you've given us. Uh, any questions from members of council? Okay, seeing no questions for the deputant. Again, thank you for being here, Ms. Prophet. Thank you. Uh, next, I'll call on Claire Malcolmson, the Executive Director of Rescue, the Rescue Lake Simcoe Coalition to deliver her deputation concerning the same motion, the proposed Bradford bypass. All right. I Welcome, am... Ms. Malcolmson. We can hear you. And Thank in accordance you. with our procedural bylaw, you have up to five minutes for your deputation. Perfect. Thank you very much, Mayor Lehman. Thank you, uh, Mayor and Council, for having me tonight. Um, I'm the Executive Director of the Rescue Lake Simcoe Coalition. And um, our coalition is uh, focused on the health of Lake Simcoe, of course. Um, I just want to start off by saying I'm really pleased to see the motion that is before Council tonight on the Bradford Bypass, and I hope that that passes. And I, uh, I want to say I also support everything that Margaret has just said and uh, commend you for raising the issue of these interjurisdictional uh, Lake Simcoe issues. Go to the next slide, please. So I'm good going to sh uh, share a little bit about what's happening with Lake Simcoe, um, just to underscore the importance of protecting it. So we have 
released a report uh, about a month and a half ago, with Simcoe County Greenbelt Coalition called Lake Simcoe Under Pressure in 2021. And we outline <clears throat> the issues on the slide here. The Lake Simcoe Protection Plan uh, is under review. We don't know if it will be weakened or stay strong. So that's out there. Uh, there's a lot of pressure on Lake Simcoe, the Upper York sewage system. I uh, appreciate that that's come before council as well. The Orbit MZO just to the south to build a town on a rail line the size of Barrie. Uh, and uh, the growth plan uh, requiring municipalities to plan for, we are concerned would be lots of low density growth to 2051. Mm -hmm. Uh, looking at the information, the analysis provided by the province of Ontario uh, when they put together the Lake Simcoe Protection Plan, we can estimate that that's going to add <clears throat> 9 to 15 tonnes of phosphorus per year to Lake Simcoe. And um, you can go to the next slide, please. The reason that that is a problem is because as the dotted red line in this chart shows you, uh, that's the goal for phosphorus loading. It's 44 tonnes a year. The average of the last 10 years have been been about 90 tons. So we still have to cut our phosphorus loads in half. Uh, there's a really strong interaction with climate change and phosphorus uh, that is relatively newly explained. And that is uh, when you have these really heavy rainstorms, uh, increased precipitation events that are occurring as a result of climate change in the Lake Simcoe watershed, you have really heavy flows. And when you have really heavy flows, that also picks up more dirt, which contains phosphorus and throws it into the lake. And that what is what is the explanation for these very high phosphorus loads from year to year. So there's no reason for us to take our foot off the gas on protecting Lake Simcoe. Uh, the other climate change uh, relevant fact here is that 54% of greenhouse gases in the Lake Simcoe watershed are related mostly to people driving their cars. Uh, so we really must not perpetuate the business as usual scenario uh, that will result in a 57% net increase from the 2016 baseline GHG loads as analyzed by the LSRCA. So uh, building a, uh, another highway that is going to increase the ease of driving a single occupancy vehicle is going in the wrong direction. Next slide, please. Um, another real bee in my bonnet is uh, the need to protect natural heritage. So very briefly, this is some uh, research that we did a couple of years ago. Only 21% of the Lake Simcoe watershed's uh, land is well protected by provincial policy. Those are the dark green areas. The Lake Simcoe Protection Plan has a target of 40% high quality natural cover in the watershed. Uh, we're, we're at about 28% now. So it is not time to start wrecking wetlands and forests. <laughs> it's time to really protect them. So again, this project goes in the wrong direction. Um, you'll notice that at the bottom of Cooks Bay, that's the Holland Marsh and that's dark green. And it's pretty ironic that the province uh, and that a number of municipalities and mayors around Lake Simcoe that say that they will protect Lake Simcoe and love it are actually advocating to destroy the most sensitive wetland in the watershed. Uh, next slide, please. So this is just another shot of how close the route of the Bradford Bypass is to the lake. That's Cooks Bay, the body of water there. Um, so in contrast to the, the previous map and its aim, um, I do want to point out that this project is anticipated to negatively impact 22 hectares of high quality woodlands, 17 hectares of Holland Marsh, nine and a half hectares of designated provincially significant wetlands and 32 hectares of significant wildlife habitat. Um, there's quite a lot more information in the slide that I can't share with you, but if we can just skip down to slide 11, process is inadequate. Um, <clears throat> Margaret talked about this, but I wanna just see it, uh, have it shown in front of you next slide. You're getting there. Yay, thank you. Um, so the process, as outlined by the province's extremely confusing um, so-called process is extremely <laughs> backwards. It's build now, study and mitigate impacts as we go. The timeline makes no sense and it may not even be legal. Uh, early works like building bridges, uh, that was in the budget for the fall of 2021, while they acknowledge that the studies will not be finished until a year later. Uh, the MTO team misled York Region Council when they supported the project, when it suggested it would complete these studies prior to starting construction. Um, 
The consultation has been misleading and shallow in one way. I attended the PIC, no one could ask questions. You couldn't see any faces. They cherry picked questions and they did not address the next point, which is on the next slide, the exemption issue. So here we have, so I'm just gonna show us two more slides. This is the MTO's project website. It says they're going to do a transportation environmental study report, which will do a number of things listed below. Uh, that we would agree are good. <clears throat> and the next slide is the still, still live uh, Environmental Registry of Ontario notice about the Bradford Bypass, which says you know, if this exemption is approved by the province of Ontario, that the project would no longer be required to complete a tesser. So I'm gonna end it there because I'm sure I'm out of time. Um, Later on in the slide, if you want to look at more of this, I've outlined how all of the impacts of this highway go against the intention of the Lake Simcoe Protection Plan, which uh, your talented Mayor Lehman and I helped to put together with the province of Ontario as very early participants in the creation of the Lake Simcoe Protection Plan. I know you all love Lake Simcoe, and uh, again, I applaud your um, ability to see beyond your borders and to think of the future in Lake Simcoe. And uh, I wish you luck. I hope you can pass this motion tonight. Um, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Malcolmson for the deputation. Uh, any questions for the deputant from members of council? Councillor Harvey. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, nothing directly in relation to the information, but I was just curious if uh, when this matter hit uh, any of the municipalities uh, that are directly impacted uh, with the, the bypass or when it hit uh, York Region Council, whether you presented uh, there. I, um, I spoke to York Region Council uh, about it briefly when I was speaking about another matter and then was not allowed to speak about it again later because I had mentioned it for about a minute. Um, I've also, you know, I've, I've, I've certainly been in contact with those other municipalities, but we have to wait for the item to come on the agenda. So uh, Bradford asking for support from other municipalities gave us that opening. Great, thank you. I was just, I was just curious, uh, just because I knew there was only two deputants uh, when it hit York Region Council, uh, and I know one was uh, was not from York Region, so I was just kind of curious. I couldn't remember who the second deputant was. I'm. I believe I believe there were other people who were uh, who were people that we were organizing with who intended to be there who just could not actually be there, but. Um, I mean, to be fair, this has been really very fast. It's been really difficult to uh, to get the resources. In fact, we have no resources to run this campaign. Uh, so it's just volunteers working on this to try to try to make the world a better place. Okay, thanks. Uh, any other questions for the deputant? Councilor Kungle. Thank you, Your Worship, and, and to the deputant, uh, thank you for the presentation. And um, with respects to one, your presentation and two, the motion that we have later, I know that we talk in our motion about the Lake Simcoe Protection Act and you've quoted in your presentation, the plan. And I wanna, and I'm looking to, you know, I'm, I'm appreciating that the act is just one part of the plan. Um, is there a way that you think we could strengthen the motion? Have we made uh, an oversight uh, in particular around noting the act and not the plan? So I'm, um, I'm looking, I think I'm sure. starting to realize the plan might be more comprehensive. So I am, um, to be honest, I'm not, I'm not sure. So I, I believe that the Lake Simcoe Protection Act enables uh, an, an independent assessment, which is what you're trying to achieve. I was actually trying to reach Barry Planners on Friday about this uh, and just couldn't even get through. Um, so, the Lake, the Lake Simcoe Protection Act is enabling legislation and the plan is where all of the regulations are. Uh, I believe it is in the Lake Simcoe Protection Act uh, where you'd find reference to the ability to uh, conduct the kind of study that your, uh, that your motion refers to. I think if you wanted to strengthen the motion though, and thank you for the question, um, the way that I would strengthen it would be to ensure that there is a consideration of alternatives. 
what we really don't want is for this to go through the Holland Marsh. And what we don't want is for this highway to violate so many of the objectives and principles of the Lake Simcoe Protection Plan. And so it is not, we do not want to improve people's commutes. It is that we think that putting a highway in a wetland is a terrible idea. Um, so however you can reword it to, to uh, reference the fact that you would like to see consideration of different route alternatives, I think that's quite impactful. Thank you, Ms. Malcolmson. Thank you, Ms. Malcolmson, for that. Uh, any other questions of the deputant? Okay, uh, seeing none, thank you very much for being here, Ms. Malcolmson. We have one more deputation on this matter, which is the emergency deputation we approved earlier by, uh, sorry, no, that's not correct. Yes, it is. It is the emergency deputation by Jenny LaForestier. Uh, and my apologies if I got your name wrong there. If we can just get her into the call. Oh, Madam Clerk. Um, Mayor Lehman, um, Ms. LaForestier um, has seemed to have dropped off the call. We are trying to find her. So I don't know if you just want to move on and come back to her after. But um, she has either hung up or lost connection. Okay. All right. Uh, we will put a pin in it and um, hopefully she can join us again and uh, deliver her deputation uh, at the end of the night. Uh, so we will now move on to the deputation requests concerning motion 21G149, review of the proposed supervised consumption site locations. Uh, so the way this is going to work, I will be uh, calling out the names listed on the council agenda. So first, we're going to go through uh, the folks who registered uh, last week. Uh, we did approve emergency deputations earlier, so we will call uh, those names after we go through the, the folks who, who registered first. Uh, so I'll call your name. Uh, once your name's called, please, of course, unmute yourself. We'll, we'll bring you into the call. Please unmute yourself. If you happen to be on the phone, you press uh, hashtag six hash six to unmute yourself. Um, so our first uh, deputant, sorry, Councillor Jim Harris, go ahead. Thank you, Mary Lehman. I believe I just want to clarify this time I should declare my conflict. Is that correct? Through you to the yes, go okay, ahead. Thank you. Um, so I, thank you, Mary Lehman. So I will say in accordance with S.5 of the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act and the recommendation of our integrity commissioner, I will be declaring a conflict of interest and not take part in the safe consumption site discussion or vote. So thank you. Okay, thank you, Madam Clerk. Has Councillor Jim Harris's interest been recorded? Um, yes, Mayor Lima. I just want to clarify with Councillor Harris. It's because one of your family members works for the CMHA for your conflict? Sorry, yes, yes, okay. exactly. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Okay, thanks. So thank we you. got the nature of the conflict. Thank you there. Uh, and thanks, Councillor Harris. And we will now proceed with the deputations. First, we have Christine Naylor. Can we bring Ms. Naylor into the call? Hello, can you hear me? I can, you're showing as Claire Malcolmson. <laughs> oh, okay, it's showing uh, Christine Naylor on my screen. Oh, interesting. Well, I know it's you, uh, yeah. Ms. Naylor, so we'll, uh, uh, sorry, and we still got her there, Mr. Nolan? I okay, mean, okay, good enough. Uh, Ms. Ms. Naylor, welcome to uh, Perry City Council and in accordance with the procedural bylaw, you have up to five minutes for your deputation. Floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Six months ago, my worst nightmare came true. We lost our son Ryan to a toxic drug poisoning. On Ryan's 35th birthday, instead of celebrating, we buried our son. Ryan lived with concurrent disorders and the last eight years of his life were a struggle. It didn't have to be that way. And I truly believe if society supported instead of shame those with mental illness and substance use issues, Ryan's story would have had a different ending. I'm here tonight to introduce you to my son, to tell you about the beautiful gift he was, and to ask you to vote in support of the SCS. Ryan was a born advocate and activist. From the youngest age, he would notice injustice and challenge the system when he thought it needed to be. He also had a playful side. He loved to make people laugh and would often play pranks on people. Ryan was highly intelligent and highly educated. 
He was so in touch with his Irish roots that he earned a degree in Celtic studies. Ryan played many instruments, including harp and violin. He studied martial arts and was trained in the ancient art of Irish stick fighting. He had many talents, including writing and music. He was well read. Ryan was such an advocate for freedom and access to information that he earned a master's degree in information and library sciences and became a librarian by profession. It was when he moved to Alberta for his dream job that he first got sick. Being so far from home, it was hard for us to help him. We noticed something was wrong and Ryan felt it too, but he didn't want to break his commitment, so he toughed it out. Ryan didn't know what was happening to him, and so he began using drugs, mainly alcohol at the time, to self-medicate and help him cope. Phone calls home became more frequent and frantic, and after a suicide attempt, we had no choice but to bring him home. We naively thought that being home, we would be able to get Ryan the help he needed. We spent seven years fighting a broken system. We love to talk about all these services that are available and on paper, they all sound so good. The reality is there's wait list and criteria for eligibility. There's red tape and lack of funding. For those with concurrent disorders, there are so many barriers to access. During the last seven years, Ryan found some support through community services such as CMHA, but it wasn't enough. The medications prescribed, and there were many, didn't work. The ones that helped him mentally had physical side effects, and thus Ryan had to discontinue using them. And those that helped, those that didn't have side effects, didn't help him mentally. Ryan's drug use progressed from alcohol to cannabis to crack cocaine and then to crystal meth. For Ryan, these drugs were his medicine. They helped him to cope with the bipolar disorder, and if he had access to a safe supply of these drugs, he would still be alive today. After Ryan's passing, my husband and I wanted to do something to honor Ryan's memory and to help those in our community that were struggling. We named this organization Ryan's Hope. The first initiative of Ryan's Hope is our Breakfast to Go program, which we started in February. When we started, we had no idea how big this would grow. We now serve breakfast seven days a week to 60 to 65 people in our community that are experiencing homelessness, are precariously housed and food insecure. This program has been as much a gift to my husband and I as it has been to the participants. People have shared the most beautiful stories with me about how much Ryan meant to them and how he touched their lives. We have cried together in grief over the loss of my son and the loss of their friend. Every week people come to breakfast and they share with me how we lost another member of our community to drugs. These losses don't make the paper. They don't get acknowledged with celebrations of life and proper burials. They go unnoticed to the majority of society because their lives are deemed unworthy. Nothing could be further from the truth. Their lives mattered and their losses have impacted our community, community deeply. In March, when we participated in Black Balloon Day, I wanted to give people a chance to honor their friends. They were invited to write their friends' names on a balloon, which would be placed around City Hall and downtown to bring awareness to the drug crisis and the impact of those lost lives. One gentleman was so deeply touched that he was being given this opportunity to remember and acknowledge his friend this way. He made me promise to put his friend's balloon in a prominent place, and he came back the next day to make sure I had kept my promise. This week at breakfast, I shared with our breakfast friends that I would be speaking at council tonight, and I asked them if they had a chance to speak with you what they would want to say. One man said, we need the SES because he has lost over 200 friends since this crisis started and he doesn't have it in him to lose anymore. He said that an SCS is a starting point, a place for people to get connected to the services that can help them. Another shared that he has lost six friends in the past two weeks. He said the drugs out there are so dangerous that every time someone uses, there's a chance that they won't wake up. Another one said, we need the SCS because it would keep people alive and safe. Instead of people hiding because of shame and stigma, they could go somewhere where someone would watch over them and keep them safe. He said people who use drugs are not bad people. They are just people who are hurting and the drugs help to take the hurt away. Since the beginning of the pandemic, we have lost so many people in our community due to toxic drugs. Health regulations have led to more people using alone at home. Border closures have led to a more lethal and toxic drug supply. Council has the opportunity tonight to do something worthy. You have the opportunity to vote in support of saving lives. Ryan didn't need to die. The more than 200 people in our community that have died due to toxic drugs since the last vote didn't have to die. Their lives mattered, they were loved, they are mourned. Their friends and families are forever changed by their passing. 
in memory and honor of Ryan and all those beautiful people that we have lost needlessly. I respectfully ask you, please vote yes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Naylor, uh, for sharing Ryan's story and for uh, such a heartfelt deputation. Um, are there questions of the deputant? Okay, uh, Ms. Naylor, thank you for being here. Thank you. Um, you. We, uh, I see we do have um, Ms. LaForestier online, I think now. Uh, that was the emergency deputation on the Bradford matter. So I will just go back to her before we proceed with all the remaining deputations uh, since she missed her spot. Uh, good evening, Ms. LaForestier. Welcome to Barrie City Council, and you have up to five minutes for your deputation. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Councillors. Uh, my name is Jenny LaForestier, and I'm a citizen of Ontario, a resident of Caledon, and the federal candidate for the Dufferin Caledon Green Party. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. While researching for this evening's council meeting, I found an article published on October 7th, uh, 2019, where Mayor Lohman was qu quoted as saying, on September 27th, around 1,000 young people and their supporters marched on the streets right outside the city hall to demand climate action. Many of them were demanding we declare a climate emergency. I'm not a big fan of declaring emergencies, approach to things when it stands alone. It accomplishes nothing, although it sometimes is an important message. For that reason, I'll support this. It states what it is. It's to name and deepen our commitment. Well, I think our commitment is demonstrated by our actions. So I agree with you, Mr. Mayor, um, your commitment is demonstrated by your actions. And so I applaud this council for listening to their constituents' concerns. I'm here tonight to request that you do not support the Bradford bypass during a global climate emergency and a global, global pandemic. Food security and the ability to grow food locally is of paramount importance to citizens in Ontario. That has never been clearer than in the last 24 months at the end of the third wave of COVID-19. The environmental assessment process has been heavily criticized in general over both the Highway 413 and the Bradford Bypass. The EA for the Bradford Bypass is 19 years old. Because the federal government did not grant a federal EIA for the Bradford Bypass, opposing a highway on provincially significant lands becomes the responsibility of local government. It is important to remember the climate emergency that you declared and to stand strong against development pressure. In 2016, the Auditor General published a value for money audit report on the province's environmental assessment process. The report included 12 recommendations consisting of 21 actions to address the audit findings. Recommendations in this report were intended to help achieve the objectives of the Environmental Assessment Act, which was designed to ensure the protection, conservation, and wise use of the environment prior to proceeding with activities that could harm. After two years, the Auditor General conducts a follow-up audit to determine the status of implementation of recommendations. They then continue to follow up annually until every recommendation is either fully implemented or no longer applies. As of March 31st, 2020, 17 of the 21 recommended actions, 81% of them were still outstanding. An old environmental assessment that is not of the required standard is a poor reflection on a process that is meant to safeguard our health, safety, and quality of life. The 2018 advisory panel in the GTA West Highway 413 noted that conclusions from phase one of the EA were fundamentally flawed, in part because of uncertainty surrounding future travel demand compared to when the EA was initiated 10 years ago. The panel indicated that a preferred planning approach would be to develop a single unified transportation plan for the entire greater Golden Horseshoe that would align with provincial policies and explicitly consider uncertainty. The panel supported investment in transit and rail and optimizing the existing transportation transportation network. Has an independent expert panel analyzed the EA for the Bradford Bypass? Given the proposal for the Encore Go Transit expansion project that will improve transit along the Barrie, Kitchener, Lakeshore East, Lakeshore West, Richmond Hills, Stouffville, Union Station, and Union Pearson Express Go Transit corridors, why are we building a highway that promotes car dependent communities on the last best farmland close to the GTA market? Adjacent to the Holland Marsh wetland complex, the largest wetland habitat in the Lake Simcoe watershed. In May 2020, a presentation to Ontario ministers from an industry groups representing the residential and commercial construction industry contained a recommendation to accelerate approvals of key pieces of infrastructure in order to unlock housing supply. 
In July 2020, the province released legislative changes to fast track the EA approvals under the blanket of economic recovery from COVID-19. If the Bradford bypass is built, development pressure on local governments will be insurmountable and local councils will not be able to resist, especially in the absence of provincial support. Speculation has already commenced as is evident by recent real estate transactions and requests from developers to convert lands from employment or commercial to residential, suggesting prime agricultural lands would be developable surrounding the Bradford Bypass. Therefore, valuable food production that is close to market is lost for Ontario consumers, as well as the loss of environmental sensitive lands important for source and stormwater protection and may provide critical habitat for endangered species. The Walmart distribution in Vaughan approved by an MZO approved paving over a small PSW in part because the wetland has lost its ecological value due to MTO supervised construction activities on the adjacent Highway 400. The consultant for the MZO approving a warehouse on the Deference Creek wetland argued in part that the development should proceed because the wetland had been degraded due to the presence of Highway 401. What will be the fate of the ecologically significant and environment, environmentally sensitive land surrounding the proposed Bradford Bypass if it is built? What development will follow because the land has lost its ecological value and significance? The EA predates the Lake Simcoe Protection Plan, the Greenbelt Plan, or any climate targets and commitments. There could be severe impacts to stormwater and groundwater, and there should be required upgrades to important studies on groundwater protection, archaeological resources, and stormwater management. In 1997, most people still did not acknowledge that climate change was real. In 2021, many regions and municipalities like yourselves have now declared climate emergencies. Our lives have changed significantly and devastatingly in a short time due to the pandemic, with people forced to embrace working from home and online. We do not yet know if these changes will be permanent. The Ontario Federation of Agriculture's new campaign titled Homegrown focuses on protecting and preserving farmland and domestic food production. The campaign hopes to increase awareness on the issue and enhance consumer knowledge about the negative impacts of urban development on Ontario's agri-food system. The Ontario Federation of Agriculture states that the current rate, we're losing an average of five farms per week to urban development. Along with farmland, significant wetlands, key shorelines and forests are being threatened by urban sprawl. If this continues, the whole province will feel the effects. Farmers grow and produce more than 200 different fruits and vegetables and grains and livestock, provide nearly 1 million jobs in the agri-food sector, and contribute more than 47 billion to the provincial economy. If Ontario is currently losing this 170... the first year. I'm, yes. I'm, I'm sorry. To Am I out of time? I, That's I okay. I was almost done I'm anyway. Yeah, yeah thank you, you very much. Wrap up your I, remarks, yeah, I can, great. actually. Um, I just wanted to finish saying that I, I do support the motion that you've put on the table, and I, I do want you to support 21G137. And I also do want you to consider alternatives. And one of those alternatives might actually be not to put the Bradford Bypass through the Holland Marsh. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, certainly lots in that, and thank you for being here tonight. Uh, any questions for the deputant from members of council? Okay, seeing none, uh, thank you for being here. Uh, okay, we will now uh, dive into our list. Um, uh, Ms. Naylor was the first uh, to speak on the motion regarding um, the support for the supervised consumption site or the proposed supervised consumption site locations. Our second deputant on that matter is Amanda Maynard. Ms. Maynard, welcome to Barry City Council. And in accordance with our procedural bylaw, you have five minutes for your deputation. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I just want to confirm that you can all hear me. Um, okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, good evening, Mr. Mayor and City of Barrie Council members. Um, before I get started tonight, I would like to take a moment to thank you for your additional acknowledgement at the beginning of the meeting regarding the 215 Indigenous children whose bodies were recently uncovered in BC. I'll carry on with what I'm here to talk about today. Um, in addition to the correspondence that I've previously sent you all, I'm here today to speak out against the, the proposed SCS at 11 Innisfil Street. My name is Amanda Maynard. I'm a proud Anishinaabe Kwe who lives in Ward 2 where my partner and I are raising three young children steps away from the proposed site. I've spent my career working towards the improved well-being of this region's Indigenous community and I have spent my entire life alongside countless individuals who struggle with both mental health and addictions. What we are discussing tonight is a much more complex issue than opioid overdoses. It is a systemic issue that requires far more attention in this city than an SCS offering drop-in services. 
the entire region is facing a mental health and addictions crisis that stretches far beyond the current situation that we are experiencing in downtown Barrie. I believe that people deserve equitable access to health and social services that support their holistic well-being. I do not endorse siloed strategies that fail to implement an all-encompassing approach of mental, physical, spiritual, and emotional well-being. In addition to my concerns regarding this limiting approach to addressing the opioid crisis, I have several concerns regarding the process that we as a neighborhood have endured up until tonight, and I have a limited confidence in the proposed mitigating strategies of the applicant. We have been provided with misleading information regarding this particular site from the very beginning. As we are all aware, there has been a great deal of confusion stemming from the address identified to the public during this process. The site address is next door to a Zumba studio, 30 meters across the street from a childcare and surrounded by residential homes and small businesses, many of whom have not been aware of the applicant's intentions until the last few weeks. The feedback collected from this neighborhood is unreliable at best. I have numerous safety concerns for the neighborhood and SCS visitors. This location is extremely busy, busy with both vehicle and pedestrian traffic, and there are numerous residential development projects occurring within a one kilometer radius. There are limited streets to walk eastward to downtown while avoiding other concerns such as the methadone clinics that we see on Dunlop Street. Additionally, we are a walk zone to the local public elementary school. This neighborhood is robust with children who should be protected from the exposure of daily opioid use and the stigma that will undoubtedly be associated with living here. Should this site be endorsed, the visible drug problem that stretches from High Street to Mulcaster will migrate to our neighborhood that, that is on the outskirts of downtown Barrie. The SCS needs to be easily accessible, private, away from busy streets and community members, and most importantly, where the problem exists. 11 Innisfil is not these things. As previously highlighted by Council, a great deal of stigma is faced by those who struggle with mental health and addictions, a stigma in which the BIA has fought to keep away from downtown by investing in a lobbying firm to influence the site placement. I would again like to echo Mr. Morales's comments in his ability to now get on board and get out of the way of the SES. I find it quite timely that he has recently been announced the BIA's newest elected chair. I've worked hard to obtain an education, a home that I own, and to generally elevate myself from a situation of poverty and provide a good life for my family. It is with great humility that I plead to the city of Barrie to hold off on making a decision that will impact the selected neighborhood forever. If the city is truly invested in being a part of the solution to mental health and addictions that plague our city, I ask you to become an active partner in creating a community-based solution. Let's investigate innovative and holistic approaches being taken on by other community leaders in mental health and addictions. Furthermore, the applicant should be required to reconsider all feasible sites, including the properties that they own themselves in downtown Barrie, and proceed with a more meaningful engagement with those neighborhoods. I ask that we resume this conversation in 60 days time to have, to have a minimal impact on the overall timeline, and in hopes that we will have a more wholesome strategy in the city of Barrie. Perhaps an approach that is ahead of the pack, as the city has so proudly referred to its investment strategies as of late. I thank you for your time and consideration, and I truly hope that as a community, we can come to a far more impactful solution. Thank you all. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Maynard, for such a thoughtful deputation. Uh, are there any questions from members of committee? Uh, Councillor Harris and then Councillor Morales. Thank you, Mayor Lehman, and thank you, Ms. Maynard, for your deputation. Um, my question to you, uh, at one point you mentioned that the SES provides drop-in services, and then um, you didn't elaborate into what other wraparound services and what other further social services are provided. I just wanted to be sure that you were aware of the fact that it isn't just a drop-in service to be used as a supervised consumption site. It's also um, to connect these individuals to services that you are referring to. Um, and if not, we can maybe provide through staff a list of what those services are. Am I able to respond? 
Um, yes, I in fact am fully aware of the drop-in services and the potential partnerships that the applicant is planning on operating within this facility. I'm actually quite familiar with both social and health services within this, this whole region and how the ministry works, as well as various under other funders. So we see different strategies right now where we are taking wholesome approaches to address the, the entire being, the core problem, the, the core traumas that are really at the, the root of these problems. So to have a drop-in service, in my opinion anyway, that you have at this point no real schedule for, um, no idea what those will be or how often they will be visiting the site. There's no hard plan, which I have asked for from the applicant. Um, I don't believe that it is in the city's best interest to, at this point, be making a decision that will affect the whole city. Uh, through Councilor Harris, Mayor. question. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, just to follow up, um, I just wanted to also make sure that you're aware that um, at this stage, the SES approval would um, potentially go through, um, and and then those are confirmed and addressed. So um, it actually isn't part of the model that all of that would already be um, determined. However, communication with all of those services is um, well underway. Um, I just wanted to make sure that you were aware of that. Yes. Yes, I'm also aware of that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks, Councillor Harris. Councillor Morales. Uh, thank you, uh, Mayor Lehman. Uh, to Ms. Maynard, uh, could you clarify your comments about me? You addressed me specifically well, in your comment there, and it, 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 it was very tiptoe-ish. I just want to get some clarity. Yes, I can absolutely clarify. Um, so I guess what I am tiptoeing around at the moment is the fact that you yourself, Mr. Morales, has recently been named the chair of the BIA, who has a conflict, in my opinion, in this entire situation. Okay, uh, Ms. Maynard, you're entitled to your opinion. They're not facts. Uh, if you have any concerns, feel free to go to the integrity commission. Okay, thank you, Ms. Morales, Mr. Morales, and I will say that I have reached out and, and voiced those concerns to council as well and have not heard back from yourself or any other council member to, to speak to that. Uh, Ms. Maynard, okay, so I'm going to call a stop to this right now. Uh, thank you, Ms. Maynard, for your deputation. Thank you, Councillor Morales, for your, your comment, but uh, the purpose of deputations is not to debate back and forth with uh, members of the public uh, or with members of council. So I'll thank you both. Uh, are there other questions for the deputant at the moment? Okay, uh, then thank you, Ms. Maynard, for being here. Uh, our next deputant tonight is Aaron Maynard. Uh, Mr. Maynard? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Welcome to City Council and in accordance with procedural bylaw, you have five minutes for your deputation. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. Uh, my name is Aaron Maynard and I live steps from the potential SES. Unfortunately, in the previously held community engagement session, which was uh, transparently calculated and poorly run, Myself and other participants were dismissed. I was cut off due to technical issues on their end with no attempt to reconnect me. Needless to say, this dismissiveness left me feeling bewildered and hopeless. It gives me zero confidence to how proposed mitigating strategies in the community will be managed. Since this time, my wife and I have been trying to connect with many of you on social media to show you the reality of our neighborhood. However, only a few of you have taken the time to listen, let alone respond. I hope you can all see and hear us now. The SCS project seems like something this council wishes to push forward, not just to help those dealing with substance abuse, but also to put a check mark on Barry's inclusivity roster, to use as a great filter on social media, or to cheer for yourselves in social me in council meetings. To us, there is so much more at stake, and we feel that there are factors not being adequately considered. This will affect everything for my family. I've lived my whole life in Barrie, and I even attended a daycare in the very unit on Innisfil Street we're discussing tonight. We shop, live, love, and play here. Amanda and I deliberately chose the residential part of Ward 2 as where we would raise our own family. We have three young daughters. We moved here so that we, to what we hope would be our forever home on Perry Street five years ago, and we are thriving. If this area were rife with drug abuse, we would not be living here. We have worked very hard to protect our children from the impact this opioid crisis has had within our own families. 
This location choice at very, very best is a consolation for where it may have actually been most effective. And I believe this site was selected with the hope of it being the path of least resistance as much if not more than its actual suitability. I am concerned with this council's willingness to allow a private property owner such as the Aurarium Group to profit from a site like this. It seems strange to me that no municipally owned sites were offered for consideration. Allowing wealthy individuals to profit through rental incomes while neighbors lose in property value, safety, and reputation is wrong. If this council wants to endorse an SES, the only option should be for the site to exist in a municipal space. To give away any and all influence the city could have in the operation of a facility like this is short-sighted and a failure to the citizens of this ward and the city as a whole. I understand the work that people have done and the barriers they have faced trying to get an SES in Barrie. But Dr. Lisa Simon said herself on May 25th that a site like this cannot be effective if it is not where the problem is. It is the city of Barrie's failures in Milligan's Pond that have determined this neighborhood to look like a hotspot, including a sanctioned tent city and the data collection to determine drug use in the community is not representative of the neighborhood around it. Anyone who takes the time to look can see that these residential streets completely surrounding 11 Innisfil Street are rebounding and even flourishing. These are the communities this city was built from, and great things are happening here. There is not one rooming house or residence of drug concern anywhere in the immediate vicinity of this site. The residents of this community need, need the city council to, to support this rebound and the return of young families, not allow the most challenging social issues affecting this entire city to become its defining characteristic. There is a need to address the social determinants of health, but at best, an SCS and harm reduction strategies are a narrow, targeted band-aid fix, who on their own are not truly impactful resources to the overall problem. There are deeply concerning reports claiming a massive negative impact on neighborhoods around an SCS, particularly when they are not already in drug-plagued neighborhoods. Please understand I am not being dramatic when I say we cannot afford the financial and emotional loss of being forced to leave our home. Speaking to professionals, we believe current real estate prices in Barrie combined with the loss and value of our home due to the direct effect of the stigma associated with an SCS means we will not just have to leave our street, but the city we love and have spent our entire lives in. Families like mine are what this city really needs to support a strong downtown, particularly as the husband and father of an indigenous women and children I believe that they should have every right to stay here and live safely beside this beautiful bay, not be made to feel like the rug is being pulled out from under us. Please don't push us out. Barry can and should want to do better than this solution at this location. Thank you for your time tonight. Thank you, Mr. Maynard. And I can hear the uh, emotion in your voice and how strongly you feel about this. Thank you for giving us your uh, obviously very heartfelt views. Are there Thank any you. comments, or, or sorry, not comments, questions only, questions for the deputant? Uh, Councillor McCann. Thank you, Mayor Lehman and uh, uh, Mr. Aaron. I uh, appreciate your uh, your presentation, obviously echoing uh, what the mayor said that uh, your passion came through. Uh, I just wanted to make sure that, um, that your voice is heard uh, federally and provincially, and you wanted to make sure that you did understand the process uh, moving forward tonight, if it does pass, this is not the the, the end of the line. So I, I do. and I, I don't think you, you you can't go back and forth with me. But I'm just like you can reach out to me, uh, please. <clears throat> uh, sure. I, I do think that your uh, your very passionate and meaningful uh, presentation should be heard provincially and federally. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McCann. Any other questions for the deputant? Okay, uh, seeing none, Mr. Maynard. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Uh, our next uh, speakers on the list uh, are, we don't think are online at the moment. Uh, that is Tom and Kylie Swales. Um, if you are online, uh, Madam Clerk, under another name or phone number, uh, what should they do? Um, through you, Mayor Lehman, they can email the city clerk's inbox and just let us know what, what name they're under and we'll, we'll locate them. We'll try and locate them. Okay. So, uh, so, um, sorry, city clerks at barry.ca. Yeah. So Tom and Kylie, if you're online uh, under a different name or, or uh, number, just email city clerks, all one word at barry.ca. 
Uh, we will move on for now to our next registered deputant, who is Krista Westerning. Krista, welcome to Barrie City Council. And in accordance with our procedural bylaw, you have five minutes for your deputation. Nope, oh, still on mute. Hello, can you hear me? Now we can hear you, go ahead. Hi, thank you so much for allowing me to share this evening. Um, let me just pull up my notes, thanks. All right, my name is actually Megan and I operate a yoga studio at 110 Bradford Street. And I've done that for the past nine years. I provide a safe space, literally and figuratively, for people to get healthy and heal physically and mentally, as well as in some cases, actually overcome and deal with addictions. So I would say we have similar missions of helping and serving people in need of healing in our community. I'd like to share a bit about how my business operates to give you some context and some context for the concerns I'm going to share. I'm responsible for the safety of over 200 members of my studio and the safety of our 30 staff and volunteers. When we are open, we can expect 160 plus people a day to go through our doors, predominantly women, and they're predominantly off, um, arriving and departing alone. My business opens at 5.30 a.m. and it doesn't close until after 10 p.m. These openings and closings are done by a single female employee, often in the dark, so before sunup and after sundown. Most of my staff and many clients park in the lot run by 80 Bradford Street. So that's just adjacent to your proposed site. We have no street lighting on Vespra in front of the studio. So that's just a bit of context. So from the small bit I know about safe consumption sites and their socioeconomic impact, much of which I've learned from a 194 page report um, called Impact, a Socioeconomic Review of Supervised Consumption Sites in Alberta, which was published in March 2020. Here are my primary concerns. The report found that social disorder increased in the areas surrounding safe consumption sites. This included harassment in public areas, drug users urinating or defecating on property or in front of businesses, as well as uttering profanities or making rude gestures to community members and patrons of local businesses. My clients are coming for a safe place to look after themselves physically, mentally, and emotionally, and many are healing from trauma and harassment. So I'm concerned that if as they leave or arrive, they are harassed, this may not be a place they wanna continue coming to do that healing work. I am also worried about the safety of our predominantly female staff and clientele arriving alone, many times in the dark and with the poor street lighting in the area, as they would be a very easy target for harassment. And I believe protecting women is very important. People urinating and defecating on our property, that's I don't really need to explain. Um, and it's actually already an issue for us. We have a space behind our building um, where some people walk behind frequently. We've put up a fence, it's been ripped down. We've installed security lighting there as well to try to mitigate these issues. Another concern, um, it sort of correlates to the previous, but it's a lack of stability of drug users leaving the safe consumption site. So especially with the use of methamphetamines, the impact of these drugs can last for hours. And it says that the exhibited, um, the drug users frequently exhibit erratic and aggressive behavior upon exiting a site immediately after use. I understand that some sites have small facilities for users to remain after their consumption. However, most users are actually on the street long before the effects of their drugs have worn off. This is a major safety concern for me, for my staff and my clients. Um, in the report, numerous owners indicated that they and their staff were often wary of coming and going from work, walking to their cars, or taking public transportation at closing time. Some reported keeping their doors locked during business hours, and many reported significant investments in security cameras and other devices. High levels of theft and shoplifting were reported. Again, this concern is especially um, in my heart because most of my staff are women coming and leaving a lot of times after dark. Additionally, there is increased numbers of discarded syringes, crack pipes, and other forms of drug paraphernalia in the surrounding areas. It's an obvious issue. Um, crime, as measured by police calls for service, increased in the immediate vicinity of safe consumption sites. And then finally, um, in the report, it says that safe consumption sites provided a reliable fixed customer base for local dealers, leading to more drug trafficking and use in the immediate area. 
I understand that we want to ensure the health and safety of drug users and people struggling with addiction. I genuinely want that too. I just need to know how do we ensure the health and safety of me, my staff, my clients, and my business. I've invested substantially in my building and improving this neighborhood and my community. And I just need to know and would love to continue doing so. So thank you so much for your time. I very much appreciate it. Thank you very much, uh, Megan. Um, questions from members of council for the deputant. Yes. Councillor Natalie Harris. Sorry, thank you uh, for your deputation through you, Mayor Lehman. I just wanted to confirm which um, report you're referring to. Yes, let me just get the name and I can send the link for it. Um, so the name of it is Impact, two dots, a socioeconomic review of supervised consumption sites in Alberta. Um, it is done by the government of Alberta. Let me see here. Um, hang on. Da, da, da. So it was an independent expert committee, committee appointed by the provincial government of Alberta. They reviewed the social and economic impacts of current and proposed supervised consumption sites and released their final report on March 5th. And the reason um, they did this, yeah, so in the spring of 2019, the government of Alberta announced a freeze on funding new supervised consumption sites pending this review, excuse me, pending this review. So Does sorry, it was released question? March March 5th of this year? 2020. Of 2020, okay. So yeah. I just wanna draw your attention to um, a new harm reduction as a harm reduction journal and it was published January 6, 2021. Um, supervised consumption sites and crime scrutinizing the methodological weaknesses, sorry, and aberrant results of a government report in Canada, Alberta, which actually um, went against a lot of those claims in that report. So that is a peer reviewed. I can send you that if you'd like, if you're interested in reading yeah, it. I love that. Sure, no problem. Um, but I just wanted to let you know that um, a lot of the stats that you were um, stating um, have been actually, I don't know the right word, is it debunked? I'm not really sure, but um, this clarifies that. Yeah, okay, thank you. Yeah, I'm curious of, yeah, to know who they were debunked by if that whole long report was created by these communities, thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, are there other questions for the deputant? Okay, seeing none. Uh, Megan, thank you for being here tonight. And we will move on to our next deputant. And that is Cameron Qureshi. Cameron, welcome to Barry City Council. And in accordance with our procedural bylaw, you have five minutes for your deputation. Yes, good evening. Can everybody hear me well? Yes, we can hear you. And thank you for the, uh, allowing me the opportunity to speak. I realize that I am not as uh, prepared or articulated as some of the previous speakers. Um, as we run a 24 hour daycare, it hasn't given me much chance to prepare like write stuff down. But I do want to bring out to the uh, highlight the aspect of the number of children, like my being at daycare, we've been, we've moved to Barrie about six and a half years ago. When we moved around Innisfil Street, at that point, because uh, the Barrie Collegiate School had closed down, pretty much all the families had moved out of, with children had moved out of this area. Within two years of us being here, we've started to see a uh, couple of families moved back to the area, which is when we actually opened up our daycare or child home care, child provider. And since the four plus years that we have been doing this, we have seen a number of families move to this area. Plus also is that a number of demand has actually increased for uh, our services as we are the only 24 hour childcare provider within a very great radius around here. Uh, so much so that we've actually invested about 40,000 to actually legalize our uh, basement and to be able to expand to a capacity of 24 children. Aside from the 24 children that we will have on the daycare premises, 
we have about 16 children that live directly in this neighborhood, which will be about within 60 to 100 meters away from this site. Then with the, so we are talking about within the next, our basement is actually, our second daycare is actually ready to be started within the next three weeks. So which we will be have, our capacity will raise to 24. I have two small children of my own. You've heard from other people and you will probably hear from other residents as well with small children in the area as well. The reason why the, all the Milligan's Pond problem that people have been citing as it being a hub for all this stuff, that's more towards the other side of Milligan's Pond, but it was more created when the tent city was allowed to actually set up there. So it was around the time where all these people were collecting their stats for ODs and that probably drew up, drew up the numbers from the way we see it. All says that this side of the street be, are separated by a stream in Milligan's Pond. So all the residents on Innisfil Street have not faced the problem of any of the homelessness or the drug problem that goes on in Milligan's Pond. That's why most people, more people are actually moving, more families are moving towards this side. The problem that we figured with you putting a, a, a safe injection site right in front of us, like we're only about 30 meters away from this place. It's right against the sidewalk. There's no space for you guys to actually fence this off and create a separate entrance where it will not be able to, the, they'll be able to be private from the public. There is a bus stop right at the corner. People have highlighted that this is a busy street for traffic, pedestrian and uh, vehicular. More developments are going up in this area, which will be bringing more residents to this area. And with you bringing this site here, it's going to sandwich us right between the problem area that the, we see the city created and what's called the problems that this site is going to create. And that's going to make force these people to move onto our property. I have, my wife is the one who runs the daycare. My job was in Toronto. I actually just left my, retired from my job so we can actually expand the daycare here. But in the meantime, I haven't been worried. I have a wife and I have three daughters, which have, my young daughters have grown up in this area. And me being away to Toronto for one day or two days, I never worried about the safety of my family here. This site, increases my level of worry exponentially. We have like this site is this area is being like it's up and coming. There's a lot of developments coming in. There's a lot of new families coming in. This area is already much pretty clean. Adding this site here, you are bringing into an element which does not really exist in this area. Now you're going to be bringing it and telling them to come to this area. So we are not against the uh, safe injection site. We feel for the people, we feel for Ryan's mom, we feel for other people that have lost people uh, due to overdoses, but they are adults who have made their choice one or another. They have had opportunities, they have, are ways for them to get help, but the children that will be about affected in this area, currently, which will next two, three months will be about 40 children that will be affected by this, that will be exposed to all of this, the creation of new drug users because of this, they don't have a choice in this. You are taking that choice away from them. I am sure you're going to hear a lot of other stats about other things, but I am really concerned with, with the children and in this area and the way that this area is developing as a family oriented area. In the last six and a half years, we have seen this area go from basically like no children to an abundance of children walking around everywhere. They're not going to be able to walk down the street or come into this area without having to pass by or walk by your site. And that will stop 
families from coming to this area. It will derail everything that this area has been trying to do to bring itself up. So I plead that this site is not correct for the safe injection site. It is needed and buried, but this is not the area for it. There are other areas and other factors you should take in consideration. I have, from my understanding, the fact of children being in close vicinity was actually one of the deciding factors. People have said that they've done extensive talks to with people around the area, yet nobody knew about that we were a childcare provider in this area until about three or four weeks ago. Nobody knew that there's about 40 different children in this area or about 30 different children in this area at right now. Mr. Qureshi, I, I respect your interest and in how strongly you feel about this. I've given you a little bit of extra time, but I'm gonna have to ask you to wrap up given how many folks that we also have who wanna to speak to us tonight. I appreciate your time. I thank you if I actually seem like I started to ramble there, uh, but I have pretty much said what I would like to say that I do believe that this uh, SC, uh, the safe injection site is, is a big help to Barry's residents, but it needs to be in a better area where people will be able to access the services, but at the same time, not affecting any of the residents that are actually currently there. Okay. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you for your deputation. Uh, I have three members of council who want to ask you a question. I'll start with Councillor McCann. Uh, thank you, Mayor Lehman. I'd just like to maybe, uh, Mr. Crushy, to uh, give me a little more detail. There was a member of council last week that kind of mentioned Milligan's Pond and that, you know, that you're already uh, dealing with some of the, uh, um, the stresses uh, from Milligan Pond. And, and you're saying that, that you're not. Um, you know, I owned a property... 25 years ago, 187 Inneso Street, just down the road from you. So I know the, the area very well. I had a triplex there and I was there often. And, and, and I agree, I never, I saw transient, but I never saw um, isolated problems on that street and especially where you are. Could you just maybe amplify, go into a little more detail uh, with that condition and then what you speculate uh, would happen if there was an SES right across the street from you? Yes, thank you. Um, the, the Milligan's Pond has multiple entrances. The Innisfil Street, the houses that are along Innisfil Street have a stream which divides Milligan's Pond right in the middle of Milligan's Pond. It divides it. And most of the park is actually towards the other side of the pond. And then you have the houses along Innisfil Street which are on the other side of the stream. These houses, do not see, see a problem with like the homeless because nobody actually wanders over toward this side. The residents have, the older residents that have been here have been quite vigilant to make sure to point out anybody that wanders over that they don't need to be on this side. We have never, any, no house on the Innisfil Street has ever reported having a problem with uh, the people in the back there in a number of years. As I mentioned, when I moved here six years ago, six and a half years ago, there was what's it called, I was informed of all these problems in this area before I moved here. Like my friends and relatives had actually advised me moving towards this area. They were telling me move towards the north and south ends. But being in this area for just within a year, we, again, we haven't seen any of these problems. We have not to this day, we haven't dealt with anybody trying to walk over onto our property or anybody squatting or finding any kind of paraphernalia around our area. I appreciate your answer. And, and I just wanna maybe make some uh, really uh, quick, question, uh, quick questions and maybe just get some really direct answers from you just because I know there's a number of council members that are having questions. I'd like to ask you about uh, communication. Um, you know, you own a daycare and did you say you have, you have the potential in the near future to have 24 kids uh, at your 24 hour daycare? Yes, sir. Like, so that is, okay. So then my, my next question is, what communication did you have from uh, City of Barrie or from um, uh, Simple, Simple, Simple County? I actually have had zero communications and zero information passed to me about this. I found out about this 
site being chosen about three or four weeks ago when my neighbor pointed out to me in the very advanced and showed me the article. And even then I was wondering, like he told me that this had been going on and there was a problem with them mislabeling the address. And I have seen for the last six years that this address has been very clearly labeled as 11 Innisfil Street. So I don't know how, understand how it ever came as 80 Bradford to begin with, because it's always been 11 Innisfil Street. Yeah, no, I appreciate all those comments. And uh, I know uh, Councillor Harvey has uh, um, some, uh, some questions, so I'll let him ask. But I just wanted to maybe ask you about your association with WeWatch. And maybe I can get uh, Andrea Miller to, uh, to maybe uh, come in and maybe clear something up for me. Uh, why, we, why we watch organization is not a sanctioned uh, child care facility or a daycare. So Ms. Miller, are you, through you, Mayor Lehman, could you um, get that clarification now or would you like to do that later on, Mayor? Yeah, you can do that later on, Councilor McCann. We got a long list of speakers, so just questions for the deputant at this point. Thanks. Okay, so, so maybe the question I'll have is, uh, how long have you been certified by, we, by uh, it's not we watch, yeah, we watchers. Yes. Hmm? How long about have you been a, little, a little over four years. And, and, and is, is, that, is that hard? To, is that certification a lengthy process or is it just a simple application or is it an no, investigation? It, it's... No, it is a, a process. Uh, my wife started the process. She took her uh, a couple of months to actually get approved. Okay. Well, I do have more questions, but I think they're the same as uh, Councillor Harvey. So I'll, uh, I'll um, just let you know that... Uh, Reach, please reach out to me. This is the first time we've spoken. Um, you know, the, the next stage is going to be Health Canada. And the next stage is going to be Ministry of Health. And I would like to um, uh, just direct you where you can uh, put your concerns. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, thank you. Next, I have Councillor Harvey. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, yeah, to the deputant, uh, in your deputation, you mentioned uh, an estimated distance of 600 to or 60 to 100 meters. Um, how did you ascertain that distance? Did you actually measure it out? Well, I've actually uh, read in the reports that my house is, according to published reports, they said in the article, is that my house is about 30 meters away from this site because we are directly across the street from it. My house is a semi-detached house. There is the residence next to me. He has two, three small girls of his own. I have two small children. The house two doors down from me has like two children of their own. The house two doors down from that has three small children. So these are just the number of residents that I can just count along this street on my side of the street that are facing uh, the safe injection site. Great, thank you. Yeah, no, I, I was just getting specific with your particular situation because uh, I, I, I am well aware that uh, it is 30 meters and not the 60 to 100 that you mentioned earlier in your deputation. Yeah. So I just wanted that to be clear for, uh, for all members of council uh, with the close proximity you are to the front door of the proposed location. Now with your licensing uh, through, uh, through WeWatch, um, uh, have you had any discussions with WeWatch as to what your your future would be with the company uh, if if this proposed uh, safe consumption site is approved? At this moment, I have uh, not spoken to them. I was waiting for actually the, to hear from the results of this meeting to actually do, uh, to speak with them about that. Great, thank you. Um, I, I will let you know, I have had uh, discussions today with executive management at uh, head office. Uh, however, I don't think this is the appropriate time for me to, to talk, speak about that. And I will uh, we'll address that later uh, during the debate. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Natalie Harris. Thank you, Mary Lehman. Uh, thank you for your deputation. I have a, a question. My question is, what are your specific safety concerns? specific what are your concerns that would be um, a safety concern with respect to those children i have mothers who come towards the evening like who are frontline workers they're nurses to come they come on their own to drop their children off i have killed people coming at all different times of the day to drop their children off and pick them up the my major concern is that when we are directly across the street from them, these children will be uh, exposed 
to inebriated people, people which are high, people will be, be on any type of behavior. Once they leave your site, I don't believe there is any guarantee of their condition by you guys. So whatever, how they react, that will all be exposed to my children right here. Plus the mothers and families, which are what's it called, dropping the parents off, the single moms, which are dropping their parents off towards the evening, they may not feel comfortable if they see uh, people hanging outside of that place. You also have what's it called, the safety of the, what's it called, like I, the safety of the residents, my children won't be able to cross the street when they go and because we have no sidewalk on our side, the sidewalk is on the other side of the street. They can't go, they'll be afraid to cross the street to even just go to the sidewalk, which means that they'll be walking towards on the street, which was put more resident kids on this side into more danger, just because they'll try to avoid that situation. Okay, thank you for that. So I guess my, my point is, those are generalized safety concerns, but there is no scientific data that shares current I'm looking at very current peer reviewed data um, that says that there is an increase in crime in any way around SESs, except I believe it was in one city. So this was the one report I'm reading is a pretty large peer reviewed article. Um, and I think it's just really important um, to maybe even suggest it's unfortunate as COVID times because if you had the opportunity to visit an SES in another city like we have in say Guelph, um, many of Dr. us- Harris, I'm, so, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Is there a question? Um, I, I guess the question was just about what are your specific safety concerns? Because I, I would like to notify that all people that are even going to make a deputation later, um, increase crime around SESs. Um, okay, that just so I, isn't facts. I, I know this is an important point uh, and I I'll add welcome- to it later. Yes, I will welcome all these points uh, that members of council wish to make during the debate, which will come after the deputations. But for now, I just have to ask everybody questions only for the deputants for now. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, are there any other questions of the deputant? Okay, uh, seeing none, uh, we will move on. Thank you, Mr. Qureshi for being here and for uh, the, um, uh, the heartfelt to the passion in your deputation. We heard it for sure. For sure. Um, and uh, next I have Victoria Scott. Uh, Ms. Scott, welcome to Barry City Council in accordance with our procedural bylaw. You have five minutes for your deputation. Can you hear me? We can. Thank you. Uh, Victoria Scott here, uh, Mayor Lehman. I'm speaking to you today as a resident of the downtown area, a retired registered nurse with a background in sexual health, sexual assault, domestic violence and HIV palliative care and as a member of the Supervised Consumption Site Advisory Committee. I've been a member of the committee since its inception in September 2019. And the purpose of my deputation to you today is to urge the council to endorse the proposed location of a supervised consumption site at 11 Ennisville Street. Over the years as part of my professional life, I have sat on many different committees dealing with various aspects of the healthcare sector. And I can say with confidence that as a member of the site selection advisory committee, the co-applicants, the Canadian Mental Health Association, Simcoe County and the Simcoe Muskoka District Health Unit have remained unwavering in facilitating a comprehensive search for a suitable site and a fulsome and inclusive community engagement process. Although the final decision for a specific site was made by the co-applicants, everyone at the table was given an equal voice. The scientific evidence that continues to emerge from communities similar to ours with supervised consumption sites in operation is that this approach is the most effective way of dealing with the overdose crisis. A supervised consumption site is not a temporary Band-Aid solution. Although it includes links to abstinence-based treatment options, this approach is not always realistic for a person with addictions. A supervised site is often the first point of access to safe treatment, prevention resources, and other primary care services. Many lives have been lost in our region. The effect of the pandemic has resulted in doubling an already alarming death rate due to overdoses. 
Those that have survived an overdose and are continuing to use have missed the opportunity to connect with pathways to treatment that a site offers. Delay the application for a site in Barry will continue to increase the number of HIV and hepatitis infections that result from sharing drug taking paraphernalia. Preventative measures that a site offers provides, uh, uh, that a site provides reduces overall healthcare costs, but most importantly, saves lives. If you show up in an emergency department with a partially amputated finger from attempting to trim the shrubs after consuming a few beers, the initial response is not to counsel you on alcohol consumption. The first response is to address the finger. A crisis requires an immediate and effective response. This is what a supervised consumption site is. Treating addiction as a chronic relapsing disease demands short and long-term strategies. Clients who attend the facility will be offered links to treatment. This is a longer term strategy. Unsupervised consumption is currently taking place in the area of the proposed site. This is an unsafe situation for all community members. Strategies that a supervised site can offer like regular needle sweeps, peer outreach and support and ongoing community engagement will increase safety for all our community. From my experience as a registered nurse, I did not get to choose who received care. Make no mistake, this is a health care crisis and people in our community are continuing to die. Today, you have the opportunity to save lives and create pathways to recovery. Today, you have the opportunity to make a significant impact on the health of our community. This is why I am urging council members to endorse the proposed site location of 11 Innisfil Street. Thank you for your time. Ms. Scott, thank you very much for your deputation. Are there questions from members of council? Not seeing any. Thank you, Ms. Scott, for being here uh, and for giving us your deputation. Next, we have Ann Cleveley. And welcome to Barry City Council. In accordance with our procedural bylaw, you have five minutes for your deputation. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I actually received an email as well from the HIP Development uh, Limited, who are making, uh, they're the developers preparing the Barry Central location. I've emailed a copy of it through to Councillors Harvey and Councillors McCann. But I've been asked um, to read it on behalf of Joel Dory, who is the Vice President of the HIP Development Limited. So I don't know if I can read both of them at the same time or if I have to wait to read his um, thoughts. Uh, well, we normally require people to give deputations only uh, for their own views. Um, is it possible for you to email that? Is there any reason why you couldn't have sent it to all members of council? I just quickly sent it, it, it hap he sent it to me while this was happening. So I sent it to McCann and Harvey because they're on my email list. No one else has responded to my email. So that's why I sent it to them. Okay, well, perhaps they could uh, share it with uh, members of council uh, and uh, perhaps you could proceed with, with your deputation. Awesome. Okay. Okay, good evening, Mayor Lehman, city councilors and fellow residents of Barrie. Tonight, we are finally being given time to voice our concerns over the placement of safe injection, consumption, inhalation site in our neighborhood at 11 Innisfil Road. I want to thank all of my neighbors that were able to get a link to participate in tonight's meeting. I want to address communication and the lack of neighborhood and business consultation. Our first chance to learn about the safe injection consumption site was a virtual meeting April 29th. During this meeting, 80 Bradford Street was presented, but the pick was of 11 Innisfil Road. A neighbor drew their attention to it and actually ran across the road to show himself in front of the door, which matched the picture that they had said was 80 Bradford Street. They had to correct the address to 11 Innisfil. From that point on, we, the neighborhood, have been trying to be heard through emails and phone messages to counselors and the mayor. The media continued to cover it as 80 Bradford Street, then 19 Innisfil, 
and finally two weeks ago as 11 in a spill road. Prior to the virtual meeting, there was a survey that some neighbors received. It presented 80 Bradford Street as one of four proposed sites. A number of people in the neighborhood were okay with 80 Bradford Street and voiced accordingly. However, no one living in the neighborhood is in favor of 11 Innisfil Road. Then the May 25th council meeting occurred and the Simcoe Muskoka Health Unit presented 11 Innisfil as their preferred site. During the council discussion, a lot of things were said that were untrue or seriously outdated about our neighborhood. It was during this meeting that it was said that we would receive information on how to participate in tonight's meeting. Our first meeting to voice our concerns and the night when city council would vote to approve or oppose the site. By Wednesday of last week, we had heard nothing. So a neighbor called city hall and patiently sat on hold for quite some time before she was told that we were needed to register to speak at the meeting and that we had to do it by end of business that day. She then requested an email with the directions and we printed and quickly dispatched it to the neighborhood. Again, no notice, no respect of the neighborhood, a clear indication that council really didn't want to hear our voices. A few of us did receive a link to the meeting and we are the privileged few that get to speak tonight. Many neighbors who were not home during the day missed the deadline, but councillors Harvey and McCann informed us that they could register as emergency deputation and they have. Our own Ward 2 councillor has shared nothing with us and in few conversations that he has had with neighbors, it wasn't to listen to our concerns, but to push the site. I see you shaking your head, but it's the truth, my friend. But this lack of consultation goes even further. There was no notification or consultation with local businesses. Namaste North, Morgan Suma, or even HIP Development Limited. And you heard earlier from Megan at Namaste North. All found out about the proposed SCS at 11 Innes Road Road from us, the neighborhood. Hopefully they have all been given time to speak tonight. In a chat with Joel Daughtry, VP of Development for HIP Developments this morning, he shared with me that HIP Developments was unaware that the 80 Bradford or 11 Innisfil Road were proposed sites. He told me that HIP Developments had sent a letter to city to the city a year ago stating that they would be opposed to an SDS in the area of their development known as Berry Central on the Red Story field land. Councillor McCann, may I ask um, that you share, ask city staff to provide a copy of the letter from HIP Development opposing the SDS in the area of their development known as Berry Central on Red Story field with the adjacent, which is adjacent to both 80 Bradford Street and 11 Innisville Road. So Councillor Harvey has circulated that email to members of council, Ms. Cleaver. So we've okay. got it. Yep, Perfect. thank you. We believe that people do need help from addiction and homelessness, but this is not the site. There are no support services. I get that there will be safety protocol for the SCS staff and patrons, but there has been nothing put in place for the safety of the neighborhood or a procedure to voice concerns or raise issues. The Lighthouse Foundation in Aurelia has the right plan and they are acting on it. They are building an all encompassing campus with support for addiction and homelessness. If we as a city had been as forward thinking, we already would have a state of the art campus with many lives helped if not saved. A few key important points to consider. There is a 24 seven we watch daycare providing frontline workers that's across the street, only 30 meters away from the door of the proposed safe injection. This is a family neighborhood with many children under the age of eight. Child oriented services are within the same building for speech therapy, autistic counseling and music classes. No consultation with the neighborhood or surrounding businesses, including the large Berry Central development by HIP development. And I wanna just make another point on Milligan's Pond. I walked through Milligan's Pond today from my house through to Boys Street. There were no needles or garbage, it was clean. But once you cross Boys Street and headed towards Ann Street, that was a completely different story. There are encampments, there are people, and there is a safe injection box that looks like a large yellow mailbox that has actually been pulled off of its cement moorings and is laying upside down. That is the area of Milligan's Pond that you should be looking at. 
and with the help of the city of Barrie, it can be cleaned up. There is an alternative site that could be used that is downtown, the Barrie Bus Depot. It's in the area where the patrons that would be using the SDS are. Build a wood fence around it, invite local artists and mural artists to create an art installation on the exterior of the fence. Inside the fence, plant trees and create a park for the patrons. The main floor could be used as the SCS, a large space that has already resolved accessibility issues. Upstairs could be support services for the patrons. I hope that council and the mayor have heard not only my voice, but the voice of my neighborhood in opposition to the proposed SCS site at 11 Innisfil Road. Thank you. Thank you very much for your deputation, uh, Ms. Cleveland, and uh, for uh, arranging to have the information forwarded to us as well. Um, uh, are there questions for Ms. Cleveland? Councilor Rowan. Thank you, Mayor Lehman. Uh, and thank you, Anne, for your deputation. I really appreciate uh, hearing your perspective on this. And I would just ask uh, that you follow up with me after the meeting. I did email you a couple times on May 12th and uh, phoned as well. So I'd love to connect with you to discuss how we can work together moving forward, no matter what happens this evening. Thank you. No problem. Thanks, Councillor Owen. Uh, any other questions of the deputant? Okay, seeing none. Um, we'll do two more deputations and then we'll call a brief, a 10 minute recess uh, as we'll be heading into our sixth hour of meeting uh, members of council. Uh, our next deputant is Louise Hansen. Louise, welcome to Barry City Council. And you have up to five minutes for your deputation. Thank you, Mayor Lehman. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mayor Lehman and the city council members for hearing my deputation tonight. I Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, great. I just wanted to say that I have been a resident of uh, Perry Street I'm directly across the street from 11 Ennisville. And uh, I was not aware as well that it was 11 Ennisville and not 80 Bradford initially. Um, I have lived in this area, I've lived in this house for 20 years now. And when I first moved into this, this house, there were, there were a couple boarding houses on the street and it was a little sketchy, little sketchy. but um, within five years, they, they, were, they were cleaned up and um, it's become a, a beautiful area. All of the, it's, it's become a really nice little community. I love living here. It's close to the lake, it's close to downtown. Um, I used to work in the city hall and I, uh, I've never felt comfortable walking downtown day or night because you're, you're typically accosted by the homeless, um, penny handling and so forth. And I've had, I've had, I've housed international students in my house. I'm a single mother. Um, when my mother, when my daughter was in university, I was housing international students who were also afraid to walk downtown, but we've always felt safe in this neighborhood. Um, at present, I, I don't feel safe. My house was broken into six years ago by two um, substance abusers in the middle of the day at 12 noon, actually. And uh, now I feel that I need to get a state of the art security system because it's going to happen again. I, I have to, I have to state that I am totally for a safe consumption site. I know that they are very well needed to prevent um, overdoses and everything. And I know that we have a lot of mental health issues. I just feel that the location, this location is not the correct location. It's a residential area. We have a lot of children in the neighborhood now. When I first moved in, it was, it was strictly older people that lived in this neighborhood. And now there's a lot of children, young children. I have, I have grandchildren who frequently come to visit and I am worried about their safety. I, um, I just feel that another location perhaps 
downtown where all the other resources are would be a better location. I've, uh, I just feel that at this time, I mean, we, we have a lot of problems with everything already being located downtown uh, with all the meth clinics, all the homeless shelters. Uh, it's, uh, I don't understand how the city of Barrie can pop possibly consider promoting tourism when the the most beautiful area of the of the city is dealing with all those problems and enabling it, and enabling it as far as I'm concerned. Um, my daughter is a chiropractor, and she uh, she runs a business out of her, out of our home right now. And she has clients coming to the house, and it's it's just not going to be um, beneficial to her business. And I, as a single single woman, um, will not feel safe in my own neighborhood anymore. Um, that's all I have to say. Thank you very much for listening to me, and I hope you have a good evening. Thank you, thank you very much for your deputation, uh, Louise. Uh, are there questions of the deputant members of council? No, seeing none tonight. Okay, thank you again for being here, Louise. Uh, and our next deputant is Darian Marinos. Darian, welcome to Barry City Council. And in accordance with our procedural bylaw, you have up to five minutes for your deputation. Hi there, how's it going? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, um, I'm not gonna take too long. Um, um, thank you for letting me talk. Um, uh, so yes, basically, sorry, I'm new to Barry and I understand the problem. I moved here about a year ago and, um, I know that there's a lot of, um, sorry, I'm just really nervous. If I could have a second. That's okay. Take your time. Um, yeah. So, um, I live right across the street and, um, I, I just don't think that this is the best location for the site. Um, it's just not a safe location. It's very small. Um, there's just not a lot of space on a sidewalk on the like on the parking spots. And like you said, there's no sidewalk on the other side. On the other side. Um, I've also haven't noticed um, about the addresses. I was also misinformed about the addresses multiple times. On the other side, when I googled it, 80 at Bradford Street seems like much more logical. Um, there's just like not a lot of houses and like daycares and stuff like that. Um, yeah, and I've also had my backyard walkthrough and car broken into multiple times and things taken from my backyard. And I have cameras and it looks like also from like people, people had said before, substance abusers. Um, Cause it is a shortcut like through Milligan's Broad Pond, like that problem has been up, uh, brought up before. Um, and yeah, I do understand that SCS is going to be good. I'm not trying to um, understate that because um, I do understand that there are, are articles on that and you know it's proven, but I just don't think that this is the best place because I think that there's just many other places that um, are like more accessible and bigger and not close to other residential areas. And that's about it. Okay, uh, thank you very much for your Deputation Darian, are there questions of the deputant? Councillor McCann. Thank you, uh, Mary Lehman. Is it, is it Darian? Is that what we're talking to? Yes, Darian. Hey, Darian. And I just, I just want to maybe, um, I appreciate you being nervous, and uh, um, I'll just try to make my question real clear. When you talk about safety concerns, right? I just, you know, I, I needed a little more from you because I wanted to understand why you think that the safe injection site, uh, SES, will impact your property. Uh, in an unsafe way. And maybe I can lead you a little bit, but I don't, I, I don't want to answer for you. Is it maybe the lack of knowing what fencing is going to be up around that building, uh, the lack of knowledge knowing how it's going to look, or could you give me a little more specifics? Or um, Yeah, as far as I know, is the entrance to the 11 Innisfil Street going to be the door that it currently that I've seen pictures of at 11 Innisfil Street that now says 11 and has a number 11 beside it? So if, if you live right across the street from it, it's, it's the six or seven stairs going up 
I correct and the space between that door and the road is very small so I just don't see like it's just a very small area it seems like very crowded like a um it's just yeah it's just there's traffic from like there's just a lot of traffic in that area and it's a very small area I just don't see how you could like fit like unless you're gonna ex like cut the house like the building down um it's just yeah very small is my point there okay. and my safety concerns are yeah sorry my safety concerns are just basically that I have had been broken into multiple times. Like I'm new to Barry. Um, it hasn't happened to me before and it's happened like multiple times and not only broken into it, just, I live from, it's just a shortcut. Like I get a lot of people just cutting through across like my, my, my backyard just to get to where they need to go. Mm -hmm. And usually late at night. Right. And I see it. I have cameras and you can usually tell it's not that like, it's no, there's no kids doing it. It's not, you know, yeah, I appreciate your answer and, and definitely can reach out to your ward counselor and I'm here. He can direct you to the police on that matter. I don't think that you can, you know, um, uh, correlate both of the, what you went through, which is traumatic, right? And the SES. I just wanted to get your specific concerns about the SES, not what happened to you in the past, um, but you, you did answer me terribly. So I appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor McCann. Are there other questions for uh, Darren? Darren, excuse me. Uh, so just to clarify, um, I don't need you to give your address, um, Mr. Marinos, but are you, when you say you're, you're directly across the street, I think there's five uh, homes on Innisfil and then the one uh, beautiful home, of course, on the corner of Innisfil and Perry. Are, are you in the, are you um, uh, in the end? Are you, where are you relative to Milligan's Pond? I'm right in the middle. I'm the White House. This ah, I moved here, okay. here with, um, yeah, and I probably can't afford to move out anytime soon. So. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, so you back on to that portion of Milligan's Pond. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much for that. Uh, and thank you for being here tonight uh, for the deputation. Uh, knowing that we will go for quite a bit uh, longer, I'm now going to call a 10 minute recess. Our next deputant will be Anita Arvast. When we come back, city council will reconvene promptly at 9:22. Uh, so we are taking a 10 minute recess, and we'll see you everybody in 10 minutes.
Okay, folks, we'll get started again in just a few seconds. So if everybody can come back into the call, please. Okay, I will, <clears throat> excuse me, I'll call the city council meeting back to order. Uh, we are in the midst of deputations on the proposed locations for the supervised consumption site. Our next uh, deputant is Dr. Anita Arvast. Anita, welcome to Barry City Council in accordance with our procedural bylaw, you have up to five minutes for your deputation, go ahead. Thank you, I guess you all know that Montreal is winning to nothing. Well, now we do, I, and I'm guessing <laughs> I'm guessing some some of us might have checked on the break, but uh... <laughs> I thought I thought so. Mm -hmm. um, good evening, staff, councilors, um, Mayor Lehman. I want to show. I want to start by saying I show deep respect for all of the deputations that have occurred, especially from my neighbors. Um, it's a difficult issue to deal with. I especially want to show respect to the bravery of Christine Naylor. I can't imagine losing a child to uh, substance abuse. Um, I'm going to speak to you first about a personal experience I had with someone who had a substance abuse issue. He was a refugee who came to live with me from Iran. Uh, he was on the mixed martial arts fighting team. Uh, the national team from Iran, and he came to Canada for some tournaments. He was caught um, uh, shaking hands with somebody who was Jewish. Uh, he was seen drinking vodka. He was seen cavorting with women, and his coach basically told him that if he went back to Iran, he would go to jail. So he opted to um, live in Canada. He became um, a member of my household because I gave him a bedroom to rent. And he lived with me for about a year and a half. And then um, I said, okay, Sam, it's time for you to move out. And he did. And um, probably the least likely person you would expect to develop a substance abuse, this was this guy. He was a, a renowned athlete. He was representing a national team, but he was so far removed from his family and his home. And he became very depressed. And I did not know that at the time. Um, so Sam lost his life about six months after he moved out of my house. Um, okay, so... I used to live on Granville Street. I moved to Perry Street about a year ago. I was aware of people uh, who use in Milligan's Pond area and the dangers of disposed needles. I want to add that it's a spectacular parkland that, and we even had trumpeter swans last year. We had, I actually had a picture of me with signet swans. When I um, learned about Nessias coming here, there was a natural fear of crime for me. So I started to do my research. I'm a, I'm a doctor, I'm a, I'm a researcher. And I did my research on the benefits of Nessias and the studies that have shown they help and don't actually cause more problems like increased crime. So 
we have people near Mulligan's Pond in downtown who are using poisonous drugs and they need our unconditional support. Nobody chooses to be, I'm gonna put this in air quotes, an addict. Um, nobody chooses to die of using toxic drugs. I was invited to join the consultations on the SCS sites in Barrie through an email or through a mail. So yes, there was, there were <laughs> um, consultations sent out. I had I had a mail message saying, you live in Barrie downtown, you reside in this area, do you wanna participate? Yes, there was some confusion about 80 Bradford Street, but once I engaged in that consultation, it was clarified where the site would be. Um, so I opted to support the site. Why? Because we need one. We need one now. We need one yesterday. And this was the best option. This was the place that was least going to impact families. And it's in my backyard. I live on Perry Street. I live at the end of Perry Street. We now have a condominium going up next to me, which has 93 affordable housing units going into it. It's literally beside my backyard. I'm so yimby on this. Yes, in my backyard. Yes, right next to me. We can dream up whatever expansions we need later. But we need this. We need this now for people. We need this now to prevent deaths. And yes, in my backyard on Perry Street. Okay, thank you very much for your deputation, uh, Ms. Arvas, for your, your thoughtful remarks. It's it's Dr. Arvas, but- uh, Doctor, okay. I'm sorry, I, did, <laughs> I forgot the doctor. I did when I introduced you, but I forgot it just then. Uh, are there questions? Questions uh, for the deputant, Councillor Harvey. Yeah, thank you, Your Worship. And I, I don't mean this uh, in any disrespect or anything, but uh, I, I just want a little clarification uh, just because uh, obviously you've mentioned that you're a doctor. Are you a medical doctor or do you have your doctorate uh, in a discipline? A uh, doctorate in philosophy and uh, interdisciplinary critical theory. Okay. Okay, great. Thanks a lot. It's just obviously uh, the general public, I find a lot of times as soon as uh, uh, the word doctor is put in front of someone, they, uh, they automatically just assume that it's a medical doctor. Thanks a lot for the clarification. Are there any other questions of the deputant? Okay, seeing none, Dr. Arvast, thank you very much for being here and for giving us your remarks. Uh, our next deputant. Thank you, Council. Thank you. Our next deputant, uh, of course, on the same matter is Taylor Ronaldson. All right, uh, welcome to Barry City Council, Taylor. And in accordance with our procedural bylaw, you have up to five minutes for your deputation. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Perfect. Okay, uh, I live uh, right across the street from 11 Innisville Street from the doors of the uh, opposed SCS site. Uh, you can see the entrance to Milligan's Pond, where I've had many issues with people walking in and out through my property. I've had arguments with people who are high on drugs, uh, telling me that they're okay to go through my property. I've had, uh, when Tent City was uh, opposed, everyone moved to this side of the river. And we had probably over 10 people living back there, starting fires. Uh, taking wood from my property and using it. I, I got a wheelbarrow stolen. I've also lived here for three years. I've had my cars broken into three or four times. I've had my house broken into one time with over a thousand dollars worth of stuff stolen from me. Uh, I've also, uh, also had a problem with uh, drug use in the area in general. I know the daycare down the street, he said there's no problems in the back, but I've taken many walks back there and I've had many issues seeing drug needles and other paraphernalia that is not something I want in the area. Uh, I've been doing a lot in the last three years. I bought this house 
uh, as a renovation house and I've been doing a lot of work on it to make it worth some value. And uh, if there's a, the site across the street for me, I think that it's gonna lose a lot of value. And I agree, there's tons of children in this area. I see them walking all the time. Lots of walking people across the street on the sidewalk because it'll be right in front of the injection site. And I honestly don't think it, someone can go in there and they can do their drugs and then they can come out and they can do whatever they want. And I don't think that's fair for anyone in the community, especially as 80 Bradford Street was originally uh, entailed. I know that that side of the street is more industrial. So I thought that was okay. And then as a few weeks from now, I started getting letters from my neighbors finding out that it's actually 11 Innisfield Street. And it was kind of pushed around like it, uh, like they didn't want us to know and they just wanted to push it through without the community to know. So I, I don't think that's fair. And I'm not, I'm not against these sites at all. I totally understand that drug use is an issue in Barrie and in, in a lot of places, but there's a lot better places that this can be managed. Okay, thank you very much for uh, being here and giving us those comments, uh, Taylor. Are there comments for this, or qu comments, questions uh, for this deputant? Councillor Thompson. Thanks, Marilyn, I'll be very uh, brief. Um, Taylor, would you, would you say that the neighborhood would support um, this location if the entrance was on 80 Bradford? Um, would you think that the majority of the concerns are because the door is literally 30 meters from the homes right across the street. If there was a mitigated strategy to have people entering in from the 80 Bradford side, do you think that would lessen some of the concerns of your neighbors? Uh, yes, to a point, but as I've learned since listening here, there's also lots of different uh, businesses that are in that build that side of the building. Like, uh, uh, and I don't feel that would necessarily be safe, but it's still better than across the street from houses that there's kids living in and lots of local people walking and going around. That side of the neighborhood is a little more run down, I I'd say. And it's a little closer to downtown where the actual injection or the, the drug users, I'd say, are around. But I still think it would be better in another location for sure. Thanks for taking the time tonight and uh, your deputation. Thank you. No Thanks, problem. Councillor Thompson. Any other questions for the deputant? Okay, seeing none. Uh, Taylor, thank you very much again for being here tonight. Our next deputants uh, are together, I, uh, I think, making a deputation together, and that's Jonah Lee Bagwan and Lanky Alviar. Uh, welcome to Barry City Council, both of you, and in accordance with the procedural bylaw, you have up to five minutes for your deputation. Good evening, everybody. Good evening, Council. Mayor. Mayor. Good evening. Um, we can hear you. Yeah. Um, we recently moved to Barry two months ago to raise our two-year-old girl. We chose Barry because it is a growing community and we felt safe every time we came here to visit some of our family who already lived here. We hope to stay in Barrie and grow our family here, but knowing that we will be surrounded by people who are using drugs, be it a stink otherwise. We understand that the use of drugs are important to some people and they need a safe site to be able to use it properly. But there are other locations away from residential to do this. If you have, a, if you have small children, or grandchildren, you always want to put their safety first. Keep them away from drugs or anything that could harm them. Putting an SES in this location could promote drug use and that's the last thing we want for our community. We were notified about this just two weeks ago. If we had known, we would have never considered moving downtown Barry. We've noticed and already see people that are drug users around the area. And if you proceed with SES, we would be a walkway of drug addicts. Can you imagine? For some of you counsel, how would you feel if the SES was just at the back of your house or in front of your house? Will you feel safe for your children? Will you be able, will you be comfortable taking walks? No, you won't. You'll always question your safety every time. 
our community safety is in your hands. So please, we ask you consider our opinion. Thank you for your time. Thank you uh, for your deputation uh, and uh, for being here tonight to give us your views and for choosing Barry. Uh, comments, or sorry, I keep saying comments, questions of the deputant. Okay, uh, seeing none, uh, thank you both for being here tonight and for giving thank us you your so views. Much. Thank, thank you everyone, have a good you. evening. Uh, our next deputant tonight is Catherine Hankinson. Catherine? Welcome to Barry City Council. And in accordance with our procedural bylaw, you have up to five minutes for your deputation. And still on mute there, Catherine, if it's if you're on the phone, I think you are, it's um, hash six to unmute. Oh, there we go. Oh, okay. Now uh, we can thank hear you. Thank you everyone yep. for allowing me to speak today. I am probably the one on the street that's been here the longest. My husband and I have been at 18 Perry Street for 31 years. We're right at the top of Innisfil. Out our front window, you see 11 uh, Innisfil. I had absolutely no consultation on this 11 Innisfil, or we had no idea where it was. We had heard that it was 80 Bradford Street. If it's 80 Bradford Street, it doesn't bother us at all. We would simply never see it. I, it wouldn't be any concern at all. But 11 Innisfil is a different story. Nobody, nobody consulted us. I don't have a computer, so I didn't know about anything on a computer meeting. Nobody phoned us, nobody came to the door, Nobody put a leaflet in the in the mailbox. We had absolutely no consultation at all. I, upon hearing, upon realizing that this was right across the street, I phoned our counselor, our representative on city council, and got nowhere. He has a one-track mind. He is in total support of the SCS. He didn't want to hear anybody else's ideas kept insisting I'd been consulted when I hadn't been, and I've lost total confidence in him representing me in, in this city. We've got problems with not only the poor presentation in the media, the address wrong, the picture wrong. The address was changed so many times until we found out it was I, where it was, I just couldn't believe it. it the whole situation is bad. There's no, there's no room where this thing is. You can't put a tent there for inhalation drug use. There's no place to put a tent. They, they have a couple of feet before they're on the sidewalk. The sidewalk, everybody has to walk down because it's on only one side of the street. And, you know, I, as I understand it, safe inj injection sites don't provide the drugs. I thought people had to take their own street drugs in and have a clean needle and somebody watch them inject. If that's the case, we're not only going to have the drug addicts, we're going to have the dealers all in this area, and we just really don't want it. This area has been dumped on so bad. We're getting all that construction on Red Story Field. We were going to have construction half a block the other way at Vesper Street. You know, it's just it's just like we've become a target just when this this neighborhood is going from bad to good. It has changed so much over the years. We have a really nice neighborhood now, good neighbors, children, and it just feels to us like we're just being forgotten about and dumped on. It it's like you picked an area where you'd only have a few houses to object and if you kinda of snuck it in without us knowing about it, you could just run all over us. And I really feel that we've been abused on this issue. I I just don't know how to say it any clearer. I, we, we just don't want this. We really don't. And I really wish that you could pick an area somewhere else. I don't even know my true feelings on helping drug addicts. 
I can see their point, but I can sure see our point. I don't think a Band-Aid solution is the answer. They need housing. They need counseling. They need education. And what do you have when you dry them out? How many of them can actually be productive? I don't know the answers. But I really don't want this injection site across from my front window and in my neighborhood. Thank you very much for allowing me to vent. Absolutely. Um, Catherine, thank you for being here tonight and for giving us your concerns. Uh, questions for the deputant, Councillor Aylwin. Thank you, Mayor Lehman. Uh, and thank you, Kathy, for your deputation. I really appreciate your time this evening and the time that we took uh, over multiple phone calls to have uh, these difficult discussions. Um, I did want to ask, since you mentioned um, housing, counseling, education, uh, great suggestions and ideas. And I know that part of the plan for the SES is to have connections to those services. Um, I want to know... Um, you know, we do have an opioid crisis where people are dying at an alarming rate. Um, what do you propose uh, as some alternatives or suggestions to help people who use drugs in our community that are dying uh, due to a toxic drug supply crisis? Well, I think you could pick a better location to treat them. There's a, there's a place, you know, when you come around the side of 80 Bradford past where... Uh, mm, it's around the corner by a, by a service entrance. There's a raised garden area. Mm -hmm. They can come in around the side of the building. They don't go in 80 Bradford. They don't go on Innisfil. They have, it has its own entrance there. There's offices in there. There's place for a tent. And that way, they're not going to bother anybody. I don't see why you have to put it where it's just going to bother people so much. I appreciate uh, that suggestion, Kathy, um, and uh, I hope you participate in the neighborhood group if this does get approved uh, by us and by the province, um, because I know they're willing to work with people in the neighborhood on ideas like that. So thanks again. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Owen. Any other questions of the deputant? Councillor McCann, and then Councillor Harris. <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor Lehman. And, uh... Uh, Kathleen, I don't need the specific house number, but you said you were not, you were not communicated. Uh, you don't have email, which I can appreciate. Uh, are you within a seven, eight, 10 minute walk from, uh, from 11 Innisfil Street? I could hold my breath and run there from here. <laughs> Let's, okay. That's how close it is. It's right there. Yeah, are, you a fast, are, are you a fast runner? No, I'm 75 years old. <laughs> okay, well, uh, I appreciate that. And uh, I'll be asking uh, staff later on, you know, why you didn't get any correspondence. And, and you know, I'm asking a, an obvious question. It's, it's not a, uh, um, a silly question, but obviously you've checked your mail in the past, in the past month. Every day. Yeah, well, Kathleen, thank you very much for your presentation. It, it was refreshing. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Natalie Harris, question. Thank you, Mary Lehman. Um, Ms. Hankinson, I have a question. Uh, do you think that I am a productive member of society? I know that you were a drug user, but how many turn out like you? Many. Is it, is it a handful out of a thousand? Or I would is love it to have 999. Even if it's just me, is that bad? That's not the answer. Hi, there listen, are many. I'm glad you turned your life around, but that's not the issue. I'm not saying that people can't be helped. I'm saying a lot of people can't be helped, but the ones that can be helped should be helped in a kind of a housing education center, not just a Band-Aid of wandering in, getting high and wandering out. How does that help anybody? Um, were you able to watch last week's presentation from Dr. Simon? I watched part of it, but it went on and on. I really highly recommend that you watch that. I won't. I will be getting into more points later on, but um, 
that she goes into great detail of how this isn't a walk-in, use, and then leave high. Um, there are extensive wraparound services that are offered. And um, I have many, many friends who are in recovery and are very productive uh, members of society. And many of them that in different cities wouldn't be if they didn't have an opportunity to go to an SES. So but thank you for your deputation. Listen, with Ryan's mother, she seems to be under the the idea that people in the consumption sites are providing the drugs. I didn't think they were. I thought it came from street drugs going in for a safe injection of street drugs. Um, right. So this, um, this can be clarified, I think, maybe when we get to the discussion of the matter, since we do have a number of other deputants. Okay. Um, but no, in, Ont in Ontario, uh, it's not a supply. Uh, the, the so they're using don't street the drugs. drugs. Correct. So the dealers sell it to them and they go into the injection site and they're all on our street. Well, um, I think we can talk about when we get to that section, um, Catherine, we'll talk about what uh, is planned to prevent that. But uh, thank you for your deputation. And I certainly, thank you very as, much. A, as a longtime resident, appreciate you coming and making your known, your concerns known. Thank you very much for having me. Okay, um, we will move on to our next deputant. Um, we have Kimberly Capone uh, is next on our list. Uh, Ms. Capone, welcome to Barry City Council. In accordance with the procedural bylaw, you have up to five minutes. For your Hi, thank you. Can you hear me? We can, yes. Okay, great. Um, just to be clear, I also was not uh, consulted. I did not get anything in the mail. I found this out from a neighbor uh, two or three weeks ago. So that's just before I start this. Um, I just wanna say that I wanna address why I live in Innisfil is not the right choice for everybody. I live across the street um, from 11 in Innisfil and so do other parents in the daycare. My son's bedroom faces the street. He often is watching outside um, hoping to see exotic cars or the fire engines that pass by daily. When we look at our window or when we're sitting outside on our porch, our vision isn't what you have all assumed it is because we live around the pond. We see families walking, kids playing, moms pushing strollers, um, our lovely neighbors walking by, which then my daughter runs to them to greet, um, shows them the bubbles that she's blowing. If you put in an SCS there, those calm, happy visions change. We will now see people high on drugs walking around us, which is something that we don't see now. How will I explain this to my children? How do you think those parents picking up their children from the daycare will feel? Who is going to explain to my children that playing outside in the front yard is now questionable? How many of you would feel comfortable letting your two-year-old daughter play outside. And then all of a sudden someone high comes walking by. Just because our house is around the pond doesn't mean that we deal with this on a regular basis because we don't. I have not seen anything. We don't see them. But now you're gonna put it on our front doors. My daughter loves to go for a walk. I take the wagon and my other two children and we walk to the beach or we walk to Fox's Bakery to pick up her favorite cookies. In order to do that, I have to cross the street because there is no sidewalk on my side of the street. And I have to pass 11 in still. When that parking lot is full, which it normally is with the Zumba studio, it is extremely tight to walk. If someone high is coming out of that building while I am walking with my children, there is nowhere I can move to feel comfortable. I would have to go onto the road. If I don't, then this person is now side by side to my children high. And I am absolutely not saying that they are bad people, but the unknown is terrifying. Drugs change people. People under the influence are unpredictable. You can't assume otherwise, but are you guys willing to take that risk? What if someone does harm someone in the neighborhood? How are you going to make sure that we are all safe? Cameras are not gonna keep us safe. Cameras are not going to keep my children safe while we walk side by side to someone who is leaving that facility. But I'm also thinking of them. 
they use the pond because it's out of the public eye. They don't want people looking at them. They don't want to think that people are judging them. Our neighborhood is extremely busy. Cars are driving by constantly and there's always people walking. There is no privacy for them. How do you think they're going to feel when we as a community are watching their every single move? I can assure you from experience that I know they are very ashamed of how they live. Most don't want to be seen. Being in the public eye isn't something they will come running to. This site gives them zero privacy. Don't they deserve privacy? Don't my kids deserve to be able to play and walk around without the vision of someone high walking past them? Addiction is a terrible disease, but safety is a major concern. And so is the innocence of our children. How are you going to make this safe? How are you going to make this okay? No question, something needs to be done. The city needs this desperately. But I feel like this is rushed. And I feel like the desperation is making this decision rushed. But this is, this is not the location. Please find better. Please find better for the kids and the families of this community. But find better for them too. They need the SES, but they deserve somewhere more private and more substantial to them. We have been stuck inside for over a year due to this pandemic. Please don't make it scary for us to go walk outside. We all deserve better. Thank you. Thank you very much for your, for your deputation. Uh, Ms. Capone, any questions for the deputant from members of council? Okay, I'm not seeing any. Uh, thank you very much for being here and for, for giving us your comments as a resident in the area. Uh, our next deputant is Kaylin Fitzgerald. Kaylin, welcome to Barry City Council. In accordance with our procedural bylaw, you have up to five minutes for your deputation. Thank you. Am I live? You are. Good evening, Mayor Lehman, members of council, city staff, and members of the public viewing tonight's meeting. I speak to you as a resident of our downtown core, and I say this without hyperbole, my neighbors are dying. 2020 saw approximately 123 deaths in Barrie as a result of drug toxicity. Pre-COVID, safe consumption sites for alcohol were available to the public on every city block downtown. I've regularly been accosted by the last call crowds that spill out into the street. I've watched the traffic on Dunlap Street grind to a halt when the police are called to break up the violence that erupts between groups under the influence of alcohol. In contrast, the individuals I've met who participate in the safe needle exchange in my neighborhood have offered polite greetings or tacit nods and have never threatened me. That said, as a mother, I recognize that many of the parks and public spaces in my neighborhood are already consumption sites, putting my child at risk with hazardous litter left in the open. Illicit drug use is already happening in our community. Righteous indignation at the choices of others is not gonna save the lives of my neighbors and ensure my child's safety. Empirical evidence has shown safe consumption sites not only save lives, but also reduce the financial burden on community resources such as police and first responders. I heard ambulance sirens ring out on an hourly basis last weekend, and I learned that a dangerous strain of drugs had yet again been circulating in our city and had taken the lives of two individuals. If these folks had had access to the services provided by a safe consumption site, we may not have lost them. Recognition of the opioid crisis in our city is not up for debate, neither should our next steps to support our vulnerable population. I feel that a safe consumption site will provide dignity to a marginalized portion of our community, offering pathways to support more easily accessible to Barry citizens. In conclusion, a safe consumption site will not only encourage safety for Barry citizens who use drugs, but for your families and mine. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for your deputation, Kaylin. Uh, questions for the deputant? Okay, I don't see any. Thank you very much for being here, Kaylin, and for giving us your, your views tonight. Uh, next on our list, uh, we are getting into now the emergency deputation requests that were approved earlier. Uh, the first is Kenzie Churchward. Kenzie, welcome to Barry City Council. And in accordance with our procedural bylaw, you have up to five minutes for your deputation. Hi, can you guys hear me? We can. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Kenzie Churchward, and I am a business owner and homeowner in downtown Barry. 
I felt the need to give a deputation this evening after reading about many of my neighbors being upset about the proposed SCS location. I live in the west end of downtown Barrie on Parkside Drive. My house is under a kilometer away from the current proposed SCS site. My fiance and I have debated selling our house and my business partner and I have debated moving our business out of Barrie, not because of the proposed SCS or drug users, but because of how utterly non-empathetic and disheartening this community can be. The selfish attitude of not in my backyard has got to change. These are not the values we are taught as a community to uphold and certainly not the values I would want to raise a family around. I'm tired of seeing some of my privileged neighbors being upset by people able to use a life-saving service just because it makes them uncomfortable. The SES will not be affected if it is not accessible. And what is the point of spending all of this money if no one is going to use it? People's lives are more important than your property value. There are too many statistics to ignore the problem. And at this point, if you are not in support of an SES, you are simply not in support of saving lives. I think what a lot of my neighbors are forgetting is that people who use the SES are our neighbors too. I'm not sure where the misconception came from that all drug users are awful people who want to harm your children and mothers, but it's far from the truth. They are friends, brothers, sisters, spouses, kids, and parents. I hate that I constantly find myself reminding people that drug users are also humans, but a lot of people seem to forget. I wanted to give this deputation to show council that although you are going to hear some backlash this evening, and you certainly have, uh, believe me when I say there's a lot of us in this neighborhood who are happy, grateful, and relieved about the SCS. I'm excited for the future of our downtown, to see less needles on the street, less drug use on the street, to save lives and to have drug users have access to resources that can move them into recovery if that's where they feel they are at. I am not a medical professional and I'm assuming most citizens speaking tonight are also not medical professionals, but when you hear a medical professional speak about the benefits of an SCS, the support is overwhelming. We would not all be arguing if the health unit was debating putting in a dialysis clinic, for example, so why are we arguing now? This is simply another health service that will better our community and our neighborhood as a whole. Whether we like it or not, people will always use drugs. It is absolutely not our place to tell people how they should recover and they cannot recover if they're dead. If you're here tonight telling me you care about people and you don't want them to die, but you also don't think the SCS is the answer, I would hope you at least have a naloxone kit and know how to use it because this problem is not going to solve itself. We must do the ethical thing and stop preventable deaths. Thank you. Thank you very much for your deputation, Kenzie. Uh, do we have any questions for the deputant from members of council? Okay, not seeing any. Uh, Kenzie, thank you very much for being here and giving us your views. Uh, our next deputant, uh, deputant is Caitlin McKenzie. Caitlin, welcome to Barry City Council. Uh, you are live and uh, you have up to five minutes for your deputation. I just want to confirm you can hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Thank you, Mayor and Council and City staff for allowing me to speak. I want to first make clear that people are dying right now. People, not just drug users. Every day in an unnecessary and tragic way. Our shared humanity is not something we should be shying away from or waiting days or months to act on. I live a short walk from where the proposed supervised consumption site will hopefully be. I have been a resident of Barrie for 10 years. I received mail regarding all the different proposed sites from the city. I joined city hall Zoom meetings and heard from community members. I read the recommendation from the Simcoe Muskoka District Health Unit, doctors and scientists who care about people's ability to live. They say this works. SCSs keep people alive. I believe them and their peer reviewed research. I am an engaged city citizen of Barrie, Ontario, <coughs> a town which I love. The idea that the city of Barrie has not done its due diligence in community consultation is untrue. I have been consulted. I know many who have been consulted. More than that, more than this unfounded idea that there hasn't been enough research or enough collaboration within the community, above all, I believe my fellow humans deserve to live. Human beings are dying on the street at an alarming rate. I care about their ability to live another day more than I care about anything else, including my property value. I truly do not believe that this is controversial. The idea of not in my backyard in the neighborhood in which I live seems quite counterintuitive. Consumption of drugs happens in my backyard every day. 
We cannot ignore that Milligan's Pond is in all of our backyards, an unsupervised consumption site. The drugs used there have the potential to be dangerous and deadly, and they have been. There have been countless studies by medical professionals on the topic of supervised consumption sites. Those opposed to this site do not seem to care about the current and locally minded data. They want drug users to exist as they see fit, where they see fit, to seek rehab somewhere else, rehab that has waiting lists miles long and that isn't always harm reduction focused. Harm reduction means I don't get to tell someone how they survive. We are all going through collective struggles. We are all finding ways to survive. Most of the people who are opposed, I am sure, have a glass of wine every now and then to cope with the state of the world. I know I do. They get to do that from the comfort of their homes, where they look down on people who don't have the privilege of four walls. When you say you don't want this SCS in your backyard, you are saying you don't care about some human life as much as you care about your own comfort. This is unacceptable. I sincerely hope that the city of Barrie approves this site that is indeed in my backyard because I value all human life. I want drug, drug users to be able to live. I truly hope those who are opposed reconsider. I know some of the opposition is based in fear and I understand that there is a home daycare near the proposed site. I think that it shouldn't have to be said, but drug users are someone's children. Some drug users are still children themselves. I think that having a safe place for people to consume drugs is something our children will be proud of us for doing because in approving this site, we will be saving lives. We do not have to be afraid of something that will help our fellow humans be able to thrive and recover, whatever that means for them. I want to send my love to the families of those who have died of the toxic drug supply in Barry. To watch people debate a life-saving measure cannot be easy. It shouldn't need to be said, but drug users are not dark shadowy people to be afraid of. They are someone's family and members of this community. To close, I want to thank City Councilor for doing its due diligence by listening to the research and the data and analyzing the benefits for the members of our community. More than that, your empathy in hopefully voting yes and moving forward with this site. Thank you for listening. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Caitlin, for your deputation. Uh, members of Council, are there questions for this deputy? Okay, seeing none, Ms. McKenzie, thank you for being here tonight and for your comments. Uh, next, we have Pauline Bradshaw. Ms. Bradshaw, welcome to Barry City Council. In accordance with our procedural bylaw, you have up to five minutes for your deputation. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Can everybody hear me? We can hear you. Great. I just want to say uh, this is the first time that I've addressed council or that I've ever been to a council meeting. So I'm, I'm pretty impressed, not least because you're here so late. <laughs> Um, anyway, um, I live on Perry Street. I live directly across the main entrance to the park, to Milligan's Pond. I've lived here for about 15 years. Um, I've never seen drug use here, not once. And I walk through that park every day, at least four times a day. Um, and I know Anne, who spoke earlier, did the walk from where she lives at the end of Perry Street all the way over to Boys Street. The only time that we see trouble is when there are homeless encampments, but it's usually alcohol related. I have never ever once seen a needle on any of the paths in the park. Um, so I just wanna make that clear. We do not have an unsupervised drug problem in Milligan's Pond whatsoever. I, uh, now, I, I have to say, I don't know what goes on in the middle of the night. Um, maybe there, maybe that's when it happens, but during the day, I've never seen anything. Um, and I want to address the past two speakers who say that we are all thinking not in our backyard. That's not the case at all with myself or any of my neighbors. The issue for us is safety. It's the safety of these children that are very close to the, this proposed site. It's the sa safety of the drug users as well, because the the entrance to the proposed site is one car length to the sidewalk there. And there's, there's very little room when all the businesses are in operation. So I don't know, I, I don't know what kind of numbers you're expecting for the users of this site, 
but there's nowhere for them to mingle or to line up to get access. There's just a one car length space from the bottom of that step to the sidewalk. And that's it. There's, I think there's maybe uh, two feet from the edge of the sidewalk to the road. And that road is a very busy road. It's almost impossible. The, there's, um, you really have to have your wits about you to get across that road. So, and that road is only going to become busier with all the, um, the construction that's happening in Red Story Field. So I just think that I'm not against uh, the safe injection site at all. I, I believe totally in this idea and this concept. These people need our help, absolutely. But is this the correct location for it? I don't believe so. I think the issue has to come down to safety and it's just not being met. It hasn't been addressed. And I also want to say that I was not informed of any of this. I heard this from Ann Cleveley. I found out three weeks ago about this proposal. I didn't receive any information from City Hall at all about this. So I don't know where this miscommunication happened or why, but I think it needs to be addressed also. I think we all need to be kept in the loop. From now on, I wanna make sure that I have all the information. I wanna know when the next meetings are. I wanna know everything about it. So I would like to be kept in the loop as well as the neighbors that I've talked to. Um, and I, I think that's, I think everybody is pretty much addressed everything that I wanted to say. I, I just wanna say there's got to be a better solution than 11 in Isfil. And I think Councillor Thompson had a great idea when he suggested perhaps the 80 Bradford Street entrance might be a better proposal. If we can't find another building, at least find a different entrance. And that's it. Thank you so much for listening to me this evening. And thank you for coming tonight and giving us your, your comments, Pauline. Are there questions from members of council for the deputant, Councillor Morales and Councillor Aylwin? Uh, thank you, uh, Mayor Lehman. Um, to the deputant, um, your, thank you for describing your street, Perry Street. I actually one time got lost uh, taking a wrong turn on Dunlop Street. Your street is a hidden gem, actually, in that neighborhood. There's been lots of uh, lots of improvements. You can see the pride of ownership. Uh, do it you really know, is. Yeah, um, I know. Uh, you Do you know if any of the deputations we've already had or any of the future ones um, are from residents on Perry Street? Uh, I just want to get perspective on, on people's uh, vantage point. And vantage point being you are on Perry Street, which is about a block away, but inland into, uh, into the neighborhood. Do you know that information? Okay. Piece yeah, I know. I know Dr. A Dr. Anita that spoke for the site. Um, she she lives just down from me. Uh, Anne Cleveley lives in the other direction, closer to 11 Innisfil. She's on Perry Street. Uh, Catherine is on Perry Street. I think there's been at least five or six that are right on Perry Street. Okay. But I am directly across from that entrance, and we take care of it. We, as uh, the people that live in this neighborhood, we take care of that park because the city doesn't. Mm -hmm. We clear mm -hmm. trees, we rake up garbage, we pick up garbage, we, we take care of that park. We, we try and keep it as best as we can. Perfect, no, I, I appreciate that. Uh, feel free to connect with uh, uh, council later about having the city do what we should be doing on that. But anyways, I just wanted to uh, thank you for the feedback about Perry Street. Thank you. Councillor Owen. Thank you, Mayor Lehman. Uh, and thank you, Pauline, for your deputation. I really appreciate your time. Um, would you have interest in participating in the community advisory group? It seems like uh, you're really on top of things in your neighborhood and could have some good input into that group if this does go ahead, of course. Uh, I hope it does go ahead, but yes, I, I would be interested. Okay, thank you. And uh, I would love to connect with you offline. Uh, if you want to send me an email or give me a call, that'd be great. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Owen. Any other questions for the deputant? Okay, Ms. Bradshaw, thank you very much for being at Perry City Council tonight. Our next deputant is Shelby Jones. Uh, Shelby, welcome to Barry City Council. Uh, in accordance with our procedural bylaw, you have up to five minutes for your deputation. And I think you just need to come off mute on your phone, which is hash six. Uh, 
There we go. Can you hear us, Shelby? Shelby, can you hear us? Sorry, uh, Shelby, we're not able to hear you. Um, oh, there we go. Shelby? No, it seems like we're still not able to hear you. Okay, so perhaps uh, staff, you can connect with uh, Shelby and see if we can uh, get, and see if you can get the phone working. Uh, and yeah. now, Jeff, a little suggestion, maybe uh, say the LBS um, sign, maybe she doesn't understand what hashtag is. LBS? What's LBS? I don't know. I just got a call from my, I texted my client saying that that's what she would know it by. So. Oh, right. pound, pound. Okay. Gotcha. Okay. Try pound six. There we go. Shelby, if you can hear us, try pound six. LBS being the short form for pound. Now I got it. Nope. Still not working. Okay, uh, I'm going to ask staff to uh, see if you can reach the deputant and uh, get the phone working and we will move on. We have two more deputations. Uh, our next deputant is Chris Ridding. Are we able to bring Chris into the call? Okay, we have Amanda Ridding as well uh, as the uh, the last deputant. So I, I'm not sure, Amanda, if Chris Hello, is there can you hear as us? well. Can you hear yes, us? is Chris there with you Hi. as well, Amanda? Yes, he is. Okay, so each of you have five minutes. Uh, whoever would like to go first, welcome to Barry City Council, and you have five minutes for your deputation. It is possible I may be speaking for both of us. Is that okay? okay? Yeah, of course. The biggest issue that has not been, oh, at first I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, the biggest issue that has not been addressed is the patrons the SCS is trying to reach is most, are mostly located in downtown Barrie, in the downtown's core. Although there are occasional issues around Milligan's Pond, the reality is it is the core that needs to be regularly swept for discarded needles in the parking lots, the alleyways, etc where the majority of the crimes exist, including drug-related stabbings and shootings. But it is also where many of the patrons you are trying to help can be found passed out in the doorways of the retail stores sleeping off their last high. Safe consumption sites are typically put in the heart of the areas I just described above. This would mean that the city of Barrie and the co-applicants should be focusing on a location to help these souls in an area uh, in, an area in the core where they're located. It is this area and its safety that is in biggest need of improvement. The City of Barrie and the co-applicants proposed location of 11 Innisfil Street is outside of these issues and where these people exist. What needs to be expressed and put on record is that in fact, it is the City of Barrie's, the CMHA and the SMDHU's intent to introduce a safe consumption site and its patrons along with the issues that follow them, including the crime that typically follows them to an area whose exposure to these issues are currently limited at best. As you've heard from many of the community, this neighborhood has been in a state of renewal for the last six years, a state of renewal you will in fact destroy. No one has considered that the other safe consumption sites uh, already in existence in Ontario have been located within the areas these patrons actually exist. None have been installed in neighborhoods outside of these troubled areas, such as this council and the co-applicants are proposing. This creates a definitive distinction between the proposed site at 11 Innisfil Street and the other 16 safe consumption sites in existence in Ontario. This distinction literally renders any reports, studies, or claims that state these troubled areas improve and crime rates do not increase as irrelevant because these studies are limited to the areas where they that are actually focused on the heart of the issues, the heart of where these people were located and needed the help, not in an area that, that uh, not in an area that was outside. 
with your intent to place the safe consumption site outside of where Barry's issues actually exist, you are literally intending to move these patrons along with their issues to a new area not currently experiencing issues at the level to which the core is experiencing them. It is my belief as a registered real estate agent by introducing a safe consumption site and subsequently introducing these issues with an increased amount of traffic to an area that has been in a state of renewal, you will in fact create a stigma to the neighborhood that does not currently exist. This introduced stigma will drastically devalue the properties in this neighborhood, affecting the lives and savings of many families to be clear, this debate is not about a safe consumption, if a safe consumption site should be brought to the Barry, but is if the location is the correct one. I have owned in this area on Perry Street for 31 years. I am one of the longest existing owners in this area. The council members of the corporate corporation of the city of Barry, the CMHA, the SMDHU, Dr. Simon and Dr. Gadisa have all violated the principles of procedural fairness and natural justice by failing to notify both taxpaying businesses and taxpaying residents of their intent to install a safe consumption site at 11 Innisfil Street, Barrie. By their own admission, their studies who they notified were for 80 Bradford Street. They failed to contact anyone by the who are actually by the actual physical location of 11 Innisfil Street, and it renders their studies useless. Not even a sign was posted to notify local residents and businesses of their intent. Since Dr. Simon could not go to door to door, then as a bare minimum of due diligence, you should have been required to post a notice similar to those required for a variance, especially during a pandemic where we cannot communicate in the way we normally would. It is only because one of my neighbors recognized the location, the picture of the door, that the truth was finally admitted to and disclosed by the city and co-applicants. This council literally failed to notify their taxpaying constituents who entrusted them with the authority to better their community so they could have a safe and reasonable enjoyment of their properties and businesses. The SMDHU, the CMHA, and this council's actions imply an intent to deceive, having misinformed the public with the actual proposed location. Not only that, it is clear that no one, including Dr. Simon and the SMDHU, performed the due diligence as evident on May 25th by their lack of knowledge of a fully accredited daycare in direct proximity to this proposed site. Let's not forget then, when HIP Developments completes their construction, the YMCA will be moving in and I believe will have a daycare uh, in the building within the proximity to this site. It is concerning that those of you entrusted with the authority to make the decisions appear to be taking advantage of both COVID and the state of emergency lockdown uh, we are under to push this agenda through. It is clear that the Downtown Barry Business Association, who paid $30,000 to a private consultant who advised the, uh, the BIA to get the attic out of the core because it affects business in downtown Barrie, um, it, it, I, I think is influencing the council's decision. I get it. I own property downtown as well, while I, and I mean in the core. While I understand and empathize with their plight, pushing them into residential communities along with the drug dealers that follow them is not the answer. I believe in giving a hand up, not a handout. If you want to help these people, then help those who want and are willing to invest the commitment to getting better. Give these people a hand up, provide them with the counseling, housing, whatever it takes. If they're willing to put in the effort, then invest my tax money into them. But invest them by helping them, not by enabling them. Enabling them helps no one. Think about it. Do we give an alcoholic a drink? Every recovering alcoholic I know says absolutely not. Give them the resources to recover, not the resources to get high. It's common. In order, Mayor Lehman, is the five minutes up? I have uh, 10 minutes. Uh, yeah, there were two deputations, but um, we do need the other deputant to deliver the other five minutes, uh, ma'am. So, oh, is, 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 Chris, uh, you can you can go ahead. You're, uh, Ms. Ridding, you have uh, actually gone a little bit over your five minutes. Okay, well, I'd like her to finish if that's possible. I, I don't have green glasses with me, and... Um, I, I really don't see the difference. I, I will make a comment at the end if time permits. Please proceed, Amanda. Uh, Ms. Ridding, you can finish up your comments, but you need to finish right away and then hand it over to the other registered deputant. I'm sorry, I have to follow the same rules for everybody. There are better solutions. During the May 25th meeting, Dr. Simon recognized that the issue is in downtown Barrie. 
For that reason, locating the safe, uh, locating the safe consumption site in the industrial area was not an option as it was too far from the clients they are trying to help. Councilor Alwyn, during a call with me this evening, also agreed that this issue stems from and is in the downtown core. The proposed location is not in the downtown core. Council Alwyn is also very passionate about these safe consumption sites and can, uh, that they can improve the affected areas by reducing needles and crime. So why is it, Mr. Alwyn, you're not promoting a site where the issues exist, which is in the downtown core? Every resident in Barrie knows the issues of needles on the sidewalks and the parks and people sleeping in the doorways in the core. This is where the issue is. This is where the solution should be located. The perfect solution is to use the vacant units at the very bus terminal, which, are, which will soon be fully vacant. It has offices, washrooms, and everything else you need, including um, barrier free. It has um, every room, for, uh, even has room for, uh, uh, room for potential temporary housing for those on the road to recovery. Not only, the very, uh, not only that, the very bus terminal would be more cost effective. As a and as a landlord, it will give the city more control over the simple, uh, safe consumption site. More importantly, it is where okay, you will target- Okay, Reading, I do need you to wrap up. Okay. Okay, um, which apparently is a major criteria for Dr. Simon and the FMDHU. Mr. Alwyn, you want to help these people who need safe injection sites, then follow what you preach and promote a site in the heart of the issue, which is the, down, which is the core of downtown Barrie. Listen to and respect what your constituents are telling you and promote the Barrie bus terminal and other retail locations, and then you will be serving both sides while saving family from financial ruin. You want to add a few out words, Chris? Yeah. I don't have time to thank you. Uh, thank you for uh, letting us run over a bit. I'll be very brief as a result. Um, the, uh, uh, I can kind of bring forward a boots on the ground approach to this because for 30 some odd years, I've run rooming houses in, in the area and dealt with several of the drug, uh, um, drug users as a result. And they are people that need help. Um, that's not the issue. And I personally don't disagree with, um, with the safe consumption site. What I do disagree with is the lack of proper uh, um, studies or lack of proper um, investigation into this site. Um, it is ridiculously located on an S bend, a very busy road next to the road. It's, just, it's a completely dangerous spot to walk your dog, never mind uh, uh, crowd people into. It's not barrier free. Uh, I, I can't imagine, I, I could throw a dart at Barry. And I don't think it would land in a worse spot to locate this. Maybe Valley Unless Drive. Maybe Valley Drive know. or Oakley <laughs> Park Square. But um, okay, uh, point of order. That's uh, that's so inappropriate, Mayor Lehman. Yeah, I that's, was just going to uh, say. Um, I'm uh, sorry. Uh, we we that can we never. Have no pro uh, we have no problem with you making deputations. Um, it's not my address anymore, anyway. But if that was uh, intended to be a shot at putting it by the mayor's house. Um, so, uh, please, uh, we're interested in hearing your remarks and concerns. You are our last deputation uh, of the night, but please keep it professional, folks. Thank you. Go yeah. ahead. Well, I'm not trying to be unprofessional. I'm just simply trying to drive home that um, it's not it's not the um, it's not a good place to put it in a neighborhood. You need to put it in a commercial zone or where it's gonna do the most good, which would be in the downtown core. If we, it, it, we, we all agree that these folks need help and damn it, we gotta do everything we can to help them. But um, rushing into a decision uh, to locate this poorly um, under the premise of doing it quickly and because it's needed fast is, is simply ridiculous. and. I think you're going to hurt the people you're trying to help, and you're most definitely going to hurt everyone on Perry Street, everyone on Innisfil Street in the area. Um, their property values. I mean, we've I have done extensive work to my house on Perry Street, and chose to do that over my house on Mary Street for this exact reason. You know, I converted it from a boarding house to a duplex, which is intended to house house families because it's trending in that area. And I think that was a responsible thing for a person like me who does minor developments to do. Um, I, I, I just, I feel like you're just 
you're not only, you know, spitting in my face uh, for doing all this development and other neighbors as well, but you're also spitting in the face of the, the police that have spent time trying to clean up this park and the city staff, the parks and rec staff that have spent hours trying to clean up, hours and days trying to clean up this park. Um, everyone is doing our best to improve this area and this is not in any way, shape or form gonna help improve the area. And it's inappropriately located to help the people it's intending to help who are primarily downtown. Uh, thanks for your time. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Chris and Amanda. Are there questions of these deputants? Questions only, Councillor Natalie Harris. Questions only, okay. Um, my question is to Ms. Riding, Ridding, sorry. Um, I didn't get your address, Where where is your place of residence, sorry? It's on Perry Street. You live on Perry I Street right now? We, yeah, we own the, the house at the dead end of Perry Street. And my daughter um, lives there, so I prefer not to disclose on, on the public record exactly the address because my daughter lives there. Oh, I thought we had to disclose our no, not daughter. A, no, not in a not for deputations. Uh, that's for the Planning Act. Public okay, community. so you live on Perry Street. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions for the deputant, Councillor McCann? Uh, thank you, Mary Lehman. I'm um, lots of very passionate, lots of passion coming from, from Amanda. Uh, you just said one comment that uh, I just said a little more, um, a little more on. You just mentioned that you believe you were intended to be deceived, right? And is that by who, who exactly do you think is deceiving you and how do you think you were deceived? I, well, I'll, I appreciate you asking uh, Councillor McCann because I actually didn't get a chance to expand on that, which I had further in my deputation. Um, we were not notified. We only found out recently, um, in fact, it was yesterday that we found out any of this was happening. There was no notice given. The um, if you just give me a second, because I actually had it written out and I just assume you refer to my notes. So if you bear with me one second, because I want to make sure I get it right. Uh, the facts are the city and the co applicants misrepresented the location. They have not provided adequate information to the neighborhood. The neighborhood has not been given time to review, comprehend, and respond to the proposed site. This is a violation of procedural fairness and natural justice. This is a misuse of and a miscarriage of your authority. This address wasn't even a consideration a year ago. So what is the rush now? What are you, what are each of you gaining to ruin the lives and investments of so many people? At the very least, an adjournment should be made of 60 days and an appropriate time to receive the documentation for the neighborhood to review it and respond should be permitted, as well as for the opportunity of the city of Barrie to review alternative locations such as the Barry City bus station. Failing to do so to give these to give this neighborhood the right to review and respond is a violation of our equitable equitable rights. Okay, well thank you. You know, just Amanda, uh, I'm not sure how the vote's gonna happen tonight, but just understand that uh, there's another process going forward. Just to put a little water on you and your husband's uh, fire here a little bit. Uh, with your frustration and feel like you are being deceived. I actually don't think that anybody intentionally is deceiving uh, the community. Um, at least I hope that's not the case. So I just wanted to, I wanted to address it. I want to put some water on that and just understand that you should be talking to your local uh, MPPs and uh, your uh, federal representative for Health Canada and the Ministry of Health, because that's going to be the final decision. Okay, thank you. Okay, questions. Any other questions for the deputant, uh, Councillor Morales? Uh, thank you, Mayor Lehman. Uh, to the uh, uh, to Miss Ridding, uh, Miss Ridding, I, I'll play the tape back in case you said it and I missed it. But were you planning on sharing your street, uh, the, the fact that you uh, lived on Perry Street after you attempted to dox the mayor, where you thought at the time that he lived in with his his own daughter as well, or were you not going to plan on sharing that information? I'm just trying to understand for consistency's sake. The street name with no number. That's no more than what I disclosed. A street name with no number. You know, I'm just saying if you're intending to share uh, that information, um, again, I can play the tape back if you shared it at the beginning of your thing. And as you as as you know, I'm not talking to you directly. There was literally a presenter that I asked for context purposes, uh, the street address. I'm just wondering if it was a 
a two-way road on that docs attempt. You want to ask me when we're not being viewed publicly, then I have no problems disclosing what address I live at. But because this is potentially being viewed by members of the public, and I have a daughter, a single female living in that house, I do not want to disclose on the public record for anyone to see what the actual address is. You want to ask me off the record later? You're welcome to do so. Perfect. Uh, my point is, Mr. Ding, I think that the mayor and his young daughter would also feel the same way, but I'm probably out of line speaking for on his behalf. No, thanks, Councillor Morales. Are there other questions of the deputant? Okay. Uh, thank you, Ms. Ridding. Thank you, Mr. Ridding, for your deputation. Our remaining deputant is Shelby Jones. I know we were having trouble getting Shelby on the call earlier. Um, Shelby, are you able to hear us? Shelby, it's still showing that you're on mute. So pound six or hashtag six or, you know, the cross, the tic-tac-toe board six. <laughs> oh, Shelby, can Hello? you hear us? Hello. Yes. Ah, now can we can you hear, hear you. Me? All right. Okay. <laughs> we can hear you. Welcome to Barry City Council. Right. In accordance with our procedural bylaw, you have up to five minutes for your deputation. I thank you very much for allowing me to speak this evening. I agree it is late now, but however... Uh, my husband and I have lived on Perry Street for 57 years, and we live right next to the pond and Milligan's Park. Um, I just feel that this is not the proper site for this injection. I know uh, that we do need an injection site. I'm not an advocate of not in my backyard policy, but we do need a, an injection site. I know that. Um, there's going to be at least a thousand extra people in this area when the Red Story Field is developed. And uh, also, this is a very narrow S Bend intersection where Perry Street meets Echo Street South and Ennisville Street. It's a very high traffic area, and there is only the sidewalk on the one side. So I just feel that. When we were told it was 80 Innisfil, I was fine with that, but certainly not 11, uh, or 80 uh, Bradford, but not 11 Innisfil Street. There is just not enough room there, and uh, I do feel that it's not the correct spot for an injection site. Okay, thank you so much for those uh, comments. Uh, Ms. Jones, and thank you for coming tonight. Are there any questions for the deputant? Okay, seeing none from members of council. Uh, Ms. Jones, thanks for bearing with us with the, uh, the technology that we have to use these days. Hopefully it won't be for too much longer, but thank you for being here tonight. Uh, I believe, Madam Clerk, that completes the deputations on all three matters. Yes, Mayor Lehman, it does. Okay, and so a final thank you to everybody who came to give their views tonight and especially those who waited for several hours to do so. Uh, we have no tax application and, and for those watching, uh, the matter of the supervised uh, consumption site uh, motion uh, will be coming up quite shortly. We're now gonna move to the, the committee reports. Uh, Deputy Mayor Ward, why don't you start us off with the committee reports. Sure. So by myself, seconded by Councillor Thompson, that the planning committee report dated May 11, 2021, is circulated to be received. Pardon me. Excuse me. It's moved by Deputy Mayor Ward and seconded by Councillor Thompson that the planning committee report from May 11th, as circulated, be received. It's to receive the application for zoning bylaw amendment uh, for the wind our development at 189 Somerset Drive. It's just to receive the report from the public meeting, not a decision on this matter. Comments or questions? Seeing none, I'll call the question. Those in favor? Any opposed to receiving that? None. That carries. Section B, please. Moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Thompson, that the first general committee report dated May 17, 2021, is circulated to be received. Sorry, we're moving on to the first general committee report. This is from May 17th. Uh, it's moved by Deputy Mayor Ward, seconded by Councillor Thompson, that the first general committee report dated May 17th as circulated be received. It's to receive the presentation concerning a confidential personal information matter, EMT performance management. It's just to receive the report from the meeting. Comments or questions? Seeing none, those in favor?
Any opposed? None. That carries. Thank you. Uh, moving on to the second general committee report from May 17th. Moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Thompson, that Section A of the second general committee report dated May 17th, 2021, is circulated to be received. Okay, it's moved by Deputy Mayor Ward, seconded by Councillor Thompson, that Section A of the second general committee report dated May 17th, 2021, is circulated to be received. It's to receive the report of the City Building Committee uh, dated May 11th, 2021. Comments or questions? Seeing none, those in favor of receiving City Building Committee report. Any opposed? None. That carries. Section B, please. Moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Thompson, that Section B of the Second General Committee report dated May 17, 2021, is circulated to be adopted. Thank you. It's moved by Deputy Mayor Ward, seconded by Councillor Thompson, that Section B of the Second General Committee report dated May 17, 2021, is circulated to be adopted. Just list the items. 70 to 72 Dunlop Street sign installation. It's an amendment to uh, the Heritage Building sign permission. Uh, we have an amendment to the Active Transportation Sustainability Committee's terms of reference related to the committee composition. An item re regarding reducing GHG emissions through park and yard naturalization. Active Transportation and Sustainable Committee, uh, Sustainability Committee webpage. Uh, extensions to naming rights agreements. Approval of the Whiskey Creek at Minette's Point Drainage Improvements Report. An interim update to the Barry Public Art Policy. The item on modular supportive housing project at Vespera and Victoria Streets, or on Vespera and Victoria Streets. The development charge credit agreement for Maple View Drive East. City's annual declaration of June 7th is Robert Berry Day. An invitation to present to future majority and an item regarding sponsorship programs for speed pads. Those are the items in section B. Does anyone wish to comment on any of these items? Okay, the only comment I wanted to make was this was the uh, subject of the one early first deputation tonight. And I know a lot of our residents in the area have been interested in the motion on Vesper and Victoria Streets. Uh, the motion is as printed to not proceed with the uh, modular supportive housing project, uh, but rather to discuss other options for that site uh, with the County of Simcoe. Uh, any comments or questions on section B? Any of the other items? Okay, seeing none, I'll call the question. Those in favor of section B, are any opposed? None, that carries. Okay, so for those wondering uh, what will happen uh, at um, Vesper Street, uh, there's no decision out of tonight um, because the proposed use uh, has been turned down by way of that motion, which has just been ratified uh, and uh, be in touch with us uh, around uh, what may happen in the future. Uh, section B, uh, section C, please, Deputy Miller. Yeah, just give me a second, because my next one is D on here, so. All right, it is section D, because C was part of the special council meeting. I apologize. C was to do with the tax ratios, and we dealt with that at the special meeting last week. Okay, that so makes sense. Yeah. Okay, move on myself, second by Councillor Thompson, that section D of the second general committee report dated May 17, 2021, is circulated to be received. Thank you. It's moved by Deputy Mayor Ward, seconded by Councillor Thompson, that Section D of the Second General Committee report dated May 17th is circulated be received. It's to receive the presentation on the City of Barrie's water and wastewater financial plan. Any comments or questions on Section D? Okay. Seeing none, I'll call the question. Those in favor? Or any opposed? None. That carries. Section E, please. Moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Thompson, that Section E of the Second General Committee report dated May 17, 2021, as circulated be adopted. Thank you. It is moved by Deputy Mayor Ward, seconded by Councillor Thompson, that Section E of the Second General Committee report dated May 17, as circulated be adopted. This is with regards to the uh, motion regarding the proposed Bradford bypass and the motion regarding the City of Barry's Community Safety and Wellbeing Plan. Councillor Kungel and then Councillor Harvey. Yes, thank you, Your Worship. I'd like to uh, table an amendment. Okay, go ahead. That um, 21G137 proposed Bradford bypass be uh, amended uh, specific to section one. And that at the end of that sentence, um, it would add the words and identify considerations for alternate routes. And I can speak to that. Okay, so we have an amendment moved by Councillor Kungel, and I'm sorry, your seconder. Seconded by Councillor Aylwin. Seconded by Councillor Aylwin. Uh, and it is to add the words to the end, 
uh, that alternative routes be oh, considered. Sorry. And my apologies, sorry to interrupt. I read that wrong. It's seconded by uh, Councillor Natalie Harris. All right, uh, seconded by Councillor Natalie Harris uh, that uh, the words and alternative routes, I, I believe you All said, be considered. <laughs> yes, and that, um, um, so it will finish sentence one by saying uh, into Lake Simcoe and identify considerations for alternate routes. Okay. Uh, on the amendment. Go ahead, Councillor Campbell. Thank you. So just in respect to the, the presentations that we had um, at the beginning of the meeting uh, around recommendations to strengthening that, you know, and recognizing the significant impact on um, the watershed areas uh, and sensitivities, I, I do think it would be great to see if while we are asking for um, a comprehensive impact assessment on Lake Simcoe and the vulnerable water watersheds, uh, and inflows into Lake Simcoe that we do also ask them to disclose what other considerations for routes uh, have been have been, been tabled and uh, an awareness of that. So uh, hoping that's just additional information that the government could comment on. Okay, thanks Councillor Kungel on the amendment. Councillor Aylwin, Councillor Hart. Thank you, Mary Lehman. Uh, just quickly to the mover, uh, I know we did discuss this a little bit, but um, in terms of alternative routes, do you also intend for that to look at public transit options like Go Service? Uh, thank you for the question. I wasn't going to get in the specifics. I'm hoping that might be one. Uh, knowing that you know that was within kind of the uh, the commentary, I believe, by um, one of our presenters. So whether um, we modify that to be alternate routes or or options to support the, the traffic um, measures that seem to be identified. Uh, I'll look to you if you want to further amend that, but um, if, if you want it to be more specific, by all means. Yeah, I do. I just cognizant of the fact that we're at city council, so it would need to be a written amendment. But um, yeah, I, I, think, I think I'm happy with it the way it is. But uh, yeah, I would hope we would explore transit options as well. Okay, thanks, Councillor Rowan. Councillor Harvey. Thank you, Worship. Actually, my first point is just more of a point of clarification. Uh, are we able to separate these two items? Because they are very two different items under this Section E and have them voted on separately. Um, we can, but you will need to move a motion to separate them as we are at City Council. So it would and be I would need remove. a seconder for that, though, too. And, I would and I you would. You oh, would. It looks like we have a bunch of jumpers. Whoever wants to jump first. <laughs> OK, so it is. Um, is it all right to, well, actually, sorry, we have an amendment on the floor to the uh, Bradford bypass piece. Is it all right if we deal with that and then separate them, Councillor Harvey? Sure, um, maybe I'll just add my comments uh, in relation to this matter then, and, sure. and then ahead. we can deal with the and other And then we'll pieces. separate it so we can vote yeah. on them separately, yeah. So I'm not gonna support the amendment. I wasn't in support of the, uh, the original motion either. And Again, for the same reasons that I stated last week, and I'm not going to go through them all again and reiterate, it's been a long meeting, but we, we are embarking on an area that is not even remotely close to the city of Barrie. And I'll be quite honest with you, um, look, at, look at where our wastewater is going right now. We don't have the greatest history ourselves. Um, I don't recall other municipalities uh, uh, jumping in the middle of any issues when Barry was redoing their wastewater. Um, so I'm just not sure why we're embarking on this when this has been approved by all the municipalities that it's going to affect. It's been an endorsed by Simcoe County. It's been endorsed by uh, regional uh, municipality of York's council. Um, so I, I just really struggle as to why a city like ours, 40 minutes north, uh, thinks that uh, we should be getting involved in this. And, and we're so late to the game, this is going to have zero impact. It's already been approved by the federal government. Um, but the big issue that I think everybody needs to think about before we vote on this is where does our wastewater go? Uh, we can't sit here and think that we're, we're uh, protecting Lake Simcoe when our wastewater and a certain level of phosphorus is, is going in our own Kempenfeld Bay. Okay, thanks, Councillor Harvey. Uh, count, sorry, was that Deputy Mayor Ward? Yeah, go ahead, uh, Barry. I just had to take this opportunity to point out there's a report on our water, uh, water waste treatment plant tonight, and uh, actually shows we're doing very well. Our, our target set for us by the government is 
I think milligrams per liter of phosphorus and we're actually 0 0.03. So we're less than a third of what our target is. So we're actually doing incredibly well with our thing. I just wanna let it go by that we're somehow polluting the lake. You know, we're, we'll hopefully we'll do better, even better in the future. But right now we're a third of what we are allowed to put into the bay. So that's why I think just because it's on our circulation list tonight, I couldn't let it pass. Thanks, Deputy Mayor Ward. And you know what they say about stuff running downhill. We really don't have another option. We can't move it to uh, uh, any other outflow. Uh, but I do understand, uh, uh, Councillor Harvey, the point you're making. Uh, Councillor Morales. Uh, thank you, Mayor Lehman. I won't be supporting the amendment and the only clarity that I'll add, I don't know if I covered it last week in my comments. Um, I read some feedback from residents, a combination of online comments, uh, as well as emails. Uh, this is necessary, not only for that commuter traffic um, in the, again, York um, area, GT area, and what I call the, the Warriors to Durham region, um, but that Bradford area, uh, the, that new market traffic, people on Green Lane, uh, people on Davis Drive, um, it is stop and go. We're talking pre-COVID. It is stop and go. Um, I did it for a bit. And again, somebody pointed out that the the emissions, the greenhouse gases of stop and go traffic are a lot uh, more consequential than traffic that flows freely. Um, and I picked my language carefully. Obviously, no emissions or public transportation is better. But living, being pragmatic about this, uh, stop and go traffic with reduced speeds um, it's not an efficient, if, like if we're going to have emissions, that's not uh, an optimal way of having them. And um, it, it would be more efficient, not only from the environment, but also from a quality of life perspective. People would rather be, uh, have their commute be 50 minutes uh, or an hour instead of the equivalent being an hour and 20 minutes, an hour and 40 minutes. So we do have to think about that as well. Um, also that if we're thinking about our, our neighbors in Bradford, which, um, you know, we, we always want to maintain good relationship with. Uh, that really chokes up the, their, their, their town. Uh, that's think, think of the equivalent if we didn't have a highway running through our city and it would be our Bayfield or our Essa Street. That's what Bradford experiences during rush hour at this time. So I won't be supporting the amendment um, and I just wanted to provide that clarity. Thanks very much, Councilor Morales, on the amendment to request that the province include alternate routes in their review. Uh, further comments, Councilor Reitma. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, and for sure, I think we should ask uh, the government to look at alternatives. Uh, we had uh, two speakers tonight um, who uh, spoke exactly about that, that uh, we have uh, this highway affecting uh, wetlands and forests and farmlands and all those kind of things. And it seems to me just reasonable to uh, say, look, you know, uh, why don't you take a look at some alternative routes because um, the one you selected may or may not be the best one. So uh, it just, I think just from a straight environmental point of view and good planning, that's what we should be asking them to do. That's what they should be doing. Okay, thanks Councillor Eatman on the amendment. Any other comments? Councillor Thompson. Really quick through you, Mayor Lehman, to the mover of the motion. Um, would your amendment require the federal government to revisit on an alternative route? I, I know that it's, but if they moved it, way out of the scope of work, wouldn't the federal government have to do another study? And they've already said they won't look at it. I, I just think we're a little late to the party because when you've got approval from federal levels, I don't think people are gonna go back to the drawing board just on the cost, but maybe you could answer if the federal government would have to revisit. So if I could maybe just clarify on process. Uh, first of all, I'm almost dead sure that a tesser will consider alternative routes as its standard scope of work, but I could be wrong and you know, maybe there's no harm in adding. Uh, there, there is no federal approval for the project. Uh, the federal government did announce a couple of weeks ago that they are not going to bump this to a federal EA. They did say they're going to bump the 413 to a federal EA. So there will be a federal EA on 413. Uh, there won't um, on the Bradford bypass. So I think Councillor Kungle's amendment is, um, I guess, a request to the province when they do uh, the work that they're going to do. Sorry about that. Yeah, my uh, earbuds ran out when you were, I apologize. Not a problem. Uh, any other comments on the amendment? Councillor Jim Harris. Thank you, Mayor Lehman. I just wanted to, Sorry to belabor this, but just wanted to make a comment maybe to 
manage expectations for those who are, are this issue is near and dear to. Um, what we're doing here is shaping what will go to a letter that um, has, how, how would we describe, I don't know if, if anybody can describe the authority that, that such a letter, I know we've written letters with good intention and with um, uh, purpose, but um, I, I, last time I checked with the Kirk, I think we were uh, two for 15 on letters. Um, so this has already been approved by the federal government. For people watching, can we put any kind of, um, you know, <laughs> assessment of what this will accomplish? Um, or is that too difficult to, um, to ascertain? I'm not sure who to ask that question of. Maybe that maybe maybe it's to you, Mayor Lehman, with your experience. Maybe that's well, just. I mean, the fact of this is we have zero authority. Um, however, we're an interested party, and we represent a community that, um, uh, you know, in my opinion, has an interest in certain aspects of the project for sure. Uh, okay. But uh, there is no requirement for the province to listen to us. Um, uh, but I'll, you know, we would hope that. Uh, uh, as a letter coming from a municipal council resolution, they would give it due consideration, but we have no authority. Thank you, Mary Liam. I, not to, to uh, diminish the effort, but just to help. So I, I think some of the flavor of some of the emails I've seen, it seems like we're one making the decision and we're not making the decision here. We're, we're trying to advocate on behalf of people with a letter. So I would just say, I, I understand the amendment and given that I don't know that there's a lot of weight here. Um, if we, with a, a paragraph one, we have, um, you know, asking for that evaluation. One of the outcomes might be if they have this evaluation, they find these horrible outcomes. I would think they would consider alternate routes. That would be a given. But so to me, it's it's fairly benign, uh, given that that would probably okay anyway. But thanks. I just want to make a point that really, you know, as as a, as authority goes, we have and then you said zero. So I appreciate you clarifying that. So thank you. Okay, on the amendment to add the request for alternate routes. Comments or questions any further? Okay, I'll call the question. Those in favor of the amendment, please indicate. One, two, three, four, five, as am I, and opposed are five. So the amendment carries six to five. Uh, on the main motion as amended, any comments or questions? Councillor Harvey, you'd indicated before. Did you have comments on the main motion? Uh, no, Your Worship. I'll just uh, the just looking to separate it for the separation. <laughs> sure. Okay. Uh, if there are no other comments on the motion as amended on the Bradford bypass matter, um, I will call the question. Uh, those in favor of the motion as amended. Three, four, five, six. Uh, those opposed. One, two, three, four. That carries. Now, um, Councillor Harvey, would you like to introduce the motion to separate uh, the community safety and well-being plan, and we'll introduce that separately? Sure. Uh, who would like to second it? Councillor Congo. Okay, actually, Councillor Congo was the quickest at it. So, yeah, uh, yeah. No, I, I moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Congo to uh, separate twenty one G dash one thirty seven and 21G-138 of section E uh, for voting purposes. Okay, and that will be to reintroduce uh, section E, sorry, the uh, community safety and well-being plan will be reintroduced as section H. So we will come back to that at the end if this amendment to, or this motion to separate them passes. Any comments or questions on the motion to separate? Actually, I see the clerk came on. Do, I, do you need that Very in clear. writing? Uh... Um, through you, Mayor Lehman, to Councillor Harvey, I emailed you um, some, some verbiage for that, so you probably just didn't see it. I, I didn't. <laughs> okay, it was very close to what you said, uh, <laughs> Councillor Harvey. <laughs> okay, I will, uh, I will go with the recommended wording from the clerk because it does sound much better than uh, what I made up off the top of my head. That was good, though. Uh, okay, so we are, uh, it is to separate the community safety and well-being plan, and the, uh, what the clerk added there is that we will reintroduce it as Section H. So that is the motion that's on the floor to separate the two items. Comments or questions? Seeing none, those in favor of separating the items? Is anyone opposed? None. That carries. Okay, so uh, that will be uh, brought forward as um, uh, Section H. 
Uh, and I guess I need to take the vote then on the remnant of section E, which is the proposed Bradford bypass. Uh, any further comments or questions on section E? Okay, seeing none, those in favor of section E. And opposed, one, okay, that carries. Okay, now we're on to, strangely, section G, because F was the other part that was adopted in the special committee, and that was the tax capping policies. Deputy Mayor Ward. Moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Thompson, that section G of the second general committee report dated May 17th, 2021, is circulated be adopted. Thank you. It is moved by Deputy Mayor Ward, seconded by Councillor Thompson, that section G of the second general committee report as circulated be adopted. This is with regards to the water and wastewater system financial plans, outdoor activity restrictions, Ontario Community Building Fund, and the investigation to construct professional grade pickleball courts. Any comments or questions on section G? Councillor Allen and Councillor Kungle. Thank you, Mayor Lehman. Uh, I'm not supportive of the application for funding for the Sadlin Center expansion or for the pickleball court item. So uh, I will be supporting this at this time. Okay, uh, Councillor Kungle. I had a through your worship, I had a question about process um, considering some of the changes to restrictions, um, whether or not it was still deemed to be um, um, a valid point in time to still request the lifting of restrictions. Uh, fair point, given most of them have already been lifted. Uh, however, the item's on the agenda. So I, I suppose if we stand. pass it, uh, and I don't believe there's specific action in terms of who it would be communicated to. Correct me if I'm wrong, Madam Clerk. You're correct, Mayor Lehman. Okay. So uh, there won't be the requirement for us to send a, an out-of-date letter. Uh, it will simply be a slightly out-of-date position, but it was, wasn't at the time. Great, uh, any further comments on Section G, members of Council? Okay, seeing none, I will call the question. Those in favor of Section G? And opposed? Two. Okay, that carries. Okay, uh, Deputy Mayor Ward. Uh, let's see if we can move quickly through the next two or three items to get to the SCS. Yeah. But before we do that, we will have to have a motion to extend tonight's meeting past 11 p.m. Okay. Have a motion from a member of council, moved by Councillor Thompson, seconded by Councillor Harvey. Councillor Natalie Harris, did you wish to speak to this? Sorry, Councillor Lehman, at your earliest convenience, if we can please take a five minute break. <laughs> sure. Uh, so, uh, okay. Uh, can we uh, vote on the motion to go past 11? Uh, those in favor of extending the meeting past 11? Okay, uh, none are opposed, so we will extend to midnight uh, if needed, uh, and it will need to be like a four and a half minute, uh, five minute break. So I will sure. call a five minute bio break for all those I'm sure who need it, uh, and we will reconvene at 11.05, okay? Five minute recess.
Okay, folks, if everyone can come back into the call. Okay, I think we've got just about everybody back. Uh, so I will call the city council meeting back to order. Number five, uh, we still have section H, the section that was separated. Deputy Mayor Ward, don't know that you'll have a form for that. Uh, I don't, So, but I can say move on myself, second by Councilor Thompson, that uh, section H of the second general committee report dated May 17, 2021 is circulated to be, would be adopted? Yes. Adopted. Okay, thank you. It's moved by Deputy Mayor Ward, seconded by Councillor Thompson, that Section H of the General Committee report uh, be adopted, and that is the Community Safety and Wellbeing Plan that had been separated. Any comments or questions on Section H? Okay, seeing none, I'll call the question. Those in favor? Is anyone opposed? None. That carries. Thanks, Deputy Mayor Ward. We can move to the first General Committee report from May 25th. Moved by myself, second by Councillor Thompson, that the first general committee report dated May 25th, 2021, is circulated to be adopted. Thank you. Uh, it is moved by uh, Deputy Mayor Ward, seconded by Councillor Thompson, that the first general committee report dated May 25th, as circulated, be adopted. This is uh, with regards to the Barry Hydro Holdings Inc. annual general meeting matters and commercial and financial information matters, the amended and restated electric unanimous shareholders agreement. Any comments or questions on first general committee report from last week, the hydro meeting? Seeing none, those in favor of the section of the report. Any opposed? Sorry, Councillor McCann. Sorry, I, I should have uh, held a conflict there. Sorry about that. Okay, uh, what's the nature of your conflict? Just I own a renewable energy company and uh, they obviously do uh, renewable, renewable energy as well. Okay, and I saw you did not participate in the vote. Uh, Madam Clerk, has Councillor McCann's conflict been recorded? Yes, Mayor Lehman has. Okay, uh, and the report carries. Uh, moving on, Deputy Mayor Ward. Moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Thompson that section A of the second general committee report dated May 25th, 2021 is circulated to be adopted. Thank you, it's moved by Deputy Mayor Ward, seconded by Councillor Thompson that section A of the general committee report dated May 25th as circulated be adopted. This is the invitation to Dr. Mike Moffat to make a presentation to council. Comments or questions? Seeing none, those in favor of section A? Anybody opposed? None, that carries section B please. Moved by myself, second by Councillor Thompson, section B of the second general committee report dated May 25th, 2021, as circulated to be received. Thanks, it's moved by Deputy Mayor Ward, second by Councillor Thompson, that section B of the second general committee report dated May 25th, 2021, as circulated to be received. It's to receive the presentations. Uh, the first was from Thierry Reyes regarding our portfolio of our investment management at the city. Uh, the second was the presentation on the proposed supervised consumption site. Uh, Councillor Jim Harris. Go ahead. Thank you, Mary Lehman. I appreciate you keeping me on task. Um, I, I'll try to be better this time. Uh, due to the fact that um, I have a direct family member uh, that works at CMHA Simca, who are both the applicant and the provider of the SCS service um, in accordance with the S5 of the uh, Municipal Conflict Interest Act and uh, Integrity Commissioner's, um, pardon me, not being smoother, Integrity Commissioner's recommendation, I will not be taking part in the discussion of the vote on this matter. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Has Councillor Jim Harris's conflict been recorded? Yes, Mayor Lehman, it has. Thank you. Okay, so this, to be clear, is just to receive the presentations. It's not the decision on the motion. Uh, any comments or questions? Okay, seeing none, those in favor of Section B? Any opposed? None. 
that carries. Section C, Deputy Mayor Ward. But myself, second by Councillor Thompson, the Section C of the Second General Committee report dated May 25th, 2021 is circulated to be adopted. Thank you. It's moved by Deputy Mayor Ward, seconded by Councillor Thompson, that Section C of the Second General Committee report dated May 25th as circulated be adopted. This is the motion regarding the proposed supervised consumption site locations. Councillor Harris. Thank you, Mayor Lehman. I would declare my conflict again. Would you like me to restate it? Um, no, I think you did. It's the same conflict, uh, yeah. same matter. Madam Clerk, has Councillor Jim Harris's potential or conflict been recorded? Yes, Mayor Lehman, it has. Okay, thank you. thank you very much. Okay, members of Council, who wish to speak to Section C. Councillor Aylwin. Thank you, Mayor Lehman. Uh, I do want to take a moment to thank everyone who took the time this evening to make a deputation. Um, there were a lot of really thoughtful comments, constructive comments, um, and, I, and I really appreciate all the work that people put into that. And that gives me hope on how we move forward as a city with this issue, addressing the deadly toxic drug supply crisis. Um, one of the most important things, if this site does get approved by the provincial and federal governments, uh, is that we have people in the neighborhood near the site who are holding uh, the operators accountable, but also participating in the uh, advisory committee um, and bringing those great ideas that we heard this evening to that table uh, so that we can create a solution that works not only for people who use drugs, but for people who live in and around the site. So I'm feeling very hopeful that we can make that work um, there were a few points that I do want to quickly address, uh, in particular, the letter from HIP Developments. Um, they conclude their letter by calling for a thorough site selection and evaluation process um, for all proposed locations to consider the impact to surrounding property uses, current and future property owners and visitors to Barrie, uh, and that they trust this process is being followed, including input from the health unit, the BIA, and others. Um, and then they talk about some long-term prevention plans, security plans. And um, I do want to note that the applicants uh, have gone through that process. Um, it's been a long and detailed process looking at the different sites uh, in and around the downtown. Um, there was a site selection advisory committee that included members of the public and members from different agencies, um, as well as the downtown BIA. Uh, and there was an evaluation process to score those sites and rank those sites. Um, and there are mitigation strategies in place to address those neighborhood concerns that we heard about tonight from some residents. Um, and it includes things like security cameras, uh, fencing, um, having outreach workers on site to ensure that people who access the site uh, don't just leave and uh, stay in the neighborhood, uh, that they head to where they need to go, whether that's home, to work, or somewhere else. Um, so those mitigation strategies are going to be critical moving forward, and uh, that's where the neighborhood engagement is really important too. Uh, if there are issues that come up, we need to hear them, the site operators need to hear them, and we can and will work through them. Um, there was a mention of a report uh, that uh, Natalie Harris did talk a little bit about. One of the residents um, brought up a report from Alberta um, showing a lack of safety around supervised consumption sites. Um, and there was a peer reviewed evaluation of this article that showed there's, there's no evidence linking SCSs to increased crime. Uh, having said that, I think we do still need to um, be on guard and make sure that we do everything we can to mitigate concerns in the neighborhood. Uh, I will be supporting this uh, as I have from the beginning. Um, I believe in the expert advice of the Public Health Unit and the Canadian Mental Health Association. Um, they've done a lot of work to engage the community, although not perfect. Uh, I think they've gone above and beyond um, what they should be expected to do. And um, uh, that gives me hope for how the site will operate. So it's time. We've lost far too many family members, friends, neighbors through this toxic drug supply crisis. And we need to use every tool in our toolbox 
to fight this crisis. And this is one tool. So let's do it. Okay, thanks, Councillor Owen. Councillor Natalie Harris. Thank you, Mayor Lehman. Um, and through you, just a couple comments. Um, so one of the really great quotes I did hear from one of the deputants was that um, a lot of the opposition is to this SES is based in fear or an opposition to any SES is based in fear. And um, just kind of going on top of what Councillor Awen, Awen said, um, the safety, it, it, this is a, a massive piece of misinformation that's definitely rooted in stigma. And I highly recommend that, you know, I will post it on my page as well, that report that Councillor Erwin is um, addressing that really does clearly show that there is not evidence that sta states that there is an increased uh, amount of crime around an SES. Um, I think it's important as well, again, to paint a clear picture that individuals who see or residents who see individuals that are in the downtown core, uh, often kind of in like the, in the West End near the McDonald's, etc. A lot of those individuals are um, actually around the methadone clinics. And methadone clinics do not, and I'm not just saying, I'm not saying that's all where they have, have been or where they're intending to go, but I do know factually, not anecdotally, but from history of having friends that use methadone clinics, is that um, these sites don't People leave these sites not previously monitored and they leave these sites without wraparound services provided. So these individuals may appear intoxicated or are intoxicated or are under the influence. Um, and, and that's because they are given their methadone, which is a drug, which is a um, controlled substance or their suboxone. And at times um, they still use uh, other drugs on top of that, and they aren't monitored like the SES will provide. Um, so it's really important that people kind of maybe don't blend those two examples together, that that's what you would see. The individuals that would attend an SES are still monitored by uh, medically trained professionals, registered nurses, etc. And they're, they stay there for quite some time, and they are also directed with uh, respect to different services. Another common misconception that I've mentioned before is that SCS enables users. Um, these individuals will use the drugs they obtain uh, full stop. Um, they at the moment have to. So that is a, these individuals are very advanced in their addiction, their disease of addiction. Uh, this isn't um, new, like a, a, a someone who's curious about using um, a, an illicit drug and, and goes to the SES to try that. Um, I can guarantee you if that was the case, the registered nurses that were present would do everything in their power to make sure that that was not what was going to happen. These individuals go to the SES to use the drugs that they have already obtained um, and hopefully have it tested and are monitored so that they don't die. If they don't use that um, drug, uh, that they have, they will go into very life-threatening withdrawals um, uh, to a point where, like I said, they can have seizures and die. So this is a very advanced stage of addiction that we're talking about here. Um, and they do provide the services that address root causes like trauma at the SCS. So for example, really quickly, because I do know that not everybody has watched the last meeting, um, but the SES, unlike other clinics, such as a methadone clinic, um, provides addiction services through CMHA, referrals to residential treatment, addiction outreach counselors, group counseling, on-site withdrawal assessment. Uh, services are also delivered in partnership with Mamaway Indigenous Primary Services. Um, they also direct access to the RAM or the Rapid Access Addiction Medical Clinic. They provide mental health programs, primary care services like nurse practitioner, practitioners are also there. And they also provide uh, social supports for housing, food and employment. And they also provide bereavement support through Hospice Simcoe. So this is not a Band-Aid solution. Um, this is a very uh, comprehensive um, way to address the disease of addiction. Um, do they, another one comment that I had already mentioned was, um, do they uh, even move into productive lives? Yes, absolutely. The stigma definitely is there that you may see individuals that are on the streets and they're homeless and they're in, again, the possibly the very, um, very 
late stages of their disease of addiction. But I, I very much encourage anyone to reach out to me and I would love to have a conversation with you if you feel like these individuals don't have potential to be coming, um, you know, turning their lives into a very productive life and a healthy life. I have so many friends that have done this. It's not just me. It's just because I'm a city councillor and this is before us. I feel blessed and honoured to be able to address this right now. But this is something uh, that has been part of my life and I've been part of this community for so many years. Um, and I know so many people that have been able to turn their lives around because they were able to go to a place such as an SES. Um, and I wanted to say something else that's really important. I heard someone say, I don't even know if I want to help drug addicts. So my point here, and I hope this is shocking, until the sentence, I don't even know if I want to help cancer patients, makes everyone as uncomfortable as the first sentence did, we have a very long way to go with addressing stigma. And I have a funny feeling that many people watching that will agree, disagree with me immediately and they will say that addiction's a choice. Again, please reach out to me. We don't have time, obviously, to go through all of the pathophysiology uh, involved with um, anatomy, physiology, with addiction. Um, people go to school for many, many years to uh, research and to address this uh, very, very profound disease. But um, it is a disease like any other disease. No one chose to be an addict. And I do use the phrase addict because that is what I was grown up as grown up, I've grown up with and what I'm accustomed to using. Um, and I am an addict in recovery. Um, and they, and I've also heard someone say that they don't, they want the privacy, they being people that are going to potentially use the SCS, um, because they don't want people judging them. Um, but this is the, the, a lot of the deputations were that they were, they were stigma and a lot of judgment, um, without proper, education or investigation into what an actual successful SES looks like. So when COVID-19 lockdowns and all those types of things are, are done, I really recommend anyone to go to an SES, for example, such as in Guelph, like we did, that really shows that people aren't hanging around outside. Um, they, they are going, they are business people. They are people that aren't just living on the street. They're individuals that um, have a very severe addiction problem. They want to go home to their families actually and are afraid to die because they aren't, uh, they aren't sure if the drugs that they have obtained um, are poisoned with fentanyl and carfentanil, um, which would make them overdose accidentally. So that is what the SCS also um, is used for. Um, the, there's just so many people in the community that use this. Um, this is my notes that are all over. Um, you know, I just, I, I could go on forever, but I, I won't. And, and I, and I, and I do respect everybody that has taken the time to come out and, and share their deputations and their concerns. But, and I, and I, and I know how strongly you feel about safety and, and I get it, you know, I, I'm a mom as well. And I have two kids and a grandson. Um, but I would 100% support an SES in my neighborhood. And that's not just because I am a person in recovery, um, but it's because I actually do have the education and the knowledge behind it to know what this looks like. This does not look like what you're maybe um, anticipating um, the outside of other clinics particularly look like. Thank you so much for your time. And obviously I will be soon. Okay, thanks, Councillor Harris. Others who wish to speak to the item? Councillor Congle. Thank you, Worship. I think everyone knows I'm a big supporter of it and um, um, very, pleased to be at the point where I can participate in this conversation with all of council and with the community. I did want to take the opportunity to, to thank um, Dr. Simon and Dr. Disa again for their leadership. I think we're quite fortunate to have them uh, in our region. And in particular, I want to take a moment to really acknowledge all of the different members of the community uh, that came together as part of that advisory table and the hours you spent and I'm aware of the difficult conversations um, that you participated in and that this is something that you were able to come together with and actually uh, help to support an identified site. So I wanted to give you recognition for um, that community uh, effort uh, and thank you for that. And um, I won't uh, belabor it any longer, but I'm very happy to be supporting this site identified. Okay, thanks Councillor Kungle. Any other comments on section C? Councillor Harvey. 
Thank you, Your Worship. Um, actually, first of all, uh, just a question for Councillor Harris, because she mentioned uh, the Guelph uh, SCS. Uh, but from what I understand, and every piece of exploration that I can do on that particular one, it's located within a community health center. Is that correct? Yeah, it's in a, it is downtown and it has um, uh, a lot of the services definitely on site. And I think that the hope, obviously, I wish that that would be possible in this SES. That's not where we are with this proposal, but um, this SES will link people to those, um, those supports. That's, that's where we are with this proposal right now. I would love if, if we had a dream, I would pick up the Guelph SCS and move it to Barrie. Um, that is just not the, not, it's just not an option. We don't have that as a, a, an available option to us, but, but yes, you're, you're, you are correct. Okay. Um, see, I, I, I still can't support this. I, I am supportive of SCSs um, and, and I agree with Councillor Harris that if we were discussing the Guelph model right now, my, my discussions would be extremely different than what they're gonna to be tonight. Um, I've done a significant amount of review of the SCSs throughout the province, and I'm yet to find one that's in a residential area the way we've had two proposals come forward to this council now. And that's where I really struggle with this. I, I, I just can't fathom putting an SCS in a residential area, and especially with this one and having a daycare 30 meters away, um, uh, it just doesn't sit well. And, and obviously it is potentially one of the sensitive uses that the, uh, the provincial government will look at when they review this application. Um, but also too, just, we've heard a lot of issues that uh, residents have, uh, have brought up uh, this evening. And even prior to that, when it hit the news, like originally we all thought it was 80 Bradford and then all of a sudden we're being told it's 19 Innisfil. And then finally we're being told it's 11 Innisfil it really makes me wonder if the applicants ever visited this place because you only got to walk to the front door and see the placard inches away from the door that says 11 Innisfil Street. And, and this is the door that they intend on using as the entranceway. So how, how this address got misconstrued is unfathomable. And it really creates a cloud over the process that they took along with the fact that we're hearing from so many residents and it seems like it's the residents that are closer to the, the proposed location that did not receive any notification or any literature, um, whether it, I can't imagine that it would be city staff mailing that out. I would suspect that would have been the SMOS group uh, sending out those notifications, but it, it really creates a cloud over the process that they embarked on when we're hearing the people that literally are feet away from the location and it's only through word of mouth from other neighbors that they that they found out about this. So the, just too many issues that uh, come up with this. Um, then when you look at, uh, again, the whole medical piece, and I, I brought this up with one of the applicants several months ago because I heard nothing but positive reviews from members of council who did visit the Guelph location. Um, and again, it's a very different model. It's in a medical building, um, obviously has the support of the medical community there. Unfortunately, when that was tried here, I was told by one of the applicants that they could not even think about securing a lease within a medical building here because the, the landlord wouldn't have it because the other tenants we're, we're against it. So it, it just goes to show you, there's obviously two sides of it, even within the medical community, that if they're not welcoming to it the way Guelph is, there, there's obviously some issues there. And, and obviously it's no different than sometimes you get two lawyers in a room, they might disagree on certain things too, but uh, it, it would have been much more palatable if we would have been talking about a medical facility here, because this is actually a medical emergency and it would really fit in opposed to putting it in a commercial premise directly across the street in a residential area. Um, the other issue I have too is it got brought up about the hip developments and 
apparently they sent the city a, a notice about a year ago and I haven't seen it myself. Here we have a developer that's doing a significant build on the old high school lands and even did a land swap with the city. So we got the preferential front facing lands on Dunlop street. And now we're turning a, a, a deaf ear to their concerns when now we wanna build, uh, open up an SCS right around the corner from what they're building. What does that message send to our development community? Very mixed message in my opinion. In one, minute, in one breath, we're saying we're open for business. We want you to come and build. But then in the other breath, we might pull a fast one on you. And I just, I don't know, it just doesn't sit well with me that uh, there hasn't been at least some consultation with, uh, with them in regards to that. Because we're not just talking about a couple rows of townhouses. We're talking about hundreds upon hundreds of rental units that are going to be built in this area with a, an extension of Perry Street. So that way everything will, will flow as a one community. Um, I guess I'll, I'll just leave my comments uh, to there, but I, I really question the due diligence that the, uh, the applicants uh, have done on this uh, because of the various issues that I've already spoken about. If we didn't have these other issues, I might have less to talk about, but uh, especially when they can't get the address correct, when there's a placard six inches from the door, that is significant in my world. And uh, I would hope uh, other members of council can see that uh, something as, Plain as that should be a huge red flag as to the type of due diligence that they have done prior to coming to this council. Okay, thanks, Councillor Harvey. Other comments on Section C? Councillor McCann. <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor Lehman. Um, so I really wanted to have an open mind, you know, uh, when this was coming about the past six months. I didn't want to be consistent and just say no for the sake of saying no. So I really want to let council know and the people that are watching know that I really uh, kept an open mind, right? I want to do what's best for this city. And uh, the strength of my argument is just amplified because of the discovery of the past, you know, uh, two weeks or week. And I guess maybe I'll just, I jotted some notes down as, as the deputants were talking and uh, it's going to reflect a lot what Councilor Harvey said, already said. I'm definitely not in favor of this uh, point blank, but I want to break it down into two different pillars. You know, there's the SES as a, as a single, um, you know, thought, and then there's also this location. So I think maybe I'll start with the location first, because that's what all the deputants uh, came here today and talked about. Uh, like the communication and the process was beyond horrible, in my opinion. Right. I mean, I uh, we're sitting here and there's a daycare, uh, you know, footsteps away from the front door and the aloofness that the doctors had last last week talking about the um, the the daycare. Just it actually blew my mind away. I, I was shocked at how aloof they were. There was a daycare. And the argument was, well, we don't know if it was registered or not. Well, <laughs> Whenever you get your discovery, if you find out a day before or a year before, I think that should be fit into your equation, whether this is going to be a suitable location or not. And then having 26 deputants and let's say that 21 of them, 20 of them were uh, all stated they didn't have any communication. I've got a serious problem with that. And I've got a serious problem with voting yes as a council member if the residents that are directly across from it weren't notified. And I just want that to sink into council. This is what we're voting on here, that as a council, as leaders of this community, we have residents, many residents that have told us that they did not get communication. So maybe this is a question I have for Michelle Banfield or maybe a question I have for, um, well, maybe, maybe I'll, leave it. I'll, I'll let you choose who the question goes to, but tell me the process. Why is our process and planning so different than the process uh, from the health units. Ms. Miller. Thank you for the question through you, um, Mayor Lehman to Councillor McCann. 
Um, this initiative is not the city's initiative. It is the initiative of the uh, CMHA and the Simcoe Muskoka District Health Unit. Um, and all engagement activities um, were planned and undertaken by them. So city staff are not involved. This is not an application under the Planning Act. This is a, a proposal that is being brought to you by those co-applicants and uh, the city simply have no role to play other than to provide you with factual information, which we did with respect uh, to the sensitive use uh, that the SCS is required to um, address, which was a, a licensed childcare center, not a licensed um, um, home daycare and we provided information with respect to zoning and we provided uh, the SES uh, and council with information with respect to the building code. So you don't mind Mayor, can I ask some direct questions to uh, Ms. Miller? So uh, just so I'm fully understanding this, did you have communication with the health unit that there was a daycare prior to two weeks ago or a yeah a daycare? Through you, Mayor Lehman, we provided the mapping um, that uh, is presented uh, in the uh, co-applicants report and in our staff report, which related to the sensitive land use, which was uh, the licensed child care center, uh, not uh, a licensed home daycare. And there is a differentiation, which I explained uh, in my follow-up email to council last week. Um, and we only provided information with respect to the center, not the daycare. And uh, that was all we were asked to address. And that is all uh, we provided information on. It's late, Ms. Miller. And uh, I just want to, I really want to nail this down. And I want almost to be as direct as possible. Uh, can you explain the difference to me, or the province's, um, you know, uh, um, opinion between a child care center and a daycare, what the differences is? I, I know you gave us a report, but we've got 26 people that came here and did deputation that didn't read that report. Certainly, uh, through you, Mayor Lehman, to uh, Councillor McCann, uh, we use the definition that is provided by the Ministry of Education with respect to a licensed child care centre. I'll simply read it for you. A licensed child care centre can um, care for infants, toddlers, um, preschool and school aged children. Uh, they may include nurseries, uh, full uh, daycare, uh, extended hours care, overnight care, uh, before and after school programs. Child care centers uh, operate in a variety of locations, including workplaces, community centers, schools, and places of worship. That is the definition that the ministry provides for licensed child care center. And that is the definition that the SCS um, needed to address with respect to their criteria. Um, there is a, a further definition for licensed home child care. Um, that is defined as individual home care providers are not licensed by the Ministry of Education. They are contracted by home child care agencies and they are, and they are not licensed by the ministry. These providers may care for infants, toddlers, preschool aged children or school aged children. They may offer full daycare before and after school care, extended hours or overnight care. Home child care agencies um, also oversee child care providers who uh, offer parents in-home child care services. An individual home child care um, uh, sent, uh, home child care provider that uh, is overseen by a licensed agency can care for up to six children under the age of 13, which must include any of their own children under the age of four. All licensed child care center home uh, centers, home child care agencies, and child care providers that are overseen by a licensed uh, home child care agency um, have a decal that they display that says that they are licensed. Private residences that provide in home services will not have a decal. That's the definition that is provided by the ministry. And that is the definition that staff used when they provided uh, the information um, to the uh, co-applicants and to council with respect to the sensitive use. So I appreciate all that information. Uh, and uh, just to be as direct as I possibly can, uh, did you or anybody on your team uh, directly uh, correlate to the health unit, the two doctors or anybody on their team that there was a there was children being babysat across the street. Did no. They know that there was, okay. So the first time that the doctor said the first time they heard it was two weeks ago, you would say that, that, that that's true. 
that is accurate. That is the first time that um, staff uh, understood that as well. That that even that even our staff knew with that. That is correct, Councillor McCann, because that's not what we looked for, um, because that is not the definition of the sensitive use that this SCS uh, was required to report against. Yep, I appreciate that. Thank you very much, Ms. Miller. And uh, this really comes down to, uh, you know, you know, I've done a lot of research on uh, safety shopping sites across Canada. And, uh, you know, this was my, my stance maybe two, three years ago when it came, is that they work and they don't work. And I'm a firm believer that it's to do with the management inside that building. And here we are having a injection site that uh, has different management than last time, uh, did a much better presentation, but with their lack of discovery, they didn't find out that there was a childcare center with we watchers uh, registered uh, minutes away, I'm sorry, uh, footsteps away. Like I have a real issue with that. If they're, if they're missing the boat on that one, what else are they gonna miss the boat on? Um, maybe I have a question for uh, Council, uh, Council Aylwin, just about management. Uh, he had mentioned earlier, uh, minutes ago, that once the, uh, the clients uh, go in and uh, they do their drugs, that there's gonna be some type of management with these um, patients, I'm not sure if that's the correct word or not, uh, clients, patients, once they're high, that they're going to not just release them into the public, like they can't stop them from leaving, at least, or can they? Like I, I want a little bit more in depth uh, discussion on what you might, if you don't mind, Mayor Levin. Thanks for the question, Councillor McCann. Uh, and I can answer to the best of my ability that I will be operating the site. But um, from my conversations with CMHA, who will be operating it, uh, they advise that there's going to be a cool off room. So um, as a condition of accessing the service, um, people will go in, uh, access the service, and then there's a separate room where they uh, can sit and wait, uh, and there's medical professionals there uh, who can help monitor them. And uh, so there's a process that happens after they've accessed the service. And then beyond that, uh, they're looking at having outreach teams uh, escort people as needed or you know, having a taxi ordered for people to get to where they need to go. Um, so it's something they're thinking about. And I, I do want to make it clear that the viability of the site relies on having the least amount of impact on the surrounding neighborhood. Uh, the CMHA and the health unit want this site to succeed, and it won't succeed if they uh, impact the neighborhood in a drastic way. So they're going to do everything in their power to ensure that there's the least amount of impact po as possible. And the people who access the service will understand that as well. And that's the experience that the Guelph site had. Um, everyone was working together to ensure that there was less of an impact on the surrounding neighborhood. And I think we can have that here as well. Well, uh, Council Aylwin, I appreciate your answer. Uh, but what I don't appreciate is when you talk to this council with such authority and such deliberance about the process that's gonna happen after these people are high. And then your first statement to me is, well, you don't really know too much about it, right? I'm just telling you right now, this is a super sensitive uh, subject. This isn't uh, a playground. This isn't something that, uh, um, that isn't gonna have such an impact. And so I'm just letting you know that, that I'm not appreciative of that, all right? Um, my I suggest second... you talk to the applicants. Well, you brought it up, Councillor. Okay, uh, Councillors, uh, I understand it's late. Councillor McCann, we'll go to the applicants who are going to operate the site. So uh, I will ask that uh, Dr. Uh, Gradisa be brought into the call uh, and she can answer your question, Councillor McCann. So I was aware they were here. Mm -hmm. Uh, Dr. Gradisa, if you can, I believe Councilor McCann's question is around uh, what happens after somebody uh, injects and are they allowed to leave the facility? Uh, what's the chill process and that sort of thing? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, thank you. Um, Councilor McCann, so yes, when, when they've actually used the substance, then they would actually sit in what's called like a, a quiet area and... Uh, when the team assesses that they're 
physically stable and they're feeling supported and have a plan and upon departure, then the team would support them in that departure. And again, as per Councillor Aylwin, it could be that the outreach counselor walks them out the door. It could be that we connect them with uh, a peer support worker, or it could be that they, they go on their way. Doctor, I appreciate your answer. Um, and uh, I guess I can't remember who it was, but I do recall one of the uh, deputants had mentioned that uh, one of their fears, uh, because it's a fear that they actually have, is fearful that they're going to inject themselves or I'm guessing there, there's other means of, of uh, ingesting the drugs, I, that the effects may not kick in for, for a while and they may be fine for the first 10 minutes and then there may be a delayed, um, my vernacular is not the best here, but high, you know, later on and that's where maybe the instability and maybe the, uh, the fear comes from residents. Could you maybe comment on that? Um, yes, again, through you, Mr. Mayor. Again, I think uh, it was highlighted, and I, I did want to, on behalf of CMHA and Simcoe Muskoka District Health Unit, just thank everybody. It was, it was really enlightening for me to listen to the neighborhood, um, you know, discussion and thoughts and concerns. But at the end of the day, depending on the substance used and the assessment. Um, we would not, uh, and you're right, there could be a delayed effect, but most of the individuals that are using use these substances quite regularly. And they actually have a better understanding of the substances and how they impact them than we might anticipate or understand. So it would be, it's a, it's a conversation with them when they use to see how they're feeling, if they're feeling safe and uh, to actually depart the space. Cause that's the most important thing for us that when they do depart, that they are safe. They feel, have had the supports they need and that um, they know they can come back if there was any um, impact or, um, you know, access other services and supports through the outreach counselors, et cetera. Well, maybe, uh, maybe I'll just ask you a couple of direct questions then. You know, I made a few statements earlier that uh, I didn't give you a chance to comment on, uh, and it's about the management of the SES and, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm the foundation to my um, to my um, insecurity about this team running this uh, facility uh, stems from that there was no communication from 20 plus residents today that came on that live within, you know, I think one woman said she can hold her breath and get to the site and she's 75 years old, right? Uh, so just a blanket statement, how do you, how, how, how would you comment on that? You, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor McCann. Sorry, how would it, if comment on the experience of them living across the street with the services there, or is that what you're uh, asking? I know, uh, Dr. Grudis, I think the specific question, the specific question is around consultation. We had a number of deputants oh, tonight okay, okay. say okay, that great. they were not, okay. they were not consulted. So if you could just review for okay. council, the consultation the and efforts that were made with the local neighborhood in this area. Thanks. Okay, great. Thank you. So we, you know, it started out with the survey based on the identified site, and then it went into mail outs of um, over 7,000 mail outs, including that entire region. And the letters went through Canada Post starting on March 29th. And um, that particular location based on tracking with Canada Post would have received it in between March 29th and April 1st with the first session starting on April 9th and they ran four sessions in total. And as this particular site bubbled up, then there was efforts uh, to actually connect with the tenants and or any um, neighbors that during the consultation sessions with the third party vendor who had specific questions or concerns. And the consultation process was overseen by the district health unit with the third party vendor. Okay, so you did 7,000 mail outs, right? It was, was that one mail out or was that a series of, of mail outs? I wasn't fully understanding. So there were four sites identified. And so with those four sites, the radius around those particular sites actually accounted for 7,000 unique addresses. So if I was just to, if I was just to do some uh, guesstimating then for the for 11 Innisfil, you would have done maybe 1,500, 2,000 uh, mail outs in the area? 
Through you, Mary Lee, may I make a comment? It's Lisa Simon. Yep, go ahead. Thank you. Just thank, thank you so very much to Dr. Gurdisa for um, speaking to this so far. I just wanted to clarify that piece around the mail out. Um, we ideally actually did want to pick each of the four sites and do a mail out around each of them, but Canada Post was un unable to do that. So we picked the most central of the four sites, which happened to be 11 Innisfil Street. From there, had a one kilometer radius around that particular site because that encompassed all of the other sites. And that whole region is what led to the 7,700 pieces of mail that Canada Post confirms were mailed out and should have been received well before the start of the consultation sessions. We do have confirmation from several members of that Innisfil Street and Perry Street region that they did receive the mail, both they said it and they called us to, to indicate that. So it's difficult to explain why some didn't. Was it not received? Was it missed? We don't know. Um, I think, you know, we certainly feel that, that we did our very best effort, you know, our best due diligence. We actually learned from the last time when the same concern was raised. So we changed the approach this time. We went with Canada Post instead of a postcard, which wasn't well received last time. We went with a letter this time with big, bold writing on the front, you know, indicating it was an invitation to provide feedback on the SCS. Um, so that's, you know, we certainly very genuinely made every effort we could to, uh, to try to have every individual be aware of the consultation. We of course want to hear people's voices and that's what's helped to, uh, to inform the decision. Thank you doctors. And please, uh, I need you to understand this. I am not uh, putting your integrity um, or your heart uh, on uh, the, the block here. I'm just looking at the end results, right? So please uh, don't think I was attacking your integrity because I definitely was not. Um, so I just want to talk more about these mail outs uh, because time and time again, 20 plus, you know, uh, deputations talked about the lack of communication, right? And they were like literally like right across the street. So unless they're all lying, which could be a possibility, uh, the other possibility is that they didn't get the mail out. Um, and so I just, I understand mail outs quite a bit, you know, and a Canada Post doesn't do a kilometer around uh, an area, they do postal codes. So I'm just, what you're saying and when, what reality is, I'm, I'm, I'm not connecting the dots unless you had some special uh, deal with Canada Post. It was one kilometer around 11 Innisfil or was it a postal code that you used? Through you, Mayor Lehman, um, we have a precision mail out approach that was used, very happy to forward it to you. We've just forwarded it to Andrea Miller. Uh, that was the approach. So I'm not sure I have more that I can explain than that, but happy to forward you the information from Canada Post if it, uh, if it helps. So, you know, I just want to hit this nail really hard in the head. So every, so precision mail out means that every address was actually on the actual um, mail out. I'm not sure I can, I know more detail than I've indicated other than that. Uh, we have a circle on a map that is a one kilometer radius around 11 Innisfil Street. And we were informed that every single address in that one kilometer radius would receive a piece of mail. Okay, I'll, um, I'll just leave that up in the air because obviously there's a disconnect either with Canada Post or with the residents. Um, and uh, I think I've made my point pretty clearly. Um, the We Watch, I, I just like, now that I have you both on here, did, did both of you listen to all the deputations or did you come on afterwards? Through you, Mayor and I listened to the deputations, and I believe that Dr. Gurdisa did as well. Okay, and so do you want to comment on any, on any of the deputies on the, the deputants? Sorry, Through just you, before Lehman. just just before you get into this, um, I, I don't think it's for Dr. Simon and Dr. Gurdisa to comment on twenty-seven different deputations, Councillor McCann. If you do have a specific question about the issue, and given there is a motion on the floor, I just encourage you to. They're here as a reference to council. It's up to council to. Uh, discuss the deputations and the concerns that they've heard. Uh, I don't think it's particularly fair to give the doctors a chance after the deputants to counter those specific, or the, each deputation and we'd be here all night. So if you have a specific question for the applicants, the, the two doctors representing them, I think that's fine, but I don't think asking them to comment on all 27 is really feasible. Well, thank you, Mayor Lehman, and that's not what I was referring to, uh, but we do speak and think very differently, so I guess that's why you said that. Uh, I just wanted the doctors to have a, a, um, a, uh, a time to reflect on anything that maybe they felt strongly about from the deputants that they would like to comment on, given the opportunity, is where there's a platform I was wanting to give them. So if there's nothing, then I'll move on. 
Well, for you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, Councillor McKenna. I, I think the only thing Sorry, I Dr. would Dr. Dr. Gurdiza, I, I, I will let you make your comment, but it's uh, 5 to 12. We're in the midst of a council debate. We don't normally uh, allow extra guests into a meeting during a council debate, but given the importance of this issue and the factual nature of what's been called into question, uh, I'm fine with asking questions of fact, but uh, I don't think it's fair to the process to give uh, Dr. Gradiz and Dr. Simon, and we know where I, uh, I stand on the issue. Uh, it is not, however, fair to give them a, a chance to counter the deputant speeches after the deputations. We don't do that here. That is not our process for very, very good reason. It's not fair to the deputants. Council can have a discussion around this. That's fine. If there's a specific question of fact uh, to clarify, that's fine. But uh, Dr. Gradiz and Dr. Simon don't get to come on now and make their own open-ended deputation to counter the points that were made by the public. Well, I do believe that there's anomalies and I think this SES is an anomaly. So we should have special rules for these anomalies. Well, we uh, might consider that uh, before tonight, but every deputant signed up uh, understanding that they were making a deputation and then council who is charged with making the decision uh, would follow the process that we have with every other decision. So uh, if you have a specific question, uh, go ahead, Councilor McCann. I'm just guessing with the, uh, with the new information that you've heard from uh, the We Watch, uh, sorry, the uh, child care provider, the 24 hour child care provider with WeWatch. Uh, now that you know this, you've had now three weeks to digest this. Does your, uh, does your decision uh, or ability has strengthened or weakened for 11 Innisfil Street? Dr. Critties. Uh Through you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councilor McCann. I think at this point, um, as per the discussions last week and again, I think it's so important that we engage the community and actually through the committee, um, you know, work together to re-emphasize the strategies that we've discussed through the mitigation strategies as well as, um, and I think it was so beautifully articulated by Councillor Harris, is to really together better understand um, the, I guess develop some knowledge and understanding of this population and the way they use and that it's not actually impacting um, on individual safety. So in listening to the different individuals and the concerns they have, that's why it's important now if the site is selected that we immediately launch the community engagement committee and that we work together to actually uh, build the best possible approach and have every mitigation strategy in place to ensure that their worst fears are not in any way going to occur. One maybe last question on the location, then I'll move on to actually my thoughts on SCS in general. Um, I know that Councillor Harvey uh, had talked to the uh, uh, president or uh, vice president of WeWatch. Uh, I just wanted, I'm not sure if you forgot or you didn't want to say, but I mean, I would like to, to know what happened in that conversation and if uh, this company uh, in Barrie is going to um, be affected by this SES financially. So through you, Mayor Leamy, could I ask uh, Councillor Harvey that question, please? Yep, Councillor Harvey. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, yes, yeah, so I, did, I did have a conversation with uh, executive management at uh, We Watch's head office, uh, which is situated in York Region. Um, through those conversations, uh, they had only just learned about uh, this SCS location uh, through news reports. Um, and uh, how they're situated is they have their head office and then each area will have their own office that oversees that area. So Barry does have its own office. Um, with management there that will uh, assess moving forward. Um, however, when I did put the question directly to executive management, if an SCS across the street uh, from one of their uh, daycare locations could affect uh, whether or not WeWatch wants to continue the partnership uh, with this provider, um, they could not provide any certainty that they would continue 
uh, to uh, provide uh, their name attached to that daycare. Um, and essentially, I think it, it really causes some concern as to uh, the decision that we make here tonight too, because uh, we heard from that gentleman where he had put uh, $40,000 worth of renovations into his home recently to be able to increase the number of uh, children that they can care for. Um, effectively, we could be shutting that person down and, and putting them out of business. Um, so th those are my comments that I had with them. There's no guarantees. Um, I was just wondering if I could touch on the Canada Post thing, just because I, I have Harvey, first experience. I, I need to, I'm yeah. sorry, I need to extend that. We need to vote to extend the meeting after oh, yeah. midnight. So uh, I do think it's important that we continue the discussion. Uh, so I would like a motion to set aside the procedural bylaw uh, because we technically can't meet after midnight, but we can vote uh, to set aside our own bylaw. Uh, do I have a motion, a mover and a seconder? Councillor Kungel and Councillor McCann, uh, all those in favor of setting aside the procedural bylaw and continuing to meet after midnight. Everyone's in favor, okay. Sorry, Councillor Harvey. Um, Councillor McCann technically has the floor. Can I come back to you about the Canada Post thing? By all means. Okay, thanks, Councillor. I mean, I mean, it's, it's late, it's 12 o'clock. I've been up since 4.30. I just think for context, uh, I don't mind uh, uh, Councillor Harvey putting that spot on because it's, it's, it's um, on all of our minds right now. I know it's your floor, but uh, I think it'd be, it'd be right to have uh, Councillor Harvey talk now. Okay, you can give Councillor Harvey the floor. Councillor Harvey, you're next. Great. Thank you, Your Worship. Yeah, no, un unfortunately, I had an issue with uh, with one of my mail outs too, uh, where we had a uh, a planning uh, application come forward that uh, I knew had caused uh, some issues with my residents. So I wanted to make sure that uh, everybody was aware of it uh, because of the guidelines within the perimeters of the Planning Act. Um, and ironically, it was in the same issue that we had are hearing about tonight, where it was my residents that were actually the ones that lived closest to the application that told me they didn't receive anything. Uh, I know when uh, the clerk's office confirmed with uh, Canada Post, they were adamant everything had been delivered. And then lo and behold, about two months later, didn't they find several boxes of my uh, my brochures that uh, did not get delivered. Uh, so quite evidently, uh, whenever you put anything out by Canada Post, unless it's registered mail, there's never a guarantee that uh, these things are reaching the, uh, the area that you expect it to. Okay, thanks, Councillor Harvey. Councillor Natalie Harris. Thank you, Mayor Um, I just, I, I know we keep on focusing on uh, the mail out, and I get it's absolutely uh, a valid point, but we had people on Perry Street say that they got it, Perry Street say that they didn't get it, and this has been all over the media. Like, this isn't a new topic, and this is this is a, the latest uh, proposed site, but, I mean, come on, guys, like, <laughs> seven 7,000 7, mail outs went, and um, a couple people maybe threw it out by accident and they're upset about that. But we have confirmation that it received, it, it landed on Perry Street, 100%. The doctor stated that. So let's move on from this topic and get to other um, more data-driven um, uh, arguments because I think we're just beating this around the bush right now. We have people that received it. Sorry, Councillor Harris. I, I, I had thought you were um, on the... Um the question that Councillor McCann had asked, but right, uh, you had today. already, you have already spoken at council and my I'm bad. sorry. It, we, yeah, uh, no, my bad for allowing it. Uh, we're in city council. Everybody gets to speak once. Uh, and uh, Councillor McCann, because you'd last asked a question, I will ask you, and you had indicated you had other comments. Yeah. Uh, so notwithstanding, you've gone well past your five minutes. Uh, do you have additional comments on the, the motion that's on the floor that you want to Maybe. Sure, man. we're only allowed five minutes. Yep. Procedural bylaw and council. Okay, well then you know what, let me speed this up then because I do have something important yep. to say and uh, I do appreciate the, the time counselor, councils, council. Uh, you know, it comes down to uh, the SES as a whole. And uh, this is something that, uh, you know, I was, uh, I've talked to many people about this and I woke up Tuesday or Wednesday of last week uh, at two, three o'clock in the morning and it just hit me like an anvil. You know, I just did, I hired a coach to do, go through my, my core beliefs and core values. And my, my biggest core belief and core value is connecting to people. And when I connect to people, my biggest strength is empowerment 
and instilling confidence into people. And just hit me clearly, right? Like we as leaders, whether you're the mayor, whether you're the CAO, whether you own a garbage company, whether you own a drugstore, right? You have to empower your, your employees, your staff, and you have to uh, you know, um, increase their, uh, their confidence, right? To move forward. And I have to ask this council, and this is, this is just, this is gonna be a redundant question. How are we empowering and how are we instilling confidence right? Increasing their confidence in these people, right? These people that are vulnerable, these people that are addicted to uh, some of the, the, the heaviest drugs in humankind. And they're, in my opinion, you know, I uh, be careful my words here, because I know this is super sensitive. You know, it's my belief that, you know, you have individuals that just aren't making great decisions, right? And I think the best decision that we can make as a council is to reject this injection site to reject this location and actually forcefully, uh, you know, uh, rally uh, with uh, Mayor Lehman and the big city mayors. I know they're working hard, and much of the mayor wants to comment on that. And we need to put pressure on the federal government, put pressure on the provincial government, and we need to have treatment. We need to have education. We need to have rehabilitation, and we need to have recovery. And I believe that we need to be strong. Because quite frankly, if we accept this location and we accept these millions of dollars that we get for one spoke in the wheel, right? I just really believe that we're missing the boat and we need to do better for these, uh, for our society, right? So- Point of order, Mayor Lehman. This is not up to uh, Councillor McCann to determine how someone recovers. It's not up to Councillor McCann to determine what kind of angle someone should go to. You said that we're, um, we're not being hard enough or we should we should be going to the federal government. May I remind you that when I was originally elected, I brought a, a, a motion to set an emergency on the opioid crisis that was turned down that would have addressed all of the things that you just pointed out with the federal the provincial government. So, and we are bringing treatment to Barry. So there are many other things that are happening and this SES is one point and I don't think it's fair um, for anyone to say that this won't be a successful way for anybody to recover. Um, that's just not fair in any way. Well, respectfully, okay. yeah, so the, as I have. Uh, Councillors, the point, the point of order there would be uh, to speak to the motion that's on the floor and the motion that's on the floor is with regards to whether or not to approve an SCS in this location. I think Councillor McCann's within his rights to give his views on SCS. However, Councillor McCann, uh, I'm, I'm not sure uh, this broad discussion around individuals is getting too close to the actual motion on the floor. So I will ask you to make your comments. Uh, you've had lots and lots of airtime here tonight. Yeah, this is a really important uh, issue. So I appreciate the time, Mayor Lehman. And uh, so getting back to uh, my finishing arguments, you know, I really believe that uh, you know treatment, education, rehabilitation, recovery, which is outlined in Chief Greenwood's uh, um, community hub, uh, you know, report that we had last week. Right, I agree with that, and I think that we need to put our efforts towards that. And um, I just think that uh, there's only so much money that we're going to be given from the provincial government. And if we do with the uh, safe injection site, we may miss an opportunity to do something better, finding a better way. So council, Mayor Lehman, I appreciate the long time, but I've got a lot of passion towards this too. It just may be uh, the opposite end, end of the stick of, of your arguments. Thank you. Next, I have Councillor Reitma. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, and I, I think tonight I've, I've been listening to the, to the, to the deputants uh, very carefully, and I've also listened to the discussion that's been going on around the table. Um, and I, there was a couple of things that struck me. Um, one of them was that every single person that spoke tonight said that they uh, were in favor of an SCS. Um, and it seems to me that, um, you know, uh, I, I think that we've all come to pretty much an agreement that uh, an SCS is, some, is, a, is one piece of this intractable puzzle that we need to deal with. Um, the other thing that they said was, yes, we need an SCS, but it needs to be someplace else. And I thought Councillor Harris asked a, a, a very insightful question um, when she asked, so what specifically concerns you? 
um, and be specific. And the, and the interesting thing was that she got no specific answers. And I, I, and I understand that perfectly well because I, I think that um, when people confront change um, in their neighborhood, um, there is no doubt there's going to be anxiety about that. Um, anything that is different is, is going to raise the anxiety level because we don't really know um, what the outcome is going to be. However, it seems to me that we have uh, spent the last two years, well, not us, but uh, certainly uh, some very knowledgeable people have worked very hard for the last couple of years to try to figure out where is the best place to have uh, the SCS. And uh, they've landed at um, 11 Innisville. And I think uh, we need to honor that, uh, that work uh, rather than second guess it. Um, and I think, um, you know, they have done, uh, they have done their, their due diligence. And I know that it doesn't really matter where we put it. There's going to be somebody that says, you know, it should be, you know, down the street somewhere. Um, and I, I do think that, um, we really need to, um, start thinking about exactly what Councillor McCann was saying. We need to start empowering um, people, um, empowering people so that they can recover. Uh, we need to um, find a way that they can um, live with a greater dignity. Um, I, you know, I, I don't have much experience with addiction, um, but I must say that, um, it's a very unhealthy, uh, unsafe way to live. And it seems to me that um, we need to do everything in our power to help these people uh, recover, um, if that is at all possible. So I'm, uh, I'm going to be supporting uh, this uh, initiative. And um, I'm actually quite pleased about the amount of neighborhood uh, engagement that we have, um, because I think it, it it suggests that we will do well here. Um, yes, there's anxiety about it, but there, the neighborhood is engaged, the neighbors are engaged, and I, I'm very hopeful that uh, the neighborhood committee is going to be a very effective uh, tool to make sure that this place operates really well. So thank you. Thanks, Councillor Reitma. Uh, next, I have Councillor Thompson. Thanks, Marilyn. I'll be very brief. Um, so I, I want to thank all the deputations and uh, that their comments didn't fall on deaf ears. They, they have every right to be concerned about the safety. Uh, for Council, we've seen the number of things that occur at the bus terminal. We, we get reports on that on a weekly basis. Um, when an organization is looking for provincial funding and one of the funding formulas is for security, that tells you there are challenges. And, you know, there, there are locations in Toronto that neighborhoods have had GoFundMe pages for extra security because there are challenges with these sites. But I think with the neighborhood engagement and the partners and listening to all the concerns about the entrance, about the busy street, about the stuff that's happening. And I just think that it, it's kind of that thing. Now the ball's in the court of the provider, you know, SMOS and if they fail, we'll know soon enough. And, but I think at this stage, we, we have to respect all views. There are challenges with these services, but I think it's that time where this is an option and I think we have to take it. And that's my comment. 
Thanks, Councillor Thompson. Uh, I have it listed that I've had seven members of council speak. Uh, one has a conflict. Uh, do the other two wish to make comments, either of you? Okay. Oh, okay, Councillor Morales. <clears throat> Thank you, Mary Lehman. Same comments as last week. The only thing I'll add is, as Councillor Thompson put it perfectly, tensions run high and residents have the right to literally feel concern for their families, their safety, their existence. A quick little update. I corresponded with one of the residents, uh, Ms. Maynard, um, after her presentation through email. And in a couple of emails, that phone, that email, uh, that discussion turned constructive. Um, she clarified uh, the comments about, um, you know, conflict versus should it be that way? She understood my perspective. I understood hers. And I love the way she closed that email. Um, I'd love to uh, keep the discussion, leave the lines of communication open. Um, and I think that's what I've heard from uh, Councillor Alwyn throughout this night. You know, please connect with me. This is not over. Move forward. And let's, let's allow that to be the approach and what comes from tonight. If the SCS, um, again, is problematic and doesn't work, as Councillor Thompson said but um, two minutes ago, um, we're going to be all over this. The, the health unit is going to be all over it. And we're going to make sure it works, or that it's, um, um, or that we make sure that you know any negative implications don't occur. And if it succeeds, um, I know that any people who have concerns will be relieved, and it, and that positivity will be celebrated, studied, and used as a model for elsewhere. So um, I'm trying to have faith. I've read the reports. I know the people behind it. And um, again, I, I get thing for closing that comment thread from somebody who, um, you know, through initial comments, I wasn't very impressed. I was able to hear their perspective. They were able to hear mine and we're trying to move forward in a constructive way. So hopefully after tonight, um, all parties involved can do that. Thanks, Councilor Morales. Any others who wish to comment before I call the question? Okay, I just had um, a quick question, one question for the applicants, Dr. Gradiza about the, or Dr. Simon. Um, several of the deputants reference concern about people either milling around waiting to get into the facility uh, or uh, some of the services being delivered on the outside of the building. Uh, can you tell me is, I mean, is that likely to happen? Is this the kind of facility where you would see a lineup? Have you thought through that piece in terms of what if you had a number of people come at once? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, thank you for the question. So we have uh, talked with the property owner about really ensuring that the way the ramp will go in, the accessibility ramp, there will be privacy. They'll move the fence over and there will be a waiting area, not only because it's quite a large space. So people can come in and wait. They can meet with a counselor. They can go in and, you know, get a little bit of nutrition as they wait and we will have to depending on the numbers which we don't anticipate will be huge if we have to pace individuals out then that's what we'll do to ensure that there's not significant um you know lineups outside the door and at this point there's no um plan to have an outdoor space okay and when you say there's plenty of space inside for a waiting area that's inside yes yeah okay um, that was my only question, I think, um, but I do have a few comments I wanted to make. Uh, there's only one point of fact that I, I really want to raise, having actually visited the Guelph site, and I really wish all members of, of council had uh, the opportunity. There are two 10-story residential buildings across the street from the supervised the consumption site in Guelph. The facility is located at Wyndham and Woolwich. Uh, there's a street called Cardigan that is literally opposite the entrance where patrons use the supervised consumption site. And there are two 10 story buildings there. Um, and uh, you know, it, uh, it, it was a major issue um, when that facility opened uh, that the uh, people who lived in those buildings and lived in the neighborhood around them, uh, further around them, because there are residential areas uh, immediately to the north and the northwest, uh, that there was engagement with that community. And I would certainly agree with the comments that were made by uh, members of council tonight. Um, I thought almost all of the deputations tonight were uh, extremely uh, thoughtful. Certainly uh, the people who um, 
gave us their concerns on behalf of their own community care so deeply about this wonderful little pocket of the city. Um, a couple of comments about what I heard uh, that really got me thinking a little bit more as we were going through the discussion and, uh, and later tonight here. Um, you know, Milligan's Pond, uh, since I was the Ward 2 councillor, uh, actually has been a cause for concern for residents in this area. And, and sometimes I would say those concerns were, you know, the condition of some of the wooded area. But in more recent years, um, the, some of the behavior of the people who've lived in there in some of the encampments, and then in the last couple of years, casual drug use without question has been a frequent complaint that's come to my office from the people who live in this area. And I know there were differing views on that from different residents. Uh, we had a few talk about break-ins and uh, finding needles. We had others insist that they've never seen a needle. Um, I, I, uh, I struggle with this a bit because we also have all the data on the calls to emergency services. And we know that our paramedics have been in there for overdose calls. So I do think there's a concern there. And, and I, I, you know, I strongly believe that regardless of where people come in or out of, of Milligan's Pond, it's symptomatic of the broader problem of poison drugs in our community. And um, I think the, uh, you know, the location of those calls is something that over the four years now, that the Simcoe Muskoka anti-opioid strategy has been in development and has worked and then the last three years on a supervised consumption site. Uh, all of that data is available. It has been very, very carefully analyzed. And um, that is part of what was used to, to reach, reach this decision. Just a couple of things I think though, uh, you know, for the, the people who live in the area and, and the rest of this, you know, <laughs> Sometimes being the level of government that's closest to the people is uh, is not a reward um, because you know we're not making the decision on this facility. The province is, and do you think the province is going to conduct a consultation process? Do you think the Ministry of Health is going to have deputations or uh, emails or survey or meetings? That's the level of government that's going to decide whether or not there's a supervised consumption site at 11 Innisfil Street. But let's not kid ourselves, uh, our motion is necessary for this to proceed. So it's absolutely right for people to, to ask us to not support it if they don't agree with the site. Um, but let's be frank here. This is, uh, we're here and we're having this conversation with the neighborhood because we are the local government and we have the, um, an enviable task of passing a motion either of support or not for an application, which will then be decided by somebody else. So, and I think that's important to those who are watching uh, to understand. And I think, I can't remember if it was Councillor McCann or other member, another member of uh, council, you know, there is a further decision which will be made uh, ultimately by the province if this goes forward, if council does indeed pass a motion of support tonight. Um, the specific concerns to, you know, if I uh, was, in this, was in the neighborhood and council did proceed with this, I would want to know that any concerns would be taken seriously and would be acted on. And I would uh, be struggling to have confidence right now that that would be the case because um, they have no, there's no experience of it. it, it it's a, it is a new thing. Um, you know, this is not our application. Uh, it is, you know, we don't approve methadone clinics. We don't approve walk-in clinics. We don't approve any medical facility. This is a totally unique use. And uh, also, if we're, if we're being blunt about it, uh, it's one that is, is gonna come with a lot of concern, for sure. I, I completely understand the concerns that, uh, that residents are expressing. But what I would wanna know is from here, Will my concerns, if this proceeds, if there are problems, will there be a swift action to remedy those problems? And I guess my confidence in that comes from a couple of things. One is that this is the public health unit. The public health unit reports to a board that includes councillors Harvey and Kungle and elected officials from across Simcoe County. It's a public body with public reporting and a board that oversees it and uh, the Canadian Mental Health Association, which is a very large organization and well-funded, 
And I believe both of those organizations uh, have reputations and a commitment that they will want to protect by being successful here. But even if that wasn't, wasn't the case, and that's not the reason why I think we should support a supervised consumption site, I'm just saying if I'm a resident and I want accountability for what's happening, uh, and how can I have any confidence going forward that there will be? Uh, I believe that the nature of these two bodies, especially having a, a public uh, body like the health unit as one of the co-applicants, uh, is one of those reasons. I would like to say to the residents uh, tonight, I'm a member of the Barrie Police Services Board. And if a community, uh, committee, uh, community committee is part of the proposal here, if this is approved by the province, if it goes ahead, when that committee is formed, that committee should have a straight line to myself as a member of the police services board so I can immediately bring concerns to Barry Police. I suspect there may be police representation on that committee anyway. Uh, and I believe Councillor Aylwin should have a direct line. Uh, I, he may be sitting on the committee uh, regardless so that he can address issues with city staff and city departments if they're related to things like traffic or lighting. Very good point made tonight by one of the deputants about lighting on Vesper Street. That's the kind of thing the city can and should respond to. Um, two more comments I wanted to make. Uh, several of the uh, deputants referenced, referenced complete services and um, uh, the lighthouse model in Aurelia, which I also think is a wonderful model. If you read the Simcoe Muskoka anti-opioid strategy, it has five pillars and all of the components of those models are part of the strategy. Could they all be located in this facility? No, probably not. The lighthouse is uh, undertaking a very ambitious project for a much larger facility. But the whole point of this is to get people into those services and to have those connections. And again, I take some faith in the fact that this is the public health unit and the Canadian Mental Health Association, the two leading providers of many of those services that are heading up this application. Um, I think the last comment I wanna make is this. Um, there's a lot of issues we deal with, and this one is a bit of, uh, you know, it's a bit of an odd one, it, only in the sense that it's a provincial decision. Ultimately, it's, a, it's not a city facility, but the buck always stops with us with what's going on in our community. And, and I always feel that we need to um, be able to represent all those in our community. And that includes people struggling with addiction. All lives are important and all lives have value. And while there have been some comments that, um, uh, you know, these are decisions, I don't think Ryan Naylor made the decision to overdose. I don't think anybody makes a decision to overdose. And I don't think anybody makes a decision to take poison drugs and they're dying because of it. And when I step back and I look at our responsibility as city council to an entire community, there's no higher responsibility than taking action to prevent unnecessary deaths, whether that's a dangerous road, whether that is by ensuring that we have fire and police and ambulance who are well-equipped and well-trained to be able to get to an emergency and save lives there, or whether in this case, it's a supervised consumption site that the city needs right now to combat a poison drug crisis that's needlessly taking lives. So while I heard wonderful deputations tonight and I completely understand the concerns of the residents, the commitment that I would give to you uh, with my support to this motion is that you will be listened to after this date. If there are concerns, if this site goes ahead in your community, uh, those concerns will absolutely be taken seriously and we will do everything we can with the applicants to deal with them. And with that, I will call the question uh, on section C of the general committee report recorded vote, please. Record a vote. <laughs> i thought we might end up with a recorded vote on this one madam clerk please conduct the vote um thank you mary Lehman. i'm going to start with yourself yes councillor rima yes councillor aylwin yes councillor kongo yes deputy mayor ward yes councillor thompson yes Councillor Natalie Harris. Yes. Councillor Harvey. No. Councillor Morales. Yes. And Councillor McCann. No. Motion carries. Thank you very much.
uh, members of council. Thank you to all of those who stayed on tonight and gave us deputations tonight. Those were some of the most thoughtful deputations I've heard in 15 years of city council on, all, on both sides of the issue. Thank you as well uh, for two years of work by the applicant team to get to tonight uh, and, uh, and for all of your continued work in the community on all of the public health issues facing us right now. Okay, it seems anticlimactic to move to section D of the second general committee report, but. Move by myself, second. Move by myself, seconded by Councillor Thompson that section D of the second general committee report dated May 26th, 25th, 2021, as circulated be adopted. Thank you. It is moved by Deputy Mayor Ward and seconded by Councillor Thompson that section D of the second general committee report dated May 25th, 2021, as circulated be adopted. This was to defer the matters to uh, the general committee meeting. This says ninth, that's actually seventh. Uh, uh, these are the items we didn't get to on the uh, May 25th meeting. Uh, any comments or questions? Councillor Harvey. Yeah, again, I'm just gonna uh, declare uh, mm. that in order to uh, remain compliant uh, with my statutory obligations, under section 17 sub three of the Police Services Act, I will not participate in the in the vote or any discussions that take place. Okay, thank you, Councillor Harvey. Councillor Natalie Harris. Thank you, Mayor Lehman. Um, I too will be refraining from voting on this matter uh, as advice from the Integrity Commissioner with a potential pecuniary interest. Okay, uh, Madam Clerk, have Councillors Harvey and Harris's conflicts been recorded? Yes, Mayor Lehman, they have. Interest. Yes, okay, thank you. On section D, any further comments or questions? Members of council. Councillor McCann. Uh, sorry, Mayor Lehman, it's late. We're voting on the reduction of 30 kilometer speed on, on um, Tiffin Street? No, the matter was deferred. So technically oh, okay. we're voting to approve the deferral. Okay, thank you. I was wondering I always no beg the question for me, what would happen if we said no to this? <laughs> anyway, uh, so the motion is to uh, deal with these matters next week uh, because we ran out of time a week ago. Any further comments or questions? Okay, seeing none, those in favor of section D? Is anyone opposed? None, that carries by those voting. Okay, that completes the committee reports. We have no deferred business, direct motions or presentation matters. Now we're at inquiries of staff. Deputy Mayor Ward, do you have any inquiries of staff? No. Members of council, any inquiries of staff? Councillor Thompson and then Councillor McCann. I actually did this because Deputy Mayor Ward just rolled his eyes. He didn't want no inquiries to staff. <laughs> I, I was just wondering if somebody, um, have we started cutting the parks or do we have a date? Um, that's the grass? Yeah. Yep. Uh, Ms. Miller or Mr. Friary, if he's on the call. Through you, Mayor Lehman, uh, to Councillor Thompson. Yes, uh, casual and summer students have started and parks uh, uh, mowing has begun. Okay, thanks, Councillor Thompson. Councillor McCann. I got, uh, I got maybe a couple questions. I'll ask them maybe the same time to speed things up. Uh, the Caterpillar issue, do we get a, do we get a statement out on the City Bear with that? Sorry, is that a question to Ms. Miller? To you, to Ms. Miller, to... Uh, Ms. Miller, go ahead. Uh, yes, Councillor McCann, there was um, material circulated last week and I'm happy to recirculate it to you. Okay, wonderful. No, I'm not sure I meant out to the public actually. Um, yes, Councillor okay. McCann, out to the public. Thank you. And uh, my last question would be uh, Wilkins Park. Um, there's been quite a bit of vandalism on the sign. I've definitely talked to Rebecca James Reed about uh, extra signage, which she's very quickly in her team. Uh, turned around. Uh, what are we doing about the vandalism and the maintenance and management of Wilkins Park? I am getting many inquiries, that's why I ask. Ms. Miller. Through you, Mayor Lehman, to Councillor McCann. Uh, certainly, we have been in um, uh, discussions with uh, enforcement services about their patrols, as well as uh, Barry Police, um, to ask them to increase, increase their community patrols. Um, there will be a, a construction work starting on, on the rehabilitation plan uh, in the next week. Um, and so there'll be a lot more activity down there and uh, we are doing everything that we can to, uh, to fix the damage uh, and um, to try and catch the people that are, that are doing it. 
And so just to be, just to me, a follow-up question about my Mayor Lehman. So there's some boards, I mean, first of all, a beautiful job on the fence. Like what you said you're going to do and what you did do, I think it's three times better. So congrats for you and your team for, for, the, for the material you used. Uh, secondly, I'm guessing it's kids late at night kicking some of the, the boards out. There's probably a dozen boards that are missing. Are they going to be replaced? Are they going to be strengthened at all? Have you decided what the game plan is? Through you, Mayor Lehman, to Councillor McCann, um, there were, um, of the fencing that you're talking about, uh, there is going to be a swapping out of the, um, the fence rails. Um, the contractor is going to use um, some different ones going forward. And then so the ones that have been damaged and, and are absent will be replaced. Uh, some of that work is uh, likely to happen in the next uh, short period of time. Uh, there were two sections at the end of that fence um, that was not installed at all um, because they needed the access to be open for construction work. When that construction work is completed, those will be uh, completed as well. Thank you very much, Ms. Miller. Thanks, Councillor McCann. Uh, any other inquiries of staff? Um, Ms. Miller, I, sorry, you're still on the hot seat. A quick question around textile recycling, um, be, uh, just around the bags. Can you, uh, we've made some changes in terms of what ba bags people can use. It doesn't have to be a clear bag. Could you just highlight what is acceptable for people putting textiles out? We start doing that today. Thank you for the, for the question, Mayor Lehman. Um, uh, definitely the, uh, the the preference was clear bags, but certainly recognize that that is a challenge for some people. So uh, any bag um, that is uh, is noted for uh, that it has textiles and it will be collected. Um, and, and because the pickup day is not uh, on your regular garbage day, um, uh, they should be fine for uh, for pickup by the, the recycling, textile recycling uh, team. Okay, and do we want people to stick a piece of paper on it that says textiles or a note or something, or is, are we just going to assume that if it's out at the curb on that day, it's a uh, textile? We'll assume that it's if it's out on the curb, it's yeah. that day. But if people want to put a, a, a little note on it, I'm sure that uh, that will help uh, avoid Be much any appreciated. confusion. Sure, you could even leave a positive message for your friendly neighborhood textile collector. That's right. Okay. I'm sure that they would appreciate all the support. I'm sure they would. Uh, any other inquiries of staff? Okay, seeing none announcements, members of council, any announcements? Councillor Natalie Harris. Thank you, Mayor Lehman. Um, we're into June 1st now, but I just wanted to um, commemorate that yesterday, May 31st, was the eighth, uh, eight year anniversary of the orange helicopter uh, crash that happened near uh, Mosini. Um, and this was where unfortunately, Captain Don Filiter, paramedic Chris Snowball, uh, paramedic Dustin Gagne and uh, First Officer Jack Dupuis all died in that crash. And I uh, just want to send my condolences to all family and friends. Uh, eight years later, uh, your family members um, were lost in serving the public and we owe them always um, a debt of gratitude. Thanks, Councillor Harris. Any other announcements? Councillor Kungle. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, so just a reminder, for Canadians in Bloom, uh, an invitation to residents and businesses across the city to register your gardens. We are um, looking at uh, incorporating the color yellow as part of the theme for Hope is Growing. Um, so the opportunity to register your gardens, which is free, is online through the City of Barrie. If you just Google City of Barrie, Communities in Bloom, there is some great media that's coming out on this as well. Uh, so looking forward to uh, participation across the city watch for more opportunities to come. But again, um, while it's virtual, we are asking uh, residents who I've seen busy gardening uh, throughout the throughout uh, various wards um, to be uh, posting photos and submitting those. And that will help the city to actually uh, compete in, in this um, initiative, uh, although virtual um, throughout the season. So please do register your gardens, but I believe by July 23rd. Thanks, Councillor Kungle. Any further announcements? I'm only going to do like three here. Um, I do want to note, we have proclaimed the month of June as Post-Traumatic Stress Disorder Awareness Month, Philippines Month, Deafblind Awareness Month, Seniors Month, and Recreation and Parks Month. June is a popular month. Uh, I wanted to note that the second draft of the official plan will be presented at Planning Committee on Wednesday night. Um, we are meeting Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday night probably Tuesday and Wednesday will be a little shorter than tonight. 
Uh, tomorrow night's planning committee is a, a public meeting and an application. Uh, Wednesday nights is the new official plan, and that will be a six o'clock start. So members of the public who wish to provide oral or written comments, uh, email cityclerks at vary.ca, uh, or you can call uh, a call City Hall uh, before June 2nd. Please do register to speak at that meeting. Uh, the other thing I wanted to note, in addition to the textiles, uh, was that uh, there is a job fair on Wednesday. So for those who are seeking employment, I know COVID has been a difficult time. Um, uh, the City of Barrie is partnering with the county on the Work in Simcoe County Virtual Job Fair. Uh, and there are certainly many industries in our area that continue to have shortages of workers. So please do uh, check this out. It's, it is online. Job seekers and local hiring employers can connect. Registration is open and it's free for both job seekers and employers. The website is workinsimcoecounty.ca. So that's Wednesday job fair. Last, I wanted to note May 31st, which uh, was over about 40 minutes ago, uh, is also a very, very difficult day for people in Barrie, especially in Allendale. Uh, it was 31, 36 years ago now that a F4 tornado struck our city, uh, killing eight residents of Barrie. There were four other uh, individuals killed in Ontario, people who lost their lives, uh, 600 homes destroyed. And uh, when you travel around Allendale today, there are a few visible um, reminders of the tornado, but there is in Sheer Park, uh, a boulder with a plaque and trees, uh, one for each of the eight victims. Uh, and so for all of those who remember May 31st is a very difficult day. Um, uh, we remember with you uh, on this day, one of the most difficult days in the history of the city of Barrie, May 31st, 1985. With that, uh, could I have the confirmation bylaw, Deputy Mayor Ward? I think we have one other one actually. Oh, sorry, we have two, you're, you're yep. correct. Moved by myself, Great. seconded by Councillor Thompson, that Lee be granted to introduce the following bills and these bills be read a first, second, and third time this day and finally pass bills 52 and 53. Thank you, it's moved by Deputy Mayor Ward, seconded by Councillor Thompson, that Lee be granted to introduce the following bills. These bills be read a first, second, and third time this day and finally passed bill 30, 52 and 53. Comments or questions? Seeing none, those in favor? Any opposed? None, that carries. Moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Thompson, that Lee be granted to introduce the following bill and this bill be read a first, second, and third time of stay and finally passed Bill 54. Thank you. It's moved by Deputy Mayor Ward, seconded by Councillor Thompson, that Lee be granted to introduce the following bill and this bill be read a first, second, and third time this day and finally passed Bill 54, the confirmation bylaw. Comments or questions? Seeing none, those in favour? Are any opposed to the confirmation bylaw? Can I have a motion to adjourn City Council? Councillor Thompson, seconded by Councillor Jim Harris. Uh, we will be meeting later today, as it turns out, as Planning Committee. Uh, planning Committee begins at 7 p.m. tonight. So we will see you all uh, after we get some sleep for Planning Committee at seven o'clock. Uh, and I thank you all to the members of staff and the members of the public who have stayed with us till this very late hour. Thank you all, good night, and we'll see you for Planning Committee a little later.